Section 23 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic, a practical treatise on the art of conjuring, by Professor Louis Hoffman. Section 23. Tricks with Coin Requiring Special Apparatus, Part 3. We have thus far described eight different contrivances for vanishing money, and, including the plug box which may be used in both ways, five for reproducing it. It is obvious that either of the first may be used in combination with either of the second, producing some fifty different effects. By the use of sleight of hand, in place of apparatus at either stage of the trick, still more numerous variations may be produced, and these may be still further multiplied by the use of sleight of hand in place of apparatus at either stage of the trick, still more numerous variations may be produced, and these may be still further multiplied by the use of other appliances, to be hereafter described, which, though of less general utility, may be occasionally introduced with excellent effect. The apparatus which we shall next describe is one which is very frequently used in combination with that last mentioned. It is known as the miraculous casket. This is a neat leather or velvet covered box about three inches by two and two and a half high when opened it is seen to be filled with a velvet cushion or stuffing after the manner of a ring case with four slits each just large enough to admit a half crown or florin by an ingenious mechanical arrangement in the interior which it would take too much space to describe at length each time the box is closed, one of the coins is made to drop down into the lower part and on the box being reopened is found to have vanished. The casket may be used in many tricks with good effect. In combination with the magic glass, last above described, it is employed as follows. The four coins which have been substituted for the genuine ones are placed in sight of all in the magic casket which is then closed and handed to one of the audience to hold. The performer then states that he is about to order the four coins now in the casket to pass one by one into the glass upon the table. One, he exclaims, a coin is heard to fall into the glass. The person who holds the casket is requested to open it. Three coins only are left. It is again closed, and the performer says, Two. Again the chink of the falling coin is heard, and another coin is found to have disappeared from the casket. The operation is repeated till all have vanished, and the operator pours forth from the glass four coins, which on examination are found to be the same which were originally borrowed, and which the audience believe that they saw placed in the casket. The casket may also be used with capital effect in conjunction with the half-crown or florin wand. This is a wand apparently of ebony, but really of brass, japanned black. It is about twelve inches in length and five-eighths of an inch in diameter. On one side of it, and so placed as to be just under the ball of the thumb when the wand is held in the hand, is a little stud which moves backwards and forwards for a short distance, about an inch and a quarter, like the sliding ring of a pencil case. When this stud is pressed forward, a half-crown, or florin, as the case may be, appears on the opposite end of the wand, retiring within it when the stud is again drawn back. The half-crown is a genuine one, but is cut into three portions, as indicated in figure 94, which represents a transverse section of it at right angles to the actual cuts. 
Each of the three segments is attached to a piece of watch spring and from the direction of the cuts it is obvious that, when the pieces of watch spring are pressed together, as they naturally are when drawn back into the wand, C will be drawn behind and A in front of B. The wand is used as follows. The performer palms in his left hand as many half crowns as he intends to produce. Then, taking the wand in the right hand and lightly touching with it the spot whence he desires to apparently produce the half crown, he pushes forward the stud and the split coin appears on the opposite end of the wand. He now draws the upper part of the wand through the left hand, at the same moment pressing back the stud and causing the split coin to retire within the wand, immediately handing for examination with the left hand one of the half crowns already placed there, and which by this gesture he appears to have just taken from the top of the wand. This is again repeated and another half crown exhibited till the stock in the left hand is exhausted. It is desirable on each occasion of pressing forward or withdrawing the stud to place the opposite end of the wand in such a situation as to be a little shielded from the eyes of the spectators so that they may not see the actual appearance or disappearance of the coin. A very slight cover will be sufficient. The end of the wand may be placed within a person's open mouth and withdrawn with the half crown thereon, within a pocket or the like. Where no such cover is available, a quick semicircular sweep should be made with the wand as the coin is protruded or withdrawn. With the aid of this wand, the passage of the four half crowns from the casket to the glass, just described, becomes still more effective. The four substitute half crowns having been placed in the casket and the latter closed, the performer announces that he will withdraw them visibly one by one and will then invisibly pass them into the glass. Further, to prove that the trick is not performed by any mechanical or physical means, he will not even take the casket in his hand, but will withdraw the coins one by one with his wand and thence pass them direct into the glass. Touching the casket with the wand, he presses the stud and shows the half crown on the end. Apparently taking off the coin with his left hand, as before described, the hand, however, being in this case empty, he makes the motion of throwing the coin from the hand to the glass, saying, Pass. The sound of a falling coin is heard, as already explained, and he shows that his hand is empty, the same process being repeated as to the remaining coins. The wands may also be effectively introduced in the trick of the shower of money which next follows. After having caught in the ordinary manner such number of coins as he thinks fit, the performer perceives, or pretends to perceive, that the audience suspects that the coins are in some manner concealed in his right hand. To show that this is not the case, he offers to catch a few coins on the top of his wand instead of in his hand, and finishes the trick by producing two or three on the wand accordingly. Wherever you can, as in this instance, produce the same result by two wholly different methods, the effect on the audience is most bewildering. Their conjectures as to the explanation of the first method being inadmissible, as to the second, and vice versa, the more they puzzle over the matter, the further are they likely to be from a correct solution. The Shower of Money the magical phenomenon known under this name surpasses the philosopher's stone in the pursuit of which so many of the wise men of old expended their lives and fortunes. The alchemist's secret aimed only at producing the raw material, but the magician's quick eye and ready hand gather from space money ready coined. Unfortunately, the experiment is subject to the same drawback as the more ancient process, viz, that each twenty shillings produced cost precisely twenty shillings, leaving hardly sufficient profit to make this form of money-making remunerative as a commercial undertaking. 
The effect of the trick is as follows. The performer borrows a hat which he holds in his left hand. Turning up his sleeves, he announces that he requires a certain number, say ten of florins or half crowns. The spectators put their hands in their pockets with the idea of contributing to the supposed loan. But the professor, anticipating their intention, says, No, thank you, I won't trouble you this time. There seems to be a good deal of money about tonight. I think I will help myself. See here is half a crown hanging to the gasolier. Here is another climbing up the wall. Here is another just settling on this lady's hair. Excuse me, sir, but you have a half crown in your whiskers. Permit me, madam, you have just placed your foot on another, and so on. At each supposed new discovery, the performer takes with his right hand from some place where there clearly was nothing an instant before, a half crown, which he drops into the hat held in his left hand, finally turning over the hat and pouring the coins from it to show that there had been no deception. The explanation is very simple, the trick being merely a practical application of the art of palming, though its effect depends on the manner and address of the operator even more than on his skill in sleight of hand. The performer provides himself beforehand with ten half-crowns. Of these he palms two in his right hand and the remainder in his left. When he takes the hat, he holds it in the left hand with the fingers inside and the thumb outside, in which position it is comparatively easy to drop the coins one by one from the hand into the hat. When he pretends to see the first half-crown floating in the air, he lets one of the coins in his right hand drop to his fingertips, and, making a clutch in the air, produces it as if just caught. This first coin he really does drop into the hat, taking care that all shall see clearly that he does so. He then goes through a similar process with the second, but when the time comes to drop it into the hat, he merely pretends to do so, palming the coin quickly in the right hand and at the same moment letting fall into the hat one of the coins concealed in his left hand. The audience, hearing the sound, naturally believe it to be occasioned by the fall of the coin they have just seen. The process is repeated until the coins in the left hand are exhausted. Once more the performer appears to clutch a coin from space, and showing for the last time that which has all along been in his right hand, tosses it into the air and catches it visibly in the hat. Pouring out the coins on a tray, or into the lap of one of the company, he requests that they may be counted when they are found to correspond with the number which he has apparently collected from the surrounding atmosphere. Some performers, by way of bringing the trick to a smart conclusion, after they have dropped in all the coins, remark, the hat begins to get heavy, or make some similar observation, at the same time dipping the right hand into the hat as if to gauge the quantity obtained and giving the money a shake, bring up the hand with four or five of the coins clipped breadth-wise against the lowest joints of the second and third fingers. Then pretend to catch in quick succession that number of coins, each time sliding one of the coins with the thumb to the fingertips and tossing it into the hat. It is by no means uncommon to see a performer, after having apparently dropped two or three coins into the hat in the ordinary way, pretend to pass in one or more through the side or crown. This produces a momentary effect, but it is an effect purchased at the cost of enabling an acute spectator to infer, with logical certainty, that the coin seen in the right hand was not the same that was, the moment afterwards, heard to chink within the hat, and this furnishes a distinct clue to the secret of the trick. It is obvious that, in the above form of the trick, which so far should be classed among tricks without apparatus, the performer cannot show the inside of his hands, and it is not uncommon to find an acute observer, particularly where the performer is guilty of the indiscretion we have just noticed, 
so far hit upon the true explanation as to express audibly a conjecture that the money which the performer catches is really the same coin over and over again. There is, however, a mechanical appliance known as the money slide, which is designed to meet this difficulty and to enable the performer still to catch the coin, though he has but a moment before shown that his hand is empty. The money slide is a flat tin tube about eight inches in length, an inch and a quarter in width, and of just such depth as to allow a half crown or florin, whichever coin may be used, to slip through it freely edgeways. It is open at the top, but is closed at the lower end by a lever, acting like the lever of a shot pouch. See figure 96, which shows the external appearance of the tube, and figure 97, which represents on a somewhat larger scale a section of its essential portion. The normal position of the lever, which works on a pivot, A, is as shown in figure 97, being maintained in that position by a small spring. Under such circumstances, the passage of the tube is barred by the pin D, which works through a small hole in the face of the tube. But if AC, the longer arm of the lever, be pressed down, the pin D is withdrawn, but the extreme lower end of the tube is for the moment barred by the bent end of AC. The pressure being withdrawn, the lever returns to its former condition. When required for use, four or five half crowns are dropped into the tube from the upper end and the tube is fastened by a hook affixed to it for that purpose inside the waistcoat of the performer so that its lower end hangs just above the waistband the lever side of the tube being next to the body if the tube be lightly pressed through the waistcoat the longer arm of the lever is thereby pressed down the pin D is lifted and the row of half crowns slide down to the bottom of the tube, where, however, they are arrested by the bent end of AC. As soon as the pressure is removed, the lever returns to its position. The mouth of the tube is left open and the first of the half crowns drops out and would be followed by the others, but the pin D which at the same moment returns to its position across the tube, stops their further progress. Thus, each time the lever is pressed and again released, one half crown and one only drops out at the mouth of the tube. The use of this appliance in the trick we have just described will be obvious. The performer, having turned up his sleeves to prove that they have no part in the matter, shows that his right hand is absolutely empty. Continuing his observations, his hand rests for a moment with a careless gesture against his waistcoat, the ball of the wrist being above and the fingers below the waistband. A momentary pressure causes a half crown to fall into his hand. This he palms and in due course proceeds to catch as already described. As the capacity of the slide is limited, and the same gestures frequently repeated would be likely to excite suspicion, it is best to begin the trick in the ordinary manner, and after having produced three or four coins in this way, to overhear, or pretend to overhear, a suggestion that the coin is all the while in your hand, ostentatiously throwing the coin with which you have so far worked into the hat, you draw special attention, not in words but by gesture, to your empty hand, the left hand is never suspected, and then have recourse to the slide. You throw the coin thus obtained into the hat and again show your hand empty. You produce another coin from the slide and make this serve you for the next two or three catches and so on as circumstances may dictate. The money magically caught as above may be used for the trick of the multiplication of money described at page 176, the two forming a natural and effective sequence. The Vanishing Plate or Salva this is a most useful and ingenious piece of apparatus. 
In appearance, it is an ordinary Japan's tin tray of about 10 inches in diameter, but it has the faculty of causing money placed upon it to disappear in a most surprising manner. A number of coins collected from the company are placed upon the salver. The performer, standing but a few feet from the spectators, openly takes them off one by one, but each, as his fingers grasp it, vanishes utterly. His sleeves, which in conjuring come in for a vast amount of undeserved suspicion, may be vigorously examined. But even though, as a concession to popular prejudice, he should bear his arms to the shoulder, the result would still be the same. A closer inspection of the salver, which the performer takes good care not to permit, would reveal the fact that though apparently consisting, like any other, of only one thickness of metal, it is in reality made double, allowing sufficient space between its upper and under surface for the concealment of any number of coins laid singly. The centre portion of the upper surface, though apparently of a piece with the rest, is in reality movable, though pressed upwards and kept in its place by the action of four small springs. When the performer apparently picks up a coin, which he takes care shall be on this centre portion, he presses smartly upon it, at the same moment drawing it sharply towards the outer rim. The movable portion of the salver yielding to the pressure, the effect is as shown in the figure, and the coin is shot under the outer rim, between the upper and under surface of the salver the movable portion rising again to its place as soon as the momentary pressure is removed. The tray is japanned in such a manner that the circular lines of the pattern correspond with the outline of the movable portion, and will bear any amount of mere ocular inspection so long as it is not permitted to be handled. The vanishing salver may be introduced with good effect in many tricks, as for instance that of the multiplication of money above referred to, the coins to be magically added being placed upon the salver whence they are taken off one by one and commanded to pass into the hands of the person who holds the money. It may also be advantageously used in conjunction with the glass described at page 201 each coin, as it vanishes from the salver, being heard to drop into the glass. The changing plate. The student has already been made acquainted with various methods of exchanging a marked coin, etc., for a substitute. There are still one or two appliances for this purpose remaining to be described, all taking the form of metal plates or trays, but greatly varying in their construction. The first, which we only mention for the sake of completeness, as it is now superseded by later and better inventions, consists of a small circular tin tray with a round hole or well in the centre of about an inch and a half in diameter and a quarter of an inch in depth. The lines of the pattern are so arranged as to make this cavity as little noticeable as possible. The well is movable, forming, in fact, a portion of a sliding piece below the tray in which sliding piece two such wells are excavated, the one or the other in turn corresponding to the opening in the tray according as the sliding piece is pushed backwards or forwards. When the tray is required for use, the substitute coin is placed beforehand in one of the two wells, which is then pushed out of sight and the other brought below the opening. The borrowed coin is received on the plate and allowed to drop into the empty well. As soon as this is done, the operator, with his forefinger, which is naturally beneath the plate, draws back the slide and brings the other coin in sight, while the genuine one drops into his hand. The construction of the plate, though simple enough in itself, is a little difficult to explain. 
but as we only allude to it in order to counsel the student to avoid it, any obscurity in our description is of little importance. The instrument now used for the same purpose is known as the French changing plate and may be described as a combination of the vanishing salver, page 209, and the multiplying money plate, page 177. It is round and has beneath it a flat tube similar to that of the multiplying plate and it is in this tube that the substitute coin are placed. The upper surface of the plate is similar in appearance to that of the vanishing plate, but in this case the centre portion is divided across the middle, and one half only is movable, sinking downwards to the depth of a quarter of an inch all along the dividing line, whenever pressure is applied to a particular portion of the under surface of the plate. The coins to be changed are received by the operator on this movable portion and immediately handed to some person to hold, the performer sloping the plate and apparently pouring the coins into the hands or hat held out to receive them. In reality, in the act of sloping the plate, he depresses the movable portion of the surface, and as a natural consequence, the coins, instead of sliding as they appear to do, right off the plate, slip between the upper and under surface, while the substitutes fall from the tube below into the hands of the person who is to take charge of them. The whole movement is so rapid and the fall of the substituted coins coincides so exactly with the disappearance of the genuine ones that the eye is completely deceived. The tray, having apparently served its purpose, is carried off by the magician or his servant with ample opportunity to make any necessary disposition of the genuine coins. A still later improvement is that which is known as the tray of Proteus. The tray to which the inventors, Messrs. Heum and Lane, have given the above high-sounding title is the latest, and not the least ingenious, of the series of magical trays. The tray in question will not only change, but add, subtract, or vanish coins under the very eyes of the spectators. In form, it is an oblong octagon, measuring eight inches by six and standing about three quarters of an inch high. It is divided across the centre and one half of the centre portion is movable in the same manner as in the case of the tray last described, save that in this instance the depth between the upper and under surface of the tray being greater, this movable portion is depressible to a proportionally greater depth. The opposite or fixed side of the tray is divided horizontally. See figure 100, representing a longitudinal section into two levels or platforms, A and B, the lower B having a raised edge. When the tray is to be used for the purpose of changing the coins to be substituted are placed in a row on the upper platform, A. The genuine coins are placed by the performer holding the tray as indicated in figure 99 on the movable flap C. Slightly lowering the opposite end of the tray, he presses the button D, thus sloping the flap C and the coins naturally slide into B. Still keeping the flap open, he now tilts up the opposite end of the tray. The genuine coins cannot return by reason of the raised edge of B, but the substitute coins in their turn slide out upon C, which is then allowed to return to its original position. The necessary movement, though comparatively tedious in description, is in skilful hands so rapid in execution that where coins of the same kind are substituted, e.g. half crowns for half crowns, the most acute spectator cannot detect that any change has taken place. A most startling 
effect is produced by substituting coins of a different kind, as pence for half-crowns, the coins appearing to be transformed by a mere shake into a different metal. The change involving a double process, viz. the disappearance of certain coins and the appearance of others, it is obvious that the tray will be equally available for either process singly. Thus coins placed upon the tray may be made to instantly vanish, or by reversing the process coins may be made to appear where there was nothing a moment previously. In like manner, a given number of coins may be increased to a larger or decreased, in this case really changed, to a smaller number. This tray has not, like the last described, any additional flat tube beneath the tray. But one end of A and B is closed by a little slide, hidden beneath the edge of the tray, to allow the money therein being extracted when necessary. End of section 23. Recording by Ashley Jane. Section 24 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bev Stevens. Modern Magic. A Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring by Professor Louis Hoffman. Tricks with Watches. To indicate on the dial of a watch the hour secretly thought of by any of the company. The performer, taking a watch in the one hand and a pencil in the other, proposes to give a specimen of his powers of divination. For this purpose, he requests anyone present to write down, or, if preferred, merely to think of, any hour he pleases. This having been done, the performer, without asking any questions, proceeds to tap with the pencil different hours on the dial of the watch, requesting the person who has thought of the hour to mentally count the taps, beginning from the number of the hour he thought of. Thus, if the hour he thought of were nine, he must count the first tap as ten, the second as eleven, and so on. When, according to this mode of counting, he reaches the number twenty, he is to say stop, when the pencil of the performer will be found resting precisely upon that hour of the dial which he thought of. This capital little trick depends upon a simple arithmetical principle but the secret is so well disguised that it is very rarely discovered. All that the performer has to do is to count in his own mind the taps he gives, calling the first one, the second two, and so on. The first seven taps may be given upon any figures of the dial indifferently. Indeed, they might equally well be given on the back of the watch or anywhere else, without prejudice to the ultimate result but the eighth tap must be given invariably on the figure twelve of the dial, and thenceforward the pencil must travel through the figures seriatim, but in reverse order, eleven, ten, nine, and so on. By following this process it will be found that, at the tap which, counting from the number the spectator thought of, will make twenty, the pencil will have travelled back to that very number. A few illustrations will make this clear. Let us suppose, for instance, that the hour the spectator thought of was twelve. In this case, he will count the first tap of the pencil as thirteen, the second as fourteen, and so on. The eighth tap, in this case, will complete the twenty, and the reader will remember that, according to the directions we have given, he is at the eighth tap always to let his pencil fall on the number twelve so that when the spectator, having mentally reached the number twenty, cries, Stop! the pencil will be pointing to that number. Suppose again the number thought of was eleven. Here the first tap will be counted as twelve, and the ninth, at which, according to the rule, the pencil will be resting on eleven, will make the twenty. 
taking again the smallest number that can be thought of, one. Here, the first tap will be counted by the spectator as two, and the eighth, at which the pencil reaches twelve, will count as nine. Henceforth, the pencil will travel regularly backward round the dial, and at the nineteenth tap, completing the twenty as counted by the spectator, will have just reached the figure one. The arithmetical reason for this curious result, though simple enough in itself, is somewhat difficult to explain on paper, and we shall therefore leave it as an exercise for the ingenuity of our readers. To bend a borrowed watch backwards and forwards. This little deception is hardly to be called a conjuring trick, but it may be introduced with good effect in the course of any trick for which a watch has been borrowed. Looking intently at the watch, as though you noticed something peculiar about it, you remark to the owner, this is a very curious watch, sir. It is quite soft. Then taking it, with the dial inwards towards your own body, and holding it between two fingers of each hand on the back and the thumb of each hand on the face, you bend the hands outwards, at the same time bringing the points of the fingers nearer together, immediately bringing them back to their former position. The motion may be repeated any number of times, by a curious optical illusion, which we are not able to explain, but which we assume to be produced in some way by the varying shadow of the fingers on the polished surface of the metal, the watch appears, to a spectator at a little distance, to be bent nearly double by each outward movement of the hands. The illusion is so perfect that great amusement is occasionally produced by the consternation of the owner who fancies that irreparable injury is being done to his favourite, Waltham. If, however, his faith in your supernatural powers is so great as to resist this ordeal, you may test it even more severely by means of The Watch Mortar and the Magic Pistol The watch mortar is an apparatus in the form of an ordinary mortar with a pestle to match. Suggesting to the owner of the borrowed timekeeper that it wants regulating, you offer to undertake that duty for him. He probably declines, but you take no notice of his remonstrances, and placing his watch in the mortar, bring down the pestle with a heavy thump upon it. A smash, as of broken glass, is heard, and after sufficient pounding, you empty the fragments of the watch into your hand, to the horror of the owner. You offer to return the fragments, but he naturally objects to receive them, and insists that you restore the watch in the same condition as when it was handed to you. After a little discussion, you agree to do so, premising that you can only effect the object through the agency of fire. Fetching a loaf of bread, you place it on the table in view of the company. Then, wrapping the fragments of the watch in paper, you place them in a pistol, and aiming at the loaf, request the owner of the watch to give the signal to fire. The word is given. One, two, three, bang! Stepping up to the loaf, you bring it forward to the spectators, and tearing it asunder, exhibit in its very centre the borrowed watch, completely restored and bright as when it first left the maker's hands. The seeming mystery is easily explained. The mortar has a movable bottom, which allows the watch, at the performer's pleasure, to fall through into his hand. There is a hollow space in the thick end of the pestle, closed by a round piece of wood lightly screwed in, which, fitting tightly in the bottom part of the mortar, is easily unscrewed by the performer, or rather unscrews itself as he apparently grinds away at the ill-fated chronometer. In the cavity are placed beforehand the fragments of a watch, which, thus released, fall into the mortar and are poured out by the performer into his hand, in order to show that there has been no deception. When the performer goes to fetch the loaf, he has already obtained possession of the watch, which, after giving it a rub upon his coat sleeve or a bit of leather to increase its brightness, he pushes into a slit already made in the side of the loaf. When the loaf is torn asunder, which the performer takes care to do from the side opposite to that in which the opening has been made, 
the watch is naturally found embedded therein if a regular conjuring table is used the loaf may be placed in readiness on the servant the performer in this case having got possession of the watch and holding it secretly palmed borrows a hat walking carelessly behind his table he asks as if in doubt who lent me this hat holding it up with one hand that the spectators may see that it is empty while all eyes are thus drawn to the hat he with the other hand forces the watch into the loaf and then in bringing the hat down on the table introduces the loaf into it after the manner of the well-known cannonball trick to be described hereafter the hat is then placed on the table as if empty and the pistol fired at the hat this little addition heightens the effect of the trick but demands somewhat greater address on the part of the performer the pistol employed being of constant use in magical performances will demand a special explanation it consists of two parts viz an ordinary pocket pistol and a conical tin funnel measuring about five inches across its widest diameter and tapering down to a tube of such a size as to fit easily over the barrel of the pistol this tube is continued inside the cone and affords a free passage for the charge which consists of powder only any object which is apparently to be fired from the pistol is pressed down between the outside of this tube and the inside of the tin cone where it remains wholly unaffected by the explosion the outside of the cone is japanned according to taste the tube and the rest of the interior being always black there are numerous other ways of finishing the trick with or without the use of the pistol the watch mortar has discharged its duty when it has apparently reduced the borrowed watch to fragments and has placed it in reality in the hands of the performer the sequel of the trick with which the mortar has nothing to do will depend on the ingenuity of the performer and his command of other apparatus there is another form of watch mortar which is frequently used though to our own taste it is very inferior to that above described it consists of a cylindrical tin box or case about four inches high and three in diameter open at the top standing on a broad flat foot within this fits loosely another similar cylinder of about an inch less in depth the upper edge of this latter is turned over all round giving the two the appearance of being both of a piece the whole is closed by an ornamental cardboard cover also cylindrical if this cover be lifted lightly i e without pressure it will come off alone but if its sides are pressed they will clip the turned over edge of the upper or movable compartment and lift this with it in this form of the trick the borrowed watch is placed in a little bag and the two together deposited in the upper compartment in the mortar proper i e the space between the two compartments is placed beforehand a similar little bag containing the broken fragments of a watch the cover being under some pretext put on the upper compartment is lifted off with it and the pounding consequently falls on the prepared fragments the snuff box vase this is an apparatus of frequent use in watch tricks and it may be also made available with many other articles it is made of various sizes from five to eight inches in height and of the shape shown in figure 102 it consists of three parts the cover a the vase proper c and a movable portion b the latter being made with double sides so that it fits at once in and upon c if a is raised without pressing its sides it comes off alone but if its sides are pressed in removing it it lifts off b with it in this compartment b is placed a small round box of tin or cardboard from which the vase derives its name and another box exactly similar in appearance is placed underneath b inside the vase proper c whether therefore the cover is removed with or without b the audience see apparently the same box within the only circumstance that could possibly excite suspicion would be the greater depth of c as compared with b 
and this is obviated by making the bottom of C movable, resting on a spiral spring passing through the foot of the apparatus. When B is in the vase, the bottom of C sinks down to make way for it, but again rises by the pressure of the spring as soon as B is removed. To the eye of the spectator, therefore, the interior of the vase appears always of the same depth. Some vases are made with a clip action in the lid, so that by slightly turning around the knob on the top, three projecting teeth of metal are made to tighten upon B and thus attach it to A, a reverse movement of the knob again releasing it. In this form of the apparatus, the cover may be lifted by the knob only, without the necessity of pressing on the sides, a very decided improvement. The snuff-box vase may be used to cause the appearance, disappearance, or transformation of any article small enough to be contained in one of the boxes within. Thus, in the case of the last trick, the performer, having secretly obtained possession of the borrowed watch, may, instead of using the loaf, conclude the trick with good effect as follows. Retiring for an instant in order to fetch the vase, he places the watch in the small box contained in C. Returning, he removes the cover only, thus exposing the interior of B, and requests one of the audience to examine and replace the small box therein contained. The box is seen by all to be empty, and being replaced, the vase is again covered. The operator now fires at the vase. Having done so, he again brings it forward, but this time removes B along with the cover. The other box, which the audience take to be the same, is now exposed, and on being examined, is found to contain the restored watch. If you do not happen to possess the watch mortar or the magic pistol, you may make the trick equally effective without them, by using in their place the demon handkerchief. Described at page 195. Having borrowed the watch, you place a substitute, which you must have ready palmed, under the handkerchief, and give it to someone to hold. Then, fetching the snuff-box vase, and concealing the watch in C, you exhibit and replace the empty box in B, as above, and place the vase on the table. Taking a corner of the handkerchief, you request the person holding it to drop it when you count three. Then, saying one, two, three, pass, you wave the handkerchief, which appears to be empty, and advancing to the table and uncovering the vase, show that the watch is now in the box. It is obvious that the snuff-box vase may equally well be used to produce the opposite effect, i.e., after having openly placed a watch or other article in either of the boxes, you may, by exposing in turn the other box, cause it to apparently disappear, or in like manner make it apparently change to any article previously placed in the second box. The Watch Box This is an oblong mahogany box, size 4 inches by 3 and 2 and a half deep. To the eye of the uninitiated, it is a simple wooden box, with lock and key, and padded within at top and bottom. In reality, however, one of its sides is movable, working on a pivot. See figures 103 and 104. In its normal position, the side in question is held fast by a catch projecting from the corresponding edge of the bottom of the box. To release it, pressure in two places is required, a pressure on the bottom of the box so as to lift the catch, and a simultaneous pressure on the upper part of the movable side of the box, thus forcing the lower part outwards and allowing the watch or other article placed in the box to fall into the hand of the performer. For this purpose, the box is held as shown in figure 103. The manner of using the box is as follows. A borrowed watch is placed in it, the owner being requested, in order to ensure its safekeeping, himself to lock it up and keep the key. The performer places the box on his table in full view, but avails himself of the moment during which his back is turned to the audience to extract the watch, as shown in figure 103, and to again close the secret opening. 
Having thus gained possession of the watch, he can conclude the trick by causing it to reappear in the snuff-box vase or in any other way that he thinks proper. There is an improved watch-box, the invention of the late Monsieur Robert Houdin, which contains, concealed in the lid, a mechanical arrangement producing a ticking sound, which may be set in motion and again stopped at the pleasure of the performer. By using this box, the watch may be heard apparently ticking inside until the very moment when it is commanded by the operator to pass to some other apparatus. The Watch Target This is, in appearance, an ordinary-looking round target of about 12 inches in diameter and supported on an upright pillar. It is painted in concentric circles, and on the bull's-eye is fixed a little hook. Its use is as follows. A watch, having been borrowed and smashed to pieces, or made to disappear altogether, as before explained, the performer brings forward the target, which is either held by the assistant or placed upon the magician's table. Producing the magic pistol, the performer proceeds to load it, visibly or invisibly, according to the circumstances of the trick, with the borrowed watch or the fragments thereof. Then, taking careful aim, he fires at the target, when the borrowed watch is seen to alight on the little hook already mentioned, whence it is removed and handed to the owner. A closer inspection of the target, which is sometimes of wood, but more often of tin, japanned, would disclose the fact that the bull's-eye is movable, revolving perpendicularly on its own axis. It is coloured alike on both sides, and each side is provided with such a hook as already mentioned, so that whichever side of the bull's-eye is for the time being level with the face of the target, no difference is perceptible to the spectator. There is a little projecting pin, or stop, at one point of the diameter of the bull's-eye, which prevents its making more than a half revolution, and a little spiral spring attached to one of the two pivots on which it moves compels it to turn, when at liberty, always in one particular direction, until stopped by the pin, so that its normal condition is to have one particular side, which we will call, for greater clearness, side A, always turned towards the face of the target. The bull's-eye may, however, be turned round, so that the opposite side, B, is towards the face of the target, and there is a little catch which retains it as so turned. But the instant the catch is withdrawn, the action of the spring makes it fly round again to its old position. The catch is released by means of a stiff wire passing through the pillar on which the target rests, and terminating in a round disc of metal in the foot. The mode of connection between the wire and the catch varies according to the fancy of the maker. But whatever this may be, the catch is invariably released by an upward pressure of the disc from below. If the target is held in the hand of the assistant, this is affected by the direct pressure of the fingers. But in stage performances, where the target is placed on a table, this, as indeed almost every other mechanical piece, is set in motion by the upward movement of a wire rod, known as a piston, made by the pulling of a string to rise through the upper surface of the table. When the target is required for use, the bull's-eye is twisted round so that the side A is turned towards the back, and in this position it is fixed by the catch. The borrowed watch is then hooked on the same side of the bull's-eye, the assistant, in bringing forward the target, takes care to keep the face turned towards the spectators, so that the watch, being behind, is unseen. At the moment of firing the pistol, the disc is pressed upwards, and the catch being thus withdrawn, the bull's-eye instantly spins round, and the side A, on which is the watch, takes the place of side B on the face of the target. The movement is so instantaneous that the quickest eye cannot follow it, and the explosion of the pistol at the same moment aids still further to baffle the vigilance of the spectators, to whom it appears as if the borrowed watch had really passed from the pistol to the face of the target. This forms an effective conclusion to the watch-mortar trick, 
the fragments, supposed to be those of the borrowed watch, being placed in the pistol and remaining there. Where the watch box above described is used, you merely go through the motion of taking the watch out, invisibly, through the top of the box, and in like manner placing it in the pistol. The mesmerized watch, to make any watch a repeater. This is a trick which may be incidentally introduced with advantage in the course of any illusion in which a borrowed watch is employed. The performer, addressing the owner, asks carelessly, Is this watch a repeater? The answer is in the negative, and the performer resumes, Would you like it to become a repeater? I have only to mesmerize it a little. So saying, he makes pretended mesmeric passes over the watch, every now and then holding it to his ear. At last he says, I think it will do now, let us try. Taking the chain between his finger and thumb, he lets the watch hang down at full length in front of him. Come, watch, oblige me by telling us the hour that last struck. We will suppose that the time is twenty minutes to nine. To the astonishment of all, the watch chimes eight successive strokes with a clear bell-like tone. Now the last quarter. The watch chimes two and stops. You see, sir, that under the mesmeric influence your watch becomes a capital repeater. Let us test its intelligence still further. Here is a pack of cards. Will you oblige me by drawing one? Now, watch, tell me what card this gentleman has taken, and answer in the proper spiritualistic fashion by three strokes for yes and one for no. Do you know the card? The watch chimes thrice. Very good. Is it a club? The watch chimes once. Is it a spade? The watch again strikes once. Is it a heart? The watch chimes three times. The card is a heart, is it? Now, will you tell us what heart? The watch chimes seven and stops. The watch declares that your card was the seven of hearts, sir. Is that so? The card is turned and shown to have been correctly named. Another card, say the queen of hearts, is now drawn. The watch names the suit as before, but when ordered to name the particular card, remains silent, and the performer therefore puts further questions. Is the card a plain card? Answer, no. It is a court card, is it? Well, is it the knave? Answer, no. Is it the queen? Yes. Other questions may in like manner be put, e.g. as to the number thrown by a pair of dice. The watch is at any moment handed for inspection, and if any suggestion of special mechanism be made, a second watch is borrowed and mesmerized with the like result. The secret lies in the use of an ingenious little piece of apparatus, which is placed in the waistcoat pocket of the performer, and from which the sound proceeds. This apparatus, which is represented in figure 105, consists of a short brass cylinder, about an inch and a quarter in depth and two inches in diameter, containing a small clock bell with the necessary striking mechanism, which is wound up beforehand with a key after the manner of a watch. This mechanism is set in motion by pressure on the button A, the hammer continuing to strike as long as the pressure is continued but ceasing as soon as the pressure is removed. The cylinder, which is perforated all round, in order to give free passage to the sound, is placed upright in the left pocket of the performer's waistcoat, which should be just so tight around the ribs that the mere expansion of the chest shall cause the necessary pressure against the button A, the pressure ceasing when the chest is again contracted. The placing of a playing card in the pocket for A to rest against will be found to facilitate the arrangement. This is the whole of the secret. In working the trick, the performer has only to take care to hold the watch in a tolerably straight line between the pocket and the audience, when the line in which the sound travels 
being the same as if it actually came from the watch, it will be almost impossible to detect the deception. Some performers, instead of placing the apparatus in the pocket, as above described, hold it in the right hand, the wand being held in the same hand, and cause it to strike by the pressure of the fingers. This is in one sense less effective, inasmuch as you cannot show the hands empty, but it is a very much more easy and certain method, so far as the striking is concerned. The striking apparatus is generally made to give from fifty to sixty strokes. The performer must be careful not to prolong the trick until the whole are expended, or the unexpected silence of the watch may place him in an embarrassing position. It is hardly necessary to remark that the drawn cards are forced. Where the watch is made to disclose the numbers thrown by a pair of dice, the dice are either loaded, and thus bound to indicate certain given numbers, or a box is used in which a pair of previously arranged dice take the place, to the eyes of the audience, of the pair just thrown. End of section 24「Section 25 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic, a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Section 25. Tricks with Rings. The Flying Ring. The majority of ring tricks depend upon the substitution at some period of the trick of a dummy ring for a borrowed one, which must be so nearly alike as not to be distinguishable by the eye of the spectator. This desideratum is secured by using wedding rings, which, being always made plain, are all sufficiently alike for this purpose. You may account for your preference of wedding rings by remarking that they are found to be imbued with a mesmeric virtue which renders them peculiarly suitable for magical experiments, or give any other reason, however absurd, so long as it is sufficiently remote from the true one. As, however, many ladies have a sort of superstitious objection to remove their wedding rings, even for a temporary purpose, it will be well to provide yourself with an extra one of your own, so as to meet a possible failure in borrowing. There is a little appliance, exceedingly simple in its character, which may be used with advantage in many ring tricks. It consists of a plain gold or gilt ring, attached to a short piece of white or grey sewing silk. This, again, is attached to a piece of cord elastic, fastened to the inside of the coat sleeve of the performer, in such manner that, when the arm is allowed to hang down, the ring falls about a couple of inches short of the edge of the cuff. Some, in place of the elastic, use a watch barrel, attached in like manner, but the cheaper apparatus, if properly arranged, is equally effective. It is obvious that if a ring so prepared be taken in the fingers of the hand to whose sleeve it is attached, it will, on being released, instantly fly up the sleeve. This renders it a useful auxiliary in any trick in which the sudden disappearance of such a ring is an element, and a little ingenuity will discover numerous modes of making it so available. One of the simplest modes of using it is as follows. Producing a small piece of paper, to which you direct particular attention, you state that a wedding ring wrapped up therein cannot be again extracted without your permission. A wedding ring is borrowed in order to test your assertion, and you, meanwhile, get in readiness the flying ring, which is attached, we will suppose, to your left sleeve. Receiving the borrowed ring in your right hand, you apparently transfer it to the other hand, really palming it between the second and third fingers, 
and at the same moment exhibiting your own ring, and immediately afterwards drop the borrowed ring into the pochette on that side. You must take care so to stand that the back of your left hand may be towards the spectators, that the thread, lying along the inside of your hand, may not be seen. Spreading the paper on the table, and placing the ring upon it, you fold the paper over it, beginning with the side away from you, and pressing it so as to show the shape of the ring through it. As you fold down a second angle of the paper, you release the ring, which forthwith flies up your sleeve. You continue to fold the paper, and, repeating your assertion that no one can take the ring out without your permission, hand it to a spectator, in order that he may make the attempt. On opening the paper, he finds that you were very safe in asserting that he could not take the ring out of it, inasmuch as the ring is no longer in it. Having gained possession of the borrowed ring, you may reproduce it in a variety of different ways, according to your own fancy and invention. For instance, you may, retiring for a moment, bring forward the snuff-box vase, described at page 217, meanwhile wrapping the ring in a piece of paper similar to that you have already used, and placing it in one of the boxes contained in the vase. Bringing the vase forward to the audience, you open it in such manner as to exhibit the other box, in which, after it has been duly examined, you request one of the audience to place the empty paper. Closing the vase, and placing it on the table, you fire your pistol at it, or merely touch it with your wand, and order the ring to return to the paper. You now open the vase at the compartment containing the first box. Drawing particular attention to the fact that you have not even touched the box, you again offer it for inspection. The folded paper, which the audience take to be the same, is duly found therein, and, on being opened, is shown to contain the borrowed ring. A similar effect, on a smaller scale, may be produced by privately placing the paper containing the ring in the inner compartment of the plug box, described at page 192, and requesting one of the audience to place the original folded paper in the outer compartment. To pass a ring from the one hand to either finger of the other hand. This is a very old and simple trick, but it has puzzled many and comes in appropriately in this place, as affording another illustration of the use of the flying ring. The only additional preparation consists of a little hook, such as is used to fasten ladies' dresses, sewn to the trouser of the performer, just level with the fingers of his right hand when hanging by his side, but a little behind the thigh, so as to be covered by the coat-tail. Borrowing a wedding ring, the performer receives it in his right hand, immediately transferring it in appearance, as in the last trick, to his left hand. Showing in place of it the flying ring, which is already in his left hand, he drops the right hand to his side, and slips the borrowed ring on the little hook. Then remarking, You all see this ring, which I have just borrowed. I will make it invisibly pass to my right hand, and on to whichever finger of that hand you may please to select. Here he waves his right hand with an indicative gesture, thus indirectly showing that he has nothing therein, and again lets the hand fall carelessly by his side. As soon as the finger is chosen, he slips the borrowed ring upon the end of that particular finger immediately closing the hand so as to conceal it, and holds out the hand at arm's length in front of him. Then saying, One, two, three, pass, he releases the flying ring, and, opening both hands, shows that the left is empty, 
and that the borrowed ring has passed to the selected finger of the right hand. The hook may, if preferred, be dispensed with, the ring being simply dropped into the pochette on the right side, and again taken from thence when required. To pass a ring through a pocket handkerchief. This is but a juvenile trick, but we insert it for the sake of completeness. It is performed by the aid of a piece of wire, sharpened to a point at each end, and bent into the form of a ring. The performer, having this palmed in his right hand, borrows a wedding ring and a handkerchief, silk for preference. Holding the borrowed ring between the fingers of his right hand, he throws the handkerchief over it, and immediately seizes with the left hand, through the handkerchief, apparently the borrowed ring, but really the sham ring, which he adroitly substitutes. He now requests one of the spectators to take hold of the ring in like manner, taking care to make him hold it in such a way that he may not be able to feel the opening between the points, which would betray the secret. The ring being thus held, and the handkerchief hanging down around it, a second spectator is requested, for greater security, to tie a piece of tape or string tightly round the handkerchief an inch or two below the ring. The performer then takes the handkerchief into his own hand, and, throwing the loose part of the handkerchief over his right hand, so as to conceal his mode of operation, slightly straightens the sham ring, and works one of the points through the handkerchief so getting it out, and rubbing the handkerchief with his finger and thumb in order to obliterate the hole made by the wire in its passage. He now palms the sham ring and produces the real one, which has all along remained in his right hand, requesting the person who tied the knot to ascertain for himself that it has not been tampered with. To pass a ring through the table this also is a juvenile trick, but a very good one. The necessary apparatus consists of an ordinary glass tumbler, and a handkerchief to the middle of which is attached, by means of a piece of sewing silk about four inches in length, a substitute ring of your own. Borrowing a ring from one of the company, you announce that it will, at your command, pass through the table. But as the process, being magical, is necessarily invisible, you must first cover it over. Holding the handkerchief by two of the corners, you carelessly shake it out, taking care to keep the side on which is the suspended ring towards yourself, and wrapping in it, apparently, the borrowed, but really the suspended ring, you hand it to one of the company, requesting him to grasp the ring through the handkerchief and to hold it securely. A word of caution may here be given, which will be found more or less applicable to all magical performances. Have the room in which you perform as brilliantly lighted as you please, but take care so to arrange the lights, or so to place yourself, that all the lights may be in front of you, and none behind you. The trick we are now describing affords a practical illustration of the necessity for this. If you have any light behind you, the handkerchief, as you shake it to show that it is not prepared, will appear semi-transparent, and the spectators will be able to see the suspended ring dangling behind it. For a similar reason, you should always endeavor to have a dark background for your performances as any thread, or the like, which you may have occasion to secretly use, will then be invisible at a short distance, while against a light background, for example, a muslin curtain or white wallpaper, it would be instantly noticeable. But to return to our trick, we left one of the spectators tightly holding the suspended ring, covered by the folds of the handkerchief. Your next step is to request the audience to choose at what particular spot in the table the ring shall pass through it. 
When they have made the selection, you place the tumbler upon the spot chosen, and request the person having charge of the ring to hold his hand immediately over the glass, around which you drape the folds of the handkerchief. Now, you say, will you be kind enough, sir, to drop the ring in the glass? He lets go, and the ring falls with an audible ting into the glass. Are you all satisfied, you ask, that the ring is now in the glass? The reply will generally be in the affirmative, but if anyone is skeptical, you invite him to shake the glass, still covered by the handkerchief, when the ring is heard to rattle within it. Your next step is to borrow a hat, which you take in the hand which still retains the genuine ring, holding it in such manner that the tips of the fingers are just inside the hat, the ring being concealed beneath them. In this condition, you can freely exhibit the inside of the hat, which is seen to be perfectly empty. You now place the hat under the table, mouth upwards, relaxing as you do so the pressure of the fingers and allowing the coin to slide gently down into the crown. Leaving the hat under the table, which should be so placed that the spectators cannot, as they stand or sit, see quite into the crown, you take hold of the extreme edge of the handkerchief, and saying, one, two, three, pass, jerk it away, and request someone to pick up the hat, and return the borrowed ring to the owner. We have given the trick in its simplest form, but it is obvious that it is capable of any amount of variation as regards the circumstances under which the vanished ring is again found. The plug box, page 192, or the nest of boxes, page 197, may be here made available. The performer placing the ring where it is to be afterwards found during his momentary absence in search of the necessary apparatus. To pass a ring invisibly upon the middle of a wooden wand, the ends being held by two of the spectators. In this trick, the handkerchief prepared, with the ring attached, for the purpose of the last illusion may be again employed. Though some use, for the present purpose, a handkerchief with a ring stitched in one corner. In our own opinion, the suspended ring is preferable, and we shall describe the trick accordingly. The only other requisite will be the magic wand, or any short stick or rod of such diameter that a finger ring may slip easily upon it. Having borrowed a ring, you proceed to wrap it, in reality the substitute, in the handkerchief and hand it to someone to hold. The borrowed ring, of course, remains in your hand. Picking up with your other hand your wand, you transfer it to the hand containing the ring. Taking hold of it by the extreme end, you pass the ring over it, which a very little practice will enable you to do without the smallest difficulty. You then say, I am about to order the ring which Mr. So-and-so is holding to leave the handkerchief and pass on to this wand. For greater security, I will ask two of the gentlemen present to hold the ends. Will someone volunteer for the purpose? Two candidates having come forward, you place yourself facing the person who is holding the ring in the handkerchief at the same time sliding your hand with the ring to the center of the wand, and holding the latter in a horizontal position across your body. You now invite the two volunteers each to take hold of one end, pretending to be very particular that the wand should be perfectly horizontal, this giving you an excuse for keeping your hand upon it, sliding it backwards and forwards, and raising now one end now the other, till the level is such as to satisfy your correct eye. When at last you are satisfied, you ask the person in charge of the ring to step forward, 
so as to bring it immediately above the wand, over which you immediately spread the pocket handkerchief, letting the edges fall on either side of the wand. As soon as the wand is covered, you can, of course, remove your hand. Then, taking hold of one corner of the handkerchief, you request the holder of the ring to let go at the word three, and saying, one, two, three, pass. Draw away the handkerchief sharply, which, brushing against the genuine ring, will set it revolving rapidly, as though it had just passed onto the wand. Some professors introduce the flying ring in the performance of this trick, thus dispensing altogether with the handkerchief. The slight variations in working thereby rendered necessary will readily suggest themselves without further explanation. The Magic Ball and Rings this is a recent improvement on the trick last described. The performer borrows three rings, which, in this instance, as the trick does not depend upon a substitution, may be of any pattern. They should not, however, be too large, for which reason ladies' rings are preferable. These he places, or requests the owners to place, in the Davenport cabinet, see page 195, the watch box, see page 219, or any other apparatus which will enable him secretly to get possession of them. He then brings in and hands for inspection an ebony ball, an inch and a half to two inches in diameter, through which is bored a hole of three-eighths of an inch in diameter, and a brass rod about two feet in length, with a knob at each end, and of such a thickness as to pass freely through the ball. Both are closely scrutinized, and admitted to be fair and solid. In sight of all he unscrews one of the knobs, and places the ball upon the rod, throwing a handkerchief over it, and requesting two of the audience to hold the ends. Passing his hand under the handkerchief, he orders the ball to drop into his hand, when his command is instantly obeyed. He next orders the rings to pass from the cabinet, and to take the place of the ball on the brass rod. On removing the handkerchief, the rings are seen on the rod, and the cabinet, on examination, is found empty. The secret consists in the use of two balls, one of which that handed round for inspection has no speciality the other is divided into two parts the section being vertically through the bore see figure 106 these two parts fit closely together and being as is also the solid ball carved in concentric circles parallel to the opening the division is not readily noticeable the two halves a and b are hollowed out to contain the rings, each having three slots or mortises cut at right angles to the direction of the hole through the ball. When the performer retires to fetch the ball and rod, he places the borrowed rings in these slots. When the two halves of the ball are brought together, the rings will encircle the hole through the center, and the rod, when passed through the ball, will pass through the rings also. The performer places the trick ball, thus prepared, under his waistband, or in one of his pochettes, and, returning, hands for inspection the brass rod and the solid ball. While these are being examined, he palms the trick ball, and in passing over the rod apparently the ball which has just been examined, adroitly substitutes that which contains the rings. After having thrown the handkerchief over the rod, he passes under it his hand, still containing the solid ball. It is an easy matter to pull asunder the hollow ball, and this in turn is palmed, and the solid ball passed to the end of the fingers, before the performer, again uncovering his hand, which he brings out palm downward, carelessly throws down the solid ball, 
as being that which he has just taken off the rod. This is the only part of the trick which requires any special dexterity, and any difficulty which may be at first found will quickly disappear with a little practice. When the ball comes apart, the rings are, of course, left on the rod. A further improvement may be made in the trick by using a sword with a rapier blade in place of the brass rod. The trick is not only more effective in appearance, as the sword appears to cut through the ball, but the tapering shape of the blade makes the trick much easier to perform, as you have only to draw the ball down towards the hilt, when the swell of the blade will force the two halves of the ball apart, leaving them naturally in your hand. It is best in this case simultaneously to let the solid ball drop from your palm to the floor. This draws all eyes downwards, and gives you ample opportunity to drop the halves of the trick ball into your secret pocket. In this form of the trick you, of course, hold the sword yourself in the ordinary manner, and you may, if you prefer it, dispense with the handkerchief, using your hand only to mask the operation, at once stepping forward as the ball drops to the ground and saying, Will the owners be kind enough to identify their rings? To pass a borrowed ring into an egg. This is an effective conclusion to a ring trick. The necessary apparatus consists of two wooden egg cups, inside one of which, at the bottom, is cut a mortise or slot just large enough to receive one half the circumference of a lady's ring, and to hold it in an upright position. The second egg cup has no speciality, being, in fact, merely a dummy, designed to be handed to the audience for inspection. An ordinary button-hook, or a piece of wire bent into the shape of a button-hook, completes the preparations. We will assume that the performer has, in the course of one or other of the tricks already described, secretly obtained possession of a borrowed ring which the audience believe still to remain in some place or apparatus in which they have seen it deposited. The operator, retiring for an instant, returns with a plate of eggs in one hand and the dummy egg cup in the other. The special egg cup, with the ring already in the mortise, is meanwhile placed either under his waistband or in one or other of his pochettes, so as to be instantly get addable when required. Placing the eggs on the table, he hands round the egg cup for inspection, that all may observe that it is wholly without preparation, and in turning to place the egg cup on the table, he substitutes for it the one which contains the ring, but which the audience naturally believe to be that which they have just examined. Bringing forward the plate of eggs, the performer requests the company to choose whichever they please. While they are making their selection, he carefully turns back his sleeves, showing indirectly that his hands are empty. Taking the chosen egg with the tips of his fingers, and showing it on all sides, to prove that there is no preparation about it, he says, Now, ladies and gentlemen, you have seen me place the ring which this lady has kindly lent me in so-and-so, according to the place where it is supposed to be. You have selected, of your own free choice, this particular egg among half a dozen others. I am about to command the ring to leave the place where it now is, and to pass into the very center of this egg. If you think the egg is prepared in any way, it is open to you even now to choose another. You are all satisfied that the egg has not been tampered with? Well, then. Just observe still that I have nothing in my hands. I have merely to say, One, two, three, pass. The ring is now in the egg. At the word pass, the performer taps one end of the egg with his wand, just hard enough to crack it slightly. Dear me, he says, I did not intend to hit quite so hard, but it is of no consequence. Stepping to the table, 
he places the egg, with the cracked end downwards, in the prepared egg cup, using just sufficient pressure to force the egg well down upon the ring, the projecting portion of which is thereby forced into the egg. The egg being already cracked, a very slight pressure is sufficient. Bringing forward the egg in the cup, the hook already mentioned, and a table napkin, he taps the top of the egg smartly with his wand, so as to crack it, and offering the hook to the owner of the ring, requests her to see whether her property is not in the egg. The ring is immediately fished out, and being wiped upon the napkin, is recognized as that which was borrowed. The apparatus in which it was originally placed is, on being examined, found empty. The Magic Rose This little apparatus affords the means for a graceful termination of a ring trick. A ring having been made to disappear in any of the modes before described, the operator, retiring for a moment, returns with a rosebud in his hand. Advancing to the owner of the ring, he requests her to breathe on the flower. As she does so, the bud is seen slowly to open, and in the center of the new-blown flower is found the missing article. The idea of the flower, warmed into bloom under a fair lady's breath, is so poetical that it seems quite a pity to be obliged to confess that the rose is an artificial one, made chiefly of tin, and that its petals, normally held open by the action of a spring, are, when the flower is first brought on, kept closed by a sliding ring or collar upon the stalk, again reopening as this collar is drawn back by the magician's fingers. End of section 25section 26 of modern magic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson modern magic a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by professor louis hoffman tricks with handkerchiefs part 1 we have already discussed a good many tricks in which handkerchiefs are employed in one way or another the present chapter will be devoted to those feats in which the handkerchief forms the sole or principal object of the illusion where practicable the handkerchief used should always be a borrowed one so as to exclude the idea of preparation and in borrowing it will occasionally be necessary to use a little tact in order to make certain of getting the right article for your purpose without admitting by asking specially for any particular kind of handkerchief the limited extent of your powers thus whenever the trick depends upon the substitution of a handkerchief of your own it is necessary that the borrowed handkerchief should be of a plain white so as not to have too marked an individuality and of a small size, so as to be easily palmed or otherwise concealed. These desiderata you may secure, without disclosing that they are desiderata, by asking if a lady will oblige you with a handkerchief, ladies' handkerchiefs being invariably white and of small size. If a lace handkerchief, which would be inconveniently distinguishable from your substitute, is offered, you may pretend to fear the risk of injuring the lace, and on that account to prefer a less valuable article. In knot tricks, on the contrary, you should, if possible, use a silk handkerchief, which from its softer nature will be found more tractable than cambric. We will begin by describing a couple of little flourishes, which may be incidentally introduced in the performance of more ambitious tricks, and which will sometimes be found useful in occupying the attention of the audience for a moment or two while some necessary arrangement is being made behind the scenes for the purpose of the principal illusion the first we will call 
the handkerchief that cannot be tied in a knot the performer having borrowed a handkerchief pulls it this way and that as if to ascertain its fitness for the purpose of the trick finally twisting the handkerchief into a sort of loose rope he throws the two ends one over the other as in the ordinary mode of tying and pulls smartly but instead of a knot appearing as would naturally be expected in the middle of the handkerchief it is pulled out quite straight this is a very curious handkerchief he remarks i can't make a knot in it the process is again and again repeated but always with the same result the secret is as follows the performer before pulling the knot tight slips his left thumb as shown in figure 107 beneath such portion of the tie as is a continuation of the end held in the same hand the necessary arrangement of the hands and handkerchief though difficult to explain in writing will be found quite clear upon a careful examination of the figure the handkerchief that will not burn this may be used either separately or in conjunction with the foregoing the performer taking the handkerchief asks if it will burn the owner naturally answers that she has no doubt it will suppose we try says the performer and taking the handkerchief by two of its corners he draws it three or four times obliquely upwards across the flame of a lighted candle without its receiving the slightest injury there is really no mystery whatever about this although to those who have never tried it it appears very surprising and the spectators are generally persuaded that you have somehow substituted another handkerchief made incombustible by chemical means the performer has only to take care not to allow the handkerchief to rest motionless while in contact with the flame in the act of drawing the handkerchief over the candle the contact of any given part of the flame is so momentary that it is barely warmed in its passage you must however take care not to attempt this trick with a handkerchief that has been scented as any remains of spirit about it would cause it to ignite instantly and place you in a rather awkward position where a substitute handkerchief has to be burned in the course of a trick it is by no means a bad plan to exhibit with the substitute which the audience take to be the original this phenomenon of supposed incombustibility and appearing to grow careless from repeated success at last to allow the handkerchief to catch fire if you can by such means induce the audience to believe for the time being that the burning was an accident you will the more astonish them by the subsequent restoration the vanishing knot for this trick you must use a silk handkerchief twisting it rope fashion and grasping it in the middle with both hands you request one of the spectators to tie the two ends together he does so but you tell him that he has not tied them half tight enough and you yourself pull them still tighter a second and third knot are made in the same way the handkerchief being drawn tighter by yourself after each knot is made finally taking the handkerchief and covering the knots with the loose part you hand it to someone to hold breathing on it you request him to shake out the handkerchief when all the knots are found to have disappeared when the performer apparently tightens the knot he in reality only strains one end of the handkerchief grasping it above and below the knot this pulls that end of the handkerchief out of the twisted condition in the knot into a straight line round which the other end of the handkerchief remains twisted in other words converts the knot into a slip knot after each successive knot he still straightens this same end of the handkerchief this end being thus made straight would naturally be left longer than the other which is twisted round and round it this tendency the performer counteracts by drawing it partially back through the slip knot at each pretended tightening when he finally covers over the knots which he does with the left hand he holds the straightened portion of the handkerchief immediately behind the knots between the first finger and thumb of the right hand and therewith in the act of covering over the knots 
draws this straightened portion completely out of the slipknot some performers among whom we may mention herman make this feat still more effective by borrowing half a dozen handkerchiefs and allowing them all to be tied end to end by the spectators after each knot the professor pretends to examine it asking what kind of a knot do you call this sir and meanwhile pulls it into the required condition the joined handkerchiefs are then placed one upon the other on a chair or in a hat and are immediately afterwards shown to be separate the student must be on his guard against one particular kind of knot which cannot be pulled into the condition above named we allude to the very common mode of tying in which the two ends to be tied are placed side by side and tied simultaneously in a single knot the employment of this kind of knot may generally be avoided by holding the two ends to be tied at a tolerably wide angle so that they cannot very well be drawn parallel if however a spectator appears determined to tie this particular knot it is better to allow him to do so and then remark as the knots are tied by yourselves ladies and gentlemen you can have little doubt that they are all fair however for the greater satisfaction of all present i will ask some gentleman to be good enough to untie one of them which will give a fair criterion to the time it would take in a natural way to get rid of the remainder so saying you hand the knot in question to be untied and in subsequently giving the ends to be again joined select a more accommodating person to tie them as the tricks which follow mainly depend upon the substitution of a second handkerchief we shall in the first place describe two or three modes of effecting the necessary exchange with and without the aid of apparatus to exchange a borrowed handkerchief for a substitute have the substitute handkerchief tucked under your waistcoat at the left side so as to be out of sight but within easy reach of your hand receive the borrowed handkerchief in your right hand and as you left wheel to your table to place it thereon tuck it under your waistband on the right side and at the same moment pull out with the other hand the substitute and throw the latter on the table the substitute handkerchief which the audience take to be the real one being thus left in full view you may without exciting any suspicion retire with the genuine one and dispose of it as may be necessary for the purpose of your trick you may however sometimes desire merely to gain possession of a borrowed handkerchief or to place it within reach of your assistant without yourself leaving the apartment in this case the substitute may be placed as before but on your right side receiving the borrowed handkerchief in your right hand you hold it loosely hanging down between the second and third or third and fourth fingers this leaves the thumb and first finger free and these you quickly pull down as you turn to go to your table the substitute you then have both handkerchiefs held openly in the same hand but both being of like appearance the audience take them to be one only passing behind your table you let fall the borrowed handkerchief upon the servante and throw the substitute upon the table a very audacious and generally successful mode of effecting the change is as follows taking the handkerchief and pressing it into a moderately small compass the performer says now i am going to make this handkerchief disappear there are plenty of ways of doing it i'll show you one or two this is professor de jones's method he just turns round so to put the handkerchief on the table performer turns accordingly but meanwhile the handkerchief is gone ah you were too sharp for me you saw me poke it up my sleeve quite right here it is i see professor jones's method wouldn't have any chance with you this is professor de smith's method he turns as before the handkerchief is gone again not far though for here it is turning back breast of coat and showing handkerchief Professor de Robinson does it like this he turns away for an instant and tucks handkerchief under waistband Here it is you see under the waistcoat pulls it out again Now you may very well imagine that if I had intended to have used one of these methods myself I shouldn't have explained them 
you will find that my plan is quite a different one when i want to get rid of a handkerchief i just take it to the candle and set it on fire so holds handkerchief over candle and sets light to it or i place it in such and such a piece of apparatus etc etc on the first two occasions of showing where the handkerchief is placed the performer really does exhibit the genuine article but at the third pretended feint though he really does tuck it under his waistband he pulls out again not the same handkerchief but a substitute placed there beforehand the action is so natural and so much in harmony with his previous acts that not one in a hundred will suspect that he has thereby really changed the handkerchief the mode of exchange last described ingenious as it is has one serious drawback viz that it gives the audience a clue which it is better that they should not have and suggests suspicions and conjectures which but for such a clue they would never have thought of to an acute mind even such a slight hint as this will suggest enough to destroy half the effect of any subsequent trick in which a similar process of disappearance or exchange is employed and even in the case of less intelligent spectators it will tend to diminish the prestige of the performer by showing by what shallow artifices an illusion may be produced there are two or three pieces of apparatus for effecting the, the exchange of a handkerchief by mechanical means a very good one is that known as the washerwoman's bottle in conjunction with which we will take the opportunity of describing the very effective trick known as the locked and corded box the washerwoman's bottle is a simple and inexpensive piece of apparatus of frequent use in handkerchief tricks it appears it is an ordinary black bottle save that it has a rather shorter neck and wider mouth than the generality of such vessels in reality it is made of tin japanned black and is divided by a vertical partition commencing just below the mouth into two compartments one of these has a bottom but the other has none forming in fact a mere passage through the bottle in the bottomed compartment is placed beforehand a piece of cambric or dummy handkerchief also about a glassful of port wine or some other liquor of similar color the performer borrows a lady's handkerchief pretending that he is obliged to fetch some other article for the purpose of the trick he says as if struck by a sudden thought but i mustn't run away with a handkerchief or you might fancy that i have tampered with it in some way where shall i put it ah the very thing here's a bottle belonging to my washerwoman which she left behind her the last time she came it's sure to be clean for she is a most particular old lady we often hear of a lady carrying a bottle in her handkerchief why not a handkerchief in a bottle first madam please see that i have not exchanged a handkerchief right is it well then here goes for the bottle standing behind his table in full view of the spectators he stuffs the borrowed handkerchief into the bottle ramming it down with his wand in so doing he grasps the bottle with his left hand around its base which he rests on the edge of the table nearest to himself in such a manner about half the bottom projects over the edge when he places the handkerchief in the bottle he places it in the open compartment and pushes it with his wand right through the bottle into his left hand if he desires to obtain personal possession of it or lets it fall on the servant if it is to be carried off by his assistant we will assume for our present purpose that he simply pushes it into his left hand it is easy to get rid of it into the pochette on the same side he now places a bottle in the center of the table but in doing so he pretends to hear a sound of liquid therein i hope the bottle was empty he remarks i never thought about that he shakes the bottle and the liquid therein is distinctly audible good gracious he exclaims i'm afraid i have ruined your handkerchief he now pours the liquid into a glass and then putting his fingers inside the bottle he pulls out the prepared piece of cambric which of course is wet and stained leaving it hanging from the neck of the bottle he advances to the owner 
and expresses his regret at the accident but the audience who begin to suspect that the pretended mistake is really a part of the trick insists that the handkerchief shall be restored in its original condition the performer feigns embarrassment but at last says well ladies and gentlemen i cannot dispute the justice of your observations the handkerchief certainly ought to be returned clean as at first and as my washerwoman has been the cause of the mischief she is the proper person to repair it will you excuse my stopping the entertainment for an hour or two while i go to fetch her you object to the delay well then i will bring her here by spiritualistic means a la mrs guppy pardon me one moment he retires and returns with a square box and the magic pistol placing the box on the table and making a few mysterious passes over it with his wand he says in the deepest tones spirit of mrs tubbs i command you to pass into this box there to remain until you have repaired the damage which your carelessness has caused then taking the saturated cambric from the bottle he crams it into the pistol and retiring to the farthest position of the stage fires at the box laying down the pistol and taking up the box he advances to the owner of the handkerchief and offering her the key begs her to unlock it she does so expecting to find her handkerchief but finds instead a second box this and four or five others in succession are opened and in the innermost is found the handkerchief folded and ironed as if newly returned from the wash with the reader's present knowledge it would be almost superfluous to tell him that the operator avails himself of his momentary absence to damp and fold the handkerchief and to press it with a cold iron if a hot one can be obtained so much the better but there is no absolute necessity for it having done this he places it in the square nest of boxes and closing them returns to the audience the magic pistol has already been described where an assistant is employed the performer merely pushes the handkerchief through the bottle on to the servant as already mentioned and the assistant passing behind the table on some pretext or other carries it off and places it in the nest of boxes while the audience are occupied by the pretended discovery of wine in the bottle the trick in this form appears even more surprising inasmuch as the performer does not leave the stage at all and the box is brought in and placed on the table by a person who to all appearance has never had the handkerchief even for a moment in his possession in order still further to heighten the effect of the trick the handkerchief is sometimes caused to reappear in the innermost of a nest of boxes which has throughout the entertainment been hung up in full view of the audience and the outermost of which is carefully corded and sealed the performer in this case after firing the supposed box for the audience are of course ignorant that there are more than one directs his assistant to take it down from the elevated position and place it on the table cutting the cords and opening the box he produces from it another corded like the first from this second box he produces another smaller box of an ornamental character the square nest of boxes above mentioned this he hands to the owner of the handkerchief with a request that she will open it and the result is as already described the trick in this form is one of the very best exhibited on the stage and yet as indeed are most of the best feats it is performed by the simplest possible means the outer box is an ordinary deal box bona fide sealed and corded but the second though equally genuine in appearance has no bottom and the cord though apparently quite complete does not cross beneath the box which is in fact nothing more than a wooden shell or cover with a lid to it when the performer takes out this second box and places it on the table he tilts it forward for a moment and in that moment slips the nest of boxes which is placed in readiness for the servant underneath it immediately afterwards raising the lid and taking out the nest as if it had all along been contained therein it only remains to explain the mode by which the nest of boxes with the handkerchief therein is placed upon the servant 
some performers employ the rather too transparent expedient of making the assistant bring in then and there a small round table behind which on a servant of its own is placed the closed nest of boxes a better plan where the size of the nest permits is to have it placed open before the performance commences on the servant of the centre table it is then an easy matter for the performer or his assistant as the case may be to slip in the folded handkerchief and close the boxes the remainder of the trick proceeding as already described some performers use for the purpose of this trick a special mechanical table which by means of a lifting apparatus itself introduces the nest of boxes through a trap into the bottomless box without the necessity of tilting the latter end of section 26section 27 of modern magic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson modern magic a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by professor louis hoffman tricks with handkerchiefs part 2 the reversible canister this is another piece of apparatus more particularly designed for changing a handkerchief though equally available for many other exchanges in appearance it is an ordinary cylindrical canister closed with a cap and similar in shape to those in which tea is kept but of smaller size being only five to six inches in height in reality however that which appears to be the body of the canister is a mere tube within which slides up and down an inner canister which is made double-headed that is like two shallow canisters placed bottom to bottom see figure 108 the pattern of the outer tube is alike at top and bottom so that whether the combined canister is as shown in the figure with compartment a uppermost or turned upside down with compartment b pushed into view the appearance to the eye of the spectator is the same the canister is prepared by placing beforehand in one or other of the compartments say b a piece of cambric as much like a lady's handkerchief as possible compartment a is then pushed upwards as shown in the figure borrowing a handkerchief the performer requests the owner to place it for safe keeping in the canister which he brings forward for that purpose as he turns to replace it on the table he takes advantage of the moment during which his back is towards the spectators to push down a thus pushing out b at the opposite end of the tube and at the same time to turn over the canister which when placed on the table will still look as shown in the figure but will have in reality b uppermost presently taking out the prepared cambric which the spectators take to be the handkerchief he burns or otherwise disposes of it to be subsequently reproduced by the simple process of again reversing the canister this is a simple and inexpensive piece of apparatus but it will not bear examination and the process of reversing is a little awkward for these reasons it is rarely employed by professional performers who for the same purpose more generally use what is known as the burning globe this is a hollow brass globe of four to six inches in diameter mounted on a foot of about the same height and surmounted by a cap or lid so that it forms in fact a spherical canister a raised band also of brass passes horizontally round the globe and this which is apparently a mere ornament is really designed to conceal the fact that the globe is divided into two separate hemispheres revolving one upon the other within this external globe is an inner one divided into two compartments each having a separate opening and so contrived that each of these openings in turn is made to correspond with the opening of the external globe according as the upper hemisphere of the latter is moved round from right to left or vice versa the globe is like the canister prepared by placing a substitute handkerchief or piece of cambric in one or other of the inner compartments and then bringing the other compartment into correspondence with the external opening 
a borrowed handkerchief being openly placed in the empty compartment the performer by merely giving a half turn to the foot of the apparatus brings the compartment containing the substitute uppermost the action being so little noticeable that it may be used with impunity before the very eyes of the audience the transformed handkerchief this is one of herman's favorite tricks and affords a very good example of his style of working the performer comes forward requiring the loan of a lady's handkerchief while it is being procured he produces from the hair or whiskers of one of the spectators a lemon which he carelessly thrusts under someone's nose in order to prove its genuineness this lemon which of course was palmed is a prepared one from which the pulp has been scooped out and which contains a substitute handkerchief so cannot be handed for examination turning for an instant towards the stage he tosses the lemon to his assistant who catches it and places it on the table the momentary turn from the audience enables him to get from under his waistband and to his palm a little bundle of pieces of cambric each about four inches square taking the borrowed handkerchief he rolls it into a ball between his hands and hands it apparently to someone to hold in reality substituting the torn pieces of cambric he then turns and takes a few paces towards his table meanwhile tucking the handkerchief under his waistcoat and taking therefrom in place of it a strip of cambric about four or five feet long and four inches wide rolled up into a small compass this he palms suddenly turning back he exclaimed my dear sir what are you doing with that handkerchief i never told you to do that the innocent holder looks up in astonishment but the performer continues will you have the kindness to open the handkerchief he does so and finds it in pieces after a little chaff about making him pay for the damage the performer says well i suppose i must show you how to restore it here he again takes the pieces and folds them together saying see you must take them as i do and rub them very gently with the left hand substituting the prepared slip he hands it to him but when he begins to rub exclaims again dear me dear me what are you doing now i told you the left hand you are making matters worse than ever the handkerchief is now found in a long strip the performer endeavours to induce the owner to accept it in this shape which he assures her is the newest style but she naturally objects and begs that it may be restored to its original condition for that purpose the performer rolling the slip into a ball places it in his magic pistol and rams it down with his wand appearing to reflect for a moment he says where shall i fire it ah suppose i aim at that lemon on the table bang goes the pistol and the performer taking a knife cuts the lemon all round flinging the rind carelessly on the stage and produces the substitute handkerchief professedly the original he comes forward to the audience with it and after thanking the owner makes a gesture of returning it but as if struck by a sudden thought checks himself and says i'm afraid it smells rather strong of the lemon will you allow me to scent it for you i have some capital eau de cologne here going back to his table he places the handkerchief on a plate and pours scent on it turning as he does so to the owner and saying please tell me when you think there is enough while his back is turned the attendant who has been standing by holding a lighted candle with a mischievous wink at the company tilts the candle and sets the handkerchief on fire the performer apologizes for his assistant's stupidity but appeals to the company to bear witness that it was no fault of his and bringing forward the plate with the handkerchief still blazing offers it to the owner she of course declines to take it and the performer remarking you don't like it in this condition well then suppose i put it in paper for you places the plate on the floor telling the assistant to put it on the table and runs off to get the paper the attendant tries to lift off the plate but finds that it burns his fingers however after several attempts getting the plate a little nearer to the table at each he manages to place it on the table 
this little by-play amuses the audience and gives the performer a few moments which he requires for his preparations behind the scenes coming forward with a sheet of clean white paper he wraps therein the still blazing handkerchief crushing it together so as to extinguish the flames he offers the packet so made to the lady who believing that it contains nothing but ashes declines to receive it when the professor tearing the paper apart pulls out the handkerchief perfectly restored while the burnt fragments have vanished the effect last mentioned is produced by the use of a double paper pasted together round three of its sides and thus forming a kind of bag in the centre in this bag the performer during his momentary absence from the stage places the genuine handkerchief folded so as to occupy as little space as possible the handkerchief therefore lies between the two thicknesses of the paper and when the rolled up packet is torn open from outside may be removed without disturbing the burnt fragments which still remain inside the paper where it is necessary as for the purpose of this trick to introduce some article into a lemon the necessary preparation should be made as follows a lemon with a thick hard rind should be selected and a plug-shaped piece about an inch and a half in diameter should be scooped with a sharp knife out of one end the pulp may now be removed leaving the rind a mere shell while the piece originally cut out will form a kind of stopper which may be secured in its place by thrusting a hairpin or piece of wire through the fruit and plug from side to side nipping off the ends flush with the outer surface when the performer exhibits the lemon he takes care to have the cut end inwards towards his palm so that the circular mark is concealed by the fingers and when he desires to produce the handkerchief he cuts the opposite end the handkerchief cut up burnt and finely found in a candle we have already described one or two modes in which a handkerchief after being apparently cut up or burnt may be reproduced in its original condition this is another and very effective form of the same trick having borrowed a white handkerchief you exchange it by one or other of the means already described for a substitute of similar appearance and place the latter on the table you then remember that as you are about to burn the handkerchief you will want a candle you call to your attendant but he previously instructed does not answer and after a momentary pause you determine to fetch it yourself you have however no sooner left the stage than you meet the defaulter and angrily remarking in a stage whisper so that the audience may hear that he is never at hand when you want him or making some similar observation you order him to bring a lighted candle your absence is only momentary but it has enabled you to throw him the real handkerchief which he forthwith rolls up and places inside a candle made hollow for the purpose which he then places in a candlestick lights and brings on the stage you have meanwhile taken up the substitute handkerchief and advanced to the audience getting ready the while in your palm a small piece of cambric about six inches in diameter taking the handkerchief by the centre in the same hand you pull out between the first finger and thumb a portion of the piece of cambric which is naturally taken to be a part of the handkerchief handing to one of the spectators a pair of scissors you request him to cut off a small portion of the handkerchief he cuts off a small piece of the cambric holding this piece in the one hand and taking the remainder with the substitute handkerchief hanging down below it in the other you offer to teach the company your patent method of mending handkerchiefs requiring neither thimble needle nor thread applying the cut edges to the handle you set them on fire rubbing them together finally blowing out the flame and throwing the handkerchief over the hand that holds the pieces you palm them and immediately afterwards show the handkerchief i e the substitute completely restored the mode of procedure so far is pretty well known and it is highly probable that one or more of the audience will be acquainted with it accordingly you may safely expect to perceive in some quarter or other knowing glances or confidential communications as to how it's done noticing or pretending to notice this you say 
ah i see there is a gentleman there who thinks he has found me out you fancy no doubt sir that i have performed this trick in the old fashion by cutting a piece of cambric which does not form part of the handkerchief why my dear sir the trick in that form is as old as your grandmother but it is my own fault i quite forgot to show you that the handkerchief was really cut it is my rule never to perform the same trick twice over but i feel so hurt at your unkind suspicion that i must break my rule for once and this time you shall cut the handkerchief yourself you offer him the scissors and holding up the handkerchief which the audience naturally believe to be the genuine one by the middle you allow him to cut a piece fairly out of it immediately afterwards spreading it out and showing that a large hole is made in the centre again you hold the edges to the candle but this time as if by accident you let the flames fairly catch hold of the handkerchief which you are compelled to drop upon a plate or tray and to let it burn itself out for a moment you feign to be embarrassed and the audience are half inclined to believe that you have made a mistake and your trick has failed but you quickly recover your confidence and remark this is not precisely what i intended ladies and gentlemen i am afraid i have made a little mistake but fortunately it is easily remedied the fact is i forgot to pronounce the magic word at the right moment and the handkerchief has in consequence stopped short at the first stage of transmigration to make it pass into the second stage that of renewed existence i must again employ the agency of fire see i place the ashes in my magic pistol and ram them down with my mystic wand now what shall i aim at ah the candle on the table a capital mark and as it has been before you throughout the trick you know that it cannot have undergone any preparation you fire aiming at the candle did you see it pass no it has done so nevertheless but i must have put in a little too much powder for it has gone right into the candle you bring the candle forward will someone oblige me by seeing if it is really in the candle the candle is broken in half and the handkerchief is found embedded therein the candle used for the purpose of the above trick is sometimes a genuine wax or composite candle but more often a mere pasteboard tube previously cut half asunder in the middle so as to break without difficulty and then covered with glazed white paper in imitation of a candle a genuine candle end being inserted at the top if a candle of this latter description is used the performer must himself break it as a spectator doing so would at once discover that it was a prepared article before quitting the subject of handkerchiefs burnt and restored we may mention a little appliance called the handkerchief table which is designed for this purpose it is precisely the same in make and operation as the table or tripod described at page 139 for burning and restoring a card but a little larger to those acquainted with the card tripod the use and effect of the handkerchief table will be sufficiently obvious without any special explanation the shower of sweets this is a trick which is sure to be well received by a juvenile audience the performer comes forward with an ordinary plate or salver which he hands for examination and then places on the table he then borrows a handkerchief laying it flat over the plate he lifts it up by nipping the middle with his finger and thumb letting the four corners hang down he then strokes down the handkerchief with the other hand under the pretense of mesmerizing it when a shower of burnt almonds chocolate creams acidulated drops etc pours down upon the plate again he strokes a handkerchief and again the shower pours down and the plate being by this time full handed round to the company to prove that in the quality of the sweets at any rate there is no deception the secret lies in the use of a small bag of cambric or fine calico shaped like an inverted letter v the edges are turned in at the mouth and through each hem is passed a straight piece of whale spring or whalebone one a little longer than the other the natural tendency of these is to lie side by side keeping the mouth of the bag closed 
but if pressure be simultaneously applied to both ends of the springs the longer one assumes the shape of a semicircle thereby opening the bag through the opposite end of the bag is passed a pointed wire hook the bag is beforehand filled with nuts or bonbons and hung by the hook to the edge of the table on the side away from the spectators though the bag is mouth downwards the action of the spring keeps it closed and nothing can fall out when the operator standing behind the table draws the handkerchief over the plate he allows a portion of the hinder edge to hang over the edge of the table nearest to himself when he picks up the handkerchief which he does with his finger and thumb he takes hold through the handkerchief of the upper part of the bag the bag is thus lifted up with the handkerchief but is concealed by the folds of the latter hanging down around it the movement of the hand in stroking down the handkerchief presses the springs and the bag opens again closing as soon as the pressure is relaxed when all the contents have fallen the performer drops the handkerchief bag and all on the table while he advances to the audience with the results of the trick and on again picking up the handkerchief lets fall the empty bag upon the servant or slips it into his pocket it will be observed that in the form of the trick above described the use of both hands is necessary one to hold the handkerchief while the other stroking it downward presses the springs and causes the bag to open there is an improved form of the bag used and we believe invented by robert Houdin, which enables the performer holding the handkerchief at arm's length to perform the trick by mere word of command without using the left hand at all the bag is in this case of the form shown in figure 109 no springs are used but the bag when filled is closed by folding down the flap and hooking the little ring over the hook the bag thereby assuming the appearance shown in figure 110 it is picked up within the handkerchief as described in the case of the spring bag but when it is desired to produce the sweets a slight inclination of the hook to the left effected by a barely perceptible movement of the thumb and finger causes the ring to slip off and the flap to fall down as in figure 109 releasing the whole contents of the bag the trick may be still further improved by having two similar bags stitched back to back each with its own ring and hook in this case the inclination to the left releases one hook and the inclination to the right the other the two bags may be filled with bonbons of different colors or descriptions or the one may be filled with bonbons and the other with gray peas in this case you may introduce the trick by some observations upon the singular effects of the human breath and how greatly such effects vary in different persons the handkerchief is borrowed and a lady and gentleman are required each to hold a plate the lady is requested to breathe on the handkerchief and a shower of bonbons falls on her plate the gentleman breathes in his turn and retires amid derisive applause with a plate of peas while upon the subject of the mysterious production of sweets we may incidentally mention another piece of apparatus designed for this purpose this is a wand made to correspond in general appearance with that habitually used by the performer internally it is a hollow tube with a stiff wire running throughout its whole length one end of this wire is fixed to a movable cap which covers the upper end of the wand while the other terminates in a sort of little wooden plug which closes the opening at the other end a spiral spring within the upper end of the wand tends to force the cap upwards and so to keep the opposite end closed but if pressure be applied to the cap the plug is forced outwards and the tube thereby opened see figure 111 in which a represents the wand in its normal condition i e closed when b represents it with the cap pressed downwards and the opposite end consequently open to prepare the wand for use the cap is pressed and the valve opened the wand is then filled with very minute sweetmeats of the description known among juveniles as hundreds and thousands after which the pressure on the cap is removed and the plug allowed to retire into its place 
The wand thus prepared is, at the proper moment, brought forward in place of the ordinary wand, which in its present condition it exactly resembles. The performer then declares his intention of passing a shower of sweets into the pocket of a spectator, and having first shown it empty, touches the inside with the wand, as the same moment pressing the cap, when the sweets within escape into the pocket. The feathers from an empty handkerchief. This is a very simple illusion, but has nevertheless been a favourite with many noted prestidigiteurs. Its effect is as follows. The performer comes forward with a large handkerchief or small shawl, which he shakes about in all directions to show that it is empty. Throwing it over the left hand, he with the other grasps it by the middle, and removing the hand over which it was thrown, lets it hang perpendicularly down. To all appearance it is still empty, but on being shaken it is seen to contain some solid object. With a twist of the wrist, the performer turns the handkerchief and its contents upwards. The handkerchief naturally falls down over the coat sleeves, leaving exposed a handsome military plume. The performer grasps with the left hand the stem of this plume and the centre of the handkerchief, immediately drawing away the right arm from beneath it. Again the handkerchief, on being waved about, is seen to contain something, which being held upright, the handkerchief falls down as before, and a second plume is revealed. The operation is again and again repeated, with a like result, till fifteen or twenty plumes have been produced, the handkerchief being at any moment handed for examination. The explanation lies in the fact that the plumes, which may be compressed into a very small compass, are laid beforehand along the arms of the performer, who puts on his coat over them. The stems of the plumes are nearest to the hands. When the handkerchief is thrown over either hand, the other hand catches hold, through it, of the stem of one of the feathers. This hand now remains stationary, while the other arm is drawn from under the handkerchief. The fact that the plumes come out of the sleeves is thus much less patent than if the opposite hand made the motion and drew the feather out. The plumes on being drawn out expand considerably, so much so, indeed, that it is hard to believe that the quantity with which the stage is strewn could possibly have been concealed about the person of the performer. Some performers have, in addition, a bundle of plumes fastened together by a thread, and laid along the inside of the trousers and waistcoat, in such manner that the stems are just within the breast of the latter. After having exhausted his sleeves, the operator, holding the handkerchief by two of its corners, across his chest to show that it is quite empty, catches hold with the second and third fingers of the stem of the bundle within the waistcoat, and moving the handkerchief with a quick sidelong motion from left to right, or vice versa, draws out the feathers behind it, and immediately, breaking the thread, shakes them out in a shower on the stage. End of section 27section 28 of modern magic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lucy park modern magic a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by professor lewis hoffman Tricks with Handkerchiefs, Part 3 There is another form of the same trick in which the handkerchief plays only a secondary part, but from its near relation to that last described, we insert it in this place. It is generally called the flying plume. For this trick you require two plumes, as nearly as possible alike in appearance. To the stem of each should be attached a loop of string or ribbon, two or three inches in length. You must also have a japanned tin tube of about twenty inches long and three in diameter. On each end is fitted a cap of about two inches in depth. One of these caps is perfectly plain, but within the other is an inner cap 
made after the fashion of the middle compartment of the snuff-box vase see page two hundred seventeen the relative tightness of the inner and outer caps is such that if in removing the outer one with the finger and thumb some slight degree of lateral pressure is exerted it nips the inner cap which comes off with it but if the outer cap is removed without pressure the inner cap remains on the tube forming a false top on it within this inner cap which is internally about an inch and a half deep is glued the short end of a third plume similar in colour and appearance to the two others the interior of the tube is divided into two parts by a longitudinal division also of tin running diagonally nearly from end to end the tube is thus divided into two wedge-shaped compartments the cap at one end giving access to the one and the cap at the other end to the other each being large enough to contain a plume see figure one one two representing a section of the entire tube and figure one one three giving a slightly enlarged view of the ends the tube is prepared beforehand by filling the compartment which is closed by the double cap with bonbons of various kinds the other compartment being left empty one of the plumes is concealed in the left sleeve of the performer as in the last trick these preparations having been duly made beforehand you come forward with a small shawl or a large handkerchief the tube and the second plume laying the tube and plume upon the table you request the audience to satisfy themselves that the shawl contains nothing you then ask someone to step forward and take care of the shawl which you meanwhile carelessly throw over your left hand immediately after taking hold of its center with your right as before described and drawing the left arm away it is needless to remark to those who have followed the explanation of the last trick that the hidden plume is thereby brought under the shawl though being held by the loop of ribbon there is nothing to betray its presence you hand the shawl in this condition to the person who has volunteered to hold it requesting him to keep it at arm's length still hanging down next taking up the tube you open it at the plain or unprepared end and holding it mouth downwards show that it is apparently empty and ostentatiously place the plume therein and put the cap on in returning to your table you take the opportunity to reverse the tube and to lay it down in such a manner that the opposite end i e that with the false top may be turned towards the audience some performers do this by letting the tube fall as if by accident but this is in our opinion a clumsy and an artistic proceeding by gesticulating a little with the tube and announcing what you are about to do so that the audience may little by little become less certain as to which end you have just opened and by carelessly transferring the tube from the one hand to the other just as you lay it on the table you may make the change with scarcely a chance of detection even by the keenest observer you then say i shall now ladies and gentlemen make the plume which you have just seen me place in this tube travel into the shawl which that gentleman is holding while the tube will be completely filled with objects of interest for the juvenile spectators here you may possibly hear or if not you pretend to hear a murmur to the effect that the feather has already left the tube pardon me you say the plume has not yet left the tube neither will it do so until i give the command and so saying you take up the cap leaving on the false top the audience see the little bit of feather within which they naturally take to be the end of the genuine plume again you place the cap and after going through some appropriate magical ceremony again remove it but this time carrying off the false top with it it should have been mentioned that the tube is japanned in such manner that the eye cannot detect any difference whether the false top is on or off placing the cap with the false top within it 
on the table you come forward and pour the sweets from the tube while the shawl is on examination bound to contain the plume some performers for the purpose of this trick use a tube with a false top as above described but open from end to end without the diagonal partition above mentioned before placing the plume in the tube which they do standing behind the table they secretly remove the cap at the lower end and allow the plume to fall through on the servante where it remains in this case there is no production of sweets but the plume having been produced from the shawl the performer removes both caps and hands the empty tube for examination cap magic laundry there is very little brilliancy either of invention or of manipulation in this trick but it is nevertheless generally very well received the performer requests the loan of half a dozen handkerchiefs taking care to accept white handkerchiefs only these he collects in a wooden box having somewhat the appearance of a good-sized tea caddy having got the required number he places the box upon his table and invites the attention of the audience to an ordinary tin or wooden pail this he fills with water and placing it in front of the stage takes the handkerchiefs out of the box and drops them in steering them about with his wand and making as much fun as he can by his pretended anxiety that they shall be thoroughly washed having kept this up as long as the audience appear to be amused thereby he wrings out the handkerchiefs one by one and throws them into a little shallow metal tub or pan japanned and about four inches in depth which his assistant at this moment brings forward for that purpose together with a cover after the manner of a saucepan lid and a pistol both of which he places carelessly on the table having placed the handkerchiefs in this little tub the performer announces that having washed them he will now proceed to dry them for which purpose he pours over them a little spirits of wine to which he sets fire after letting them blaze for a moment or two he claps on the cover your handkerchiefs are now dried ladies and gentlemen he says but i have still to fold and iron them it does not take very long as you will see taking up the pistol he fires at the tub and immediately removing the cover comes forward to the audience and requests them to identify their handkerchiefs which are seen neatly folded and apparently just washed and ironed within it the intelligent reader will have already guessed that the trick depends upon a substitution of handkerchiefs the box in which the genuine handkerchiefs are received has within it a movable flap between which and the back of the box the substitutes are placed when the required number has been collected this flap lets fall releasing the substitute handkerchiefs and at the same time covering the genuine ones the substitutes having been dropped into the pail of water the assistant carries off the box and behind the scenes damps and folds the borrowed handkerchiefs pressing them flat with a hot iron if available if not with a cold one the tub or pan which is used for the conclusion of the trick has an inner lining of a size as to fit tightly within it but about an inch less in depth the lid again fits within this after the manner of a saucepan lid but not quite so tightly as the lining itself fits within the outer pan the folded handkerchiefs are placed within this lining and the lid placed on or rather in it the two together as brought forward having the appearance of a lid only when the performer clasps the lid on the pan the lining is thereby introduced but when he again removes it the lining is left in exposing the folded handkerchiefs while the substitutes remain concealed between the true and false bottoms of the pan the performer of necessity accepts white handkerchiefs only as a colored one would betray the secret from the absence of its double among the substitutes some performers in order to obviate the suspicion which might be suggested by an evident preference of white handkerchiefs arrange that the colored one 
of which they possess a duplicate shall be offered by a confederate among the audience this certainly heightens the effect of the trick as it seems to negative the idea of substitution and though in general we deprecate as belonging to a low class of art the employment of confederates this is just the case in which the use of such expedient may for once be deemed admissible the egg and the handkerchief for this capital feat which is generally identified with the name of colonel studare the following are the requirements a glass goblet two small handkerchiefs generally of plain crimson silk and about sixteen inches square a larger silk handkerchief to which is attached by a silk thread of about four inches in length a blown eggshell and a hollow metal egg made of zinc enamelled white with an oval opening on one side of it measuring about an inch and a half by one inch or a little more the performer comes forward having in his right hand the goblet and one of the red silk handkerchiefs the larger silk handkerchief is thrown with apparent carelessness over the other hand and upon it rests the blown egg so placed that the thread may be out of sight while beneath the egg concealed in a fold of the handkerchief lies the second red handkerchief rolled up into as small compass as possible the metal egg is meanwhile placed in the left-hand secret pocket of the performer who introduces the trick as follows i have here ladies and gentlemen a drinking glass a couple of silk handkerchiefs and an egg all as you will perceive of the most ordinary description he passes quickly in front of the audience as though tendering the articles for examination taking care however to keep his right arm advanced towards the spectators so that the glass and small silk handkerchief may bear the brunt of inspection and finally places the glass and small handkerchief on a table or chair in full view pray observe he continues that not one of the articles is removed from your sight even for one moment now please follow me closely i will place the egg in the glass and cover it over with this handkerchief this he does by one movement for as the egg is already lying on the handkerchief a mere turn of the wrist places the egg in the glass and at the same time lets fall the handkerchief over it and at the same time the smaller handkerchief which was concealed in the larger is released and falls into the glass with the egg you have all seen me place the egg in the glass at the same time shaking the glass to show by the sound that the egg is still there which i will not again touch i shall now take this small handkerchief the one which has remained on the table and standing as far as possible away i shall command the handkerchief to dissolve and pass into the glass and the egg which is now in the glass to come into my hands so saying he holds up the handkerchief in such manner as to show indirectly that he has nothing else in his hands taking a few steps as though merely to get further from the glass and holding the handkerchief hanging down between the finger and thumb of the right hand he drops the other hand to his side and secretly takes from his pocket the hollow egg which he palms keeping the opening outwards he then standing with his left side towards the spectators joins his open hands as in figure one hundred fourteen the handkerchief hanging down between them requesting the audience to watch him narrowly that they may be quite sure that there is no deception he begins to wave his joined hands slowly up and down the second and third fingers of the right hand which it will be remembered is away from the audience meanwhile gradually working the handkerchief into the hollow of the egg he every now and then pauses to show that the handkerchief is gradually diminishing and at last when it is wholly worked into the egg opens his hands and shows the egg lying in his palm taking care of course that the opening is undermost to all appearance the handkerchief has changed into an egg here is the egg he remarks let us see if the handkerchief also has obeyed my biting 
so saying he lays the egg still with the opening downwards upon the table and taking hold with the finger and thumb of the handkerchief which covers the glass lifts it daintily up carrying with it concealed in its folds the eggshell attached thereto and leaving the duplicate red handkerchief lying in the glass it may sometimes though not very often occur that one or other of the spectators suspecting some peculiarity about the egg may ask to be permitted to examine it this of course you cannot permit while to refuse would destroy half the prestige of the illusion fortunately there is a way out of this difficulty which absolutely enhances the effect of the trick you would like to see the egg you reply by all means it is a special feature of my entertainment that all articles used therein will bear the strictest examination here is the egg during these few words you have taken up the sham egg with the fingers of your right hand taking care of course to keep the opening away from the audience and have thence apparently transferred it to your left with which hand you offer it to the too curious spectator it is hardly necessary to remark that in the apparent transfer of the egg to the left hand you have really palmed it in your right and as you extend the left hand to the spectator you quietly drop it from the right into the pochette on that side the inquirer holds out his hand to receive it pray examine it closely you say opening your empty hand over his own what you have not got it ah that is your fault you are not quick enough i always find that this experiment makes the egg excessively volatile this unexpected denouement never fails to raise a laugh against the individual who has sought to embarrass you while the impromptu disappearance of the egg will be regarded by many as the most marvellous portion of the trick the same expedient will be equally available to prevent the examination at an awkward moment of other small articles there is another method in which the trick is performed with handkerchiefs borrowed from the audience in this case two metal eggs like that above described are used the blown egg being dispensed with the performer commences the trick by borrowing two handkerchiefs a lady's handkerchief and a larger one preferably of silk these he places on his table secretly exchanging the smaller one for a substitute of his own and retires for a moment to fetch a glass he takes advantage of his momentary absence to insert the handkerchief of which he has gained possession into one of the hollow eggs and returns with this egg lying the opening downwards on his left palm the other hand holding the glass while the second hollow egg is concealed in his left pochette coming forward to the audience he picks up and passing the larger handkerchief from the table and handing the glass as forming the principal portion of the apparatus for examination throws the handkerchief over the hand which holds the egg showing by its outline beneath the silk that it has not been removed and meanwhile drawing out with the finger and thumb of the concealed hand the handkerchief hidden therein which is ready to be placed in the glass along with the egg under cover of the larger handkerchief the rest of the trick proceeds as already described save that in this instance the egg not being attached to the outer handkerchief it is necessary to clip it with the fingers through the handkerchief when the latter is removed to do this easily and efficiently it is well in placing the egg in the glass to place it with the opening upwards the edges of the opening giving a readier hold than the unbroken surface of the opposite side the hand box for vanishing a handkerchief while discussing the subject of handkerchief tricks we must not omit to mention the hand box a clever little contrivance for causing the disappearance of a handkerchief it consists of a little tin box of the size and shape of the heel of a gentleman's boot closed on all sides save that which answers to the front portion of the heel which is left open see figure one one five 
to one of its sides is riveted or soldiered a steel spring about an inch in length the free end of this spring forms with the side of the box a sort of clip by means of which the box can be attached as shown in the figure to the fleshy part of the hand the opening being towards the fingers being within the hand it is of course unseen by the audience the manner of its use is much the same as that of the hollowed egg described in the last trick save that the hand box is never exhibited as soon as the handkerchief is fairly worked in the left hand is closed as if containing it the effect being to the audience as if the handkerchief was merely rolled up and placed in the left hand on opening the hand the handkerchief is found to have disappeared the performer having meanwhile plenty of opportunity to drop the concealed handkerchief box and all into the pochette on his right hand side the hand box may be made available in a variety of ways as follows the performer having borrowed a handkerchief secretly changes it for a substitute which he leaves in full view on the table having made what disposition he pleases of the original he returns meanwhile placing the hand box in position and causing by its means the disappearance of the substitute orders the borrowed article to be found in such place as he may think proper End of section 28、section、29、of Modern Magic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Megan Clavey Parker Modern Magic A Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Tricks with Dominoes and Dice. Chapter 12 Tricks with Dominoes and Dice. To arrange a row of dominoes face downwards on the table, and on returning to the room, to turn up a domino whose points shall indicate how many have been moved in your absence. This is a capital drawing room feat. You place a row of twenty dominoes face downwards upon the table, avoiding as far as possible the appearance of any special arrangement, but nevertheless taking care that the points of the first domino, commencing from the left, shall amount to twelve, the points of the second to eleven, and so on, each decreasing by one point till you reach the thirteenth, which will be the double blank. The points of the remaining seven are a matter of indifference. You now propose to give the company a specimen of your powers of clairvoyance, and for that purpose leave the room, first requesting the company to remove during your absence any number of dominoes, not exceeding twelve, from the right to the left hand of the row, in other respects retaining their order. On your return, you advance to the table. And address the company to the following effect. Ladies and gentlemen, as I have already told you, I have the privilege of possessing the clairvoyant faculty, and I am about to give you a specimen of my powers. Now, it would seem at first sight sufficiently surprising that I should be able to merely tell you the number of dominoes which have been moved in my absence, but that might be easily effected by confederacy. Or many other very simple expedients. I propose to do much more than this, and to show you not only that I know the number that you have just displaced, but that I can read the dominoes before you as readily in their present position as though they were lying face upwards. For instance, this domino, touching one of the row with your finger or wand, represents the number which have been moved in my absence. Will some one please to say what that number was? The answer is we will suppose seven. Seven, you repeat, turning over the domino you have touched. You see that I was right. Would you like me to name some more? They are all equally easy. This, let me see, yes, this is a two. This is a nine. 
This is a double six. This is a double blank. Turning over each domino to show that you have named it right. This feat, which appears perfectly miraculous to the uninitiated, is performed by the simplest possible means. All that you have to do is to count secretly the row of dominoes as far as the thirteenth from the left-hand end, or, which is the same thing, the eighth from the right-hand end, the points of which will invariably be the same as the number moved from the right to the left of the row. You do not know, until the domino is turned up, what that number actually was, but you must by no means let the audience suspect this. You must boldly assume to know the number, and from that knowledge, aided by some clairvoyant faculty, to have selected a domino whose points shall represent that number. Thus, having selected the proper domino, you call upon the audience to state the number moved, after which the turning up of the selected domino is regarded by the audience merely as proof that you were correct in the previous knowledge for which they, without the smallest foundation, give you credit. After this domino has been turned up, it is easy, knowing the original order of the thirteen of which it forms one, to name two or three on either side of it. In most instances, you will only know the total figure of a given domino, as two or three different combinations of points will give the same total. Thus a total of seven may be represented by either six and one, five and two, or four and three. But there are two or three dominoes of which, if you know the total, you know the points also. Thus a total twelve must always be double six, a blank always double blank, a one always blank one. By naming two or three of these, as if haphazard, you will prevent the audience suspecting, as they otherwise might, that your knowledge is limited to the total of each domino. It is obvious that this is a trick which cannot be repeated, as the necessary rearrangement of the dominoes would at once attract attention. You may, however, volunteer to repeat it in a still more surprising form, really performing in its place the trick next following, one of the best, though also one of the simplest, in the whole range of the magic art. To allow any person in your absence to arrange the dominoes in a row, face downwards, and on your return to name, blindfolded or without entering the room, the end numbers of the row. You invite the audience to select any one of their number to arrange the whole of the dominoes face downwards upon the table. This he may do in any manner he pleases, the only restriction being that he is to arrange them after the fashion in, of the game of dominoes, so that a six shall be coupled with a six, and a four with a four, and so on. While he does this, you leave the room, and, on being recalled, you at once pronounce, either blindfold, or, if the audience prefer it, without even entering the room, that the extreme end numbers of the row are six and five, five and two, etc., as the case may be. This seeming marvel depends upon a very simple principle. It will be found by experiment that a complete set of dominoes, arranged in a row according to domino rules, i.e., like numbers together, will invariably have the same number at each end. Thus, if the final number at one end of the row be five, that at the opposite end will be five also, and so on, so that the twenty-eight dominoes arranged as above, from numerically an endless chain or circle. If this circle be broken by the removal of any domino, the numbers on either side of the gap thus made, will be the same as those of the missing domino. Thus, if you take away a 5-3, the chain thus broken will terminate at one end with a 5, and at the other with a 3. This is the whole secret of the trick. The performer secretly abstracts one domino, say the 5-3. This renders it a matter of certainty that the row to be formed with the remaining dominoes will terminate with a five at the one end, and a three at the other, and so on with any other domino of two unequal numbers. The domino abstracted must not be a double, or the trick will fail. A little consideration will show why this is the case. The removal of a double from the endless chain we have mentioned produces no break in the chain, 
as the numbers on each side of the gap, being alike, will coalesce, and a row formed with the remaining dominoes under such conditions may be made to terminate in any number, such number being, however, alike at either end. A domino of two different numbers, on the other hand, being removed, forces, so to speak, the series made with the remainder to terminate with those particular numbers. To change invisibly the numbers shown on either face of a pair of dice. Take a pair of ordinary dice, and so place them between the first finger and thumb of the right hand, see figure 116, that the uppermost shall show the 1, and the lowermost the 3 point, while the 1 point of the latter and the 3 point of the former are at right angles to those first named, and concealed by the ball of the thumb. The enlargement at A in the figure shows clearly the proper position. Ask someone to name aloud the points which are in sight, and to state particularly, for the information of the company, which point is uppermost. This, having been satisfactorily ascertained, you announce that you are able, by simply passing a finger over the faces of the dice, to make the points change places. So saying, gently rub the exposed faces of the dice with the forefinger of the left hand, and, on again removing the finger, the points are found to have changed places, the three being now uppermost, and the one undermost. This effect is produced by a slight movement of the thumb and finger of the right hand in the act of bringing the hands together, the thumb being moved slightly forward and the finger slightly back. This causes the two dice to make a quarter turn vertically on their own axis, bringing into view the side which has hitherto been concealed by the ball of the thumb, while the side previously in sight is in turn hidden by the middle finger. A reverse movement, of course, places the dice in their original position. The action of bringing the hands together, for the supposed purpose of rubbing the dice with the opposite forefinger, completely covers the smaller movement of the thumb and finger. After having exhibited the trick in this form once or twice, you may vary your mode of operation. For this purpose, take the dice still retaining the relative position, horizontally between the thumb and second finger, in the manner depicted in figure 117, showing 3-1 on their upper face, the corresponding 3-1, or rather 1-3, being now covered by the forefinger. As the points on the opposite faces of a die invariably together amount to 7, it is obvious that the points on the underside will now be 4-6, while the points next to the ball of the thumb will be 6-4. You show, alternately raising and lowering the hand, that the points above are 3-1, and those below 6-4. Again going through the motion of rubbing the dice with the opposite forefinger, you slightly raise the thumb and depress the middle finger, which will bring the 6-4 uppermost and the 3-1, or 1-3, undermost. This may be repeated any number of times, or you may, by moving the thumb and finger accordingly, produce either a 3-1 or 6-4, apparently both above and below the dice. The trick may, of course, be varied as regards the particular points, but the dice must, in any case, be so placed to have similar points on two adjoining faces. To name, without seeing them, the points of a pair of dice. This is a more arithmetical recreation, but it is so good that we cannot forbear to notice it. You ask the person who threw the dice to choose which of them he likes, multiply its points by two, add five to the product, multiply the sum so obtained by five, and add the points of the remaining die. On his telling you the result, you mentally subtract 25 from it, when the remainder will be a number of two figures, each representing the points of one of the dice. Thus, suppose the throws to be 5, 2. 5 multiplied by 2 are 10, 
add 5, 15, which, multiplied by 5, is 75, to which 2, the points of the remaining die, being added, the total is 77. If from this you mentally deduct 25, the remainder is 52, giving the points of the two dice, 5 and 2. But, you will say, suppose the person who threw had reversed the arithmetical process, and had taken the points of the second die, 2, as his multiplicand, the result must have been different. Let us try the experiment. Twice 2 are 4. 5 added make 9, which multiplied by 5 is 45, and 5, the points of the other die being added to it, bring the total up to 50. From this subtract 25 as before. The remainder, 25, again gives the points of the two dice, but in the reverse order, and the same result will follow, whatever the throws may be. End of section 29「Section 30 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April Walters. Modern Magic, a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman. The Cup and Balls, Part 1. The subject of the present chapter may be said to be the groundwork of all ledger domain being, we believe, the very earliest form in which sleight of hand was exhibited. At the present day it is not very often seen, save in the bastard form known as thimble rig, and used as a means of fleecing the unwary upon race courses and at country fairs. It is, however, well worthy the attention of the student of modern magic, not only as affording an excellent course of training in digital dexterity, but as being, in the hands of an adept, most striking in effect. It is by no means uncommon to find spectators who have received more elaborate feats with comparative indifference become interested and even enthusiastic over a brilliant manipulation of the cups and balls. The prestige of the illusion is heightened by the simplicity of the appliances used, consisting merely of three tin cups about three inches high, each in the form of a truncated cone with a rim or shoulder round the base. See figure 118. The ordinary wand four little cork balls three-quarters of an inch or a little less in diameter and blackened in the flame of a candle, three larger balls of about an inch and a quarter in diameter, and four more of such a size as to just fill the goblet. These last are generally stuffed with hair and covered with cloth. The number of balls may vary according to the particular passes which the performer desires to exhibit, but the above will be found sufficient for most purposes. The performers of the olden time were accustomed to use the gibissier, or apron with pockets already mentioned, and to perform at a table having no speciality, see that it was a little higher than those in ordinary use. But at the present day, the glissier is entirely discarded, their servant of the tables answering the same purpose. The arrangement of the table and apparatus is shown in figure 118. The whole art of the cup and ball conjuring resolves itself into two elements. One, the exhibition of a ball under a cup, where a moment previously there was nothing, and two, the disappearance of a ball from beneath a cup under which the audience has just seen it, or believe they have seen it, placed. The routine is as follows. A cup is lifted to show that there is nothing beneath it and again replaced, mouth downward, on the table. A ball is taken in the right hand, transferred to the left, and thence ordered to pass under the cup. The hand is opened, the ball is vanished, and, on the cup being lifted, is found beneath it. Again, the ball first exhibited in the right hand is thence openly transferred, either directly under the cup or first to the left hand and thence to the cup. All having seen it placed beneath the cup, it is now commanded to depart, and on again lifting the cup, it is found to have vanished. It will hardly be believed until proved by experiment of what numerous and surprising combinations these simple elements are capable. The sleight of hand requisite for the cups and balls is technically divisible into four different acts or movements, that is, one, to palm the ball, two, to reproduce the palmed ball at the end of the fingers, three, to secretly introduce the palmed ball under the cup, four, to simulate the action of placing the ball under the cup. These modes of affecting these objects will be discussed in due order. 
1. To palm the ball. First method. We use the generic term palm for the sake of convenience, though in this first method, which is that most generally used, the ball is really concealed between the second and third fingers and not in the palm. Take the ball between the first finger and thumb of the right hand, slightly bend the fingers, see figure 119, and at the same moment roll the ball with the thumb across the first and second fingers, till it rests between the second and third fingers, see figure 120, which should slightly separate to receive it, again closing as soon as it is safely lodged. The ball will now be as shown in figure 121, and will be found that the hand can be opened or closed with perfect freedom, and indeed be used in any manner without being in the least hampered by its presence. The student should practice palming the ball in this manner, both in the act of apparently transferring the ball to the left hand, and in that of apparently placing it under a cup. Second method. The second method is to actually palm the ball in the same manner as a coin. For this purpose, the ball is, as before, taken between the first finger and thumb of the right hand, but is thence made by the thumb to roll between the tips of the third and fourth fingers, which immediately close into the palm, and again opening, leave the ball behind them. With a little practice, two balls in succession may be palmed in this way, and then a third by the first method. Third method. The third method is that which has been adopted by the celebrated Bosco, a most accomplished performer with the cup and balls. Being accustomed to use balls of a larger size than those above described, and therefore too bulky to palm by the first method, he used to hold them by means of a slight contraction of the little finger. See figure 122. The necessary movement of the fingers to place the ball in position is nearly the same as by the first method. To reproduce the palmed ball at the end of the fingers. The mode of doing this will vary according to the method by which the ball is palmed. If, according to the first or third method, the ball is simply rolled back to the fingertips with the ball of the thumb exactly reversing the process by which it was palmed. But if the ball was palmed by the second method, it is, for the time being, not get at a ball by the ball of the thumb. In this case, the first step is to close the third and fourth fingers upon the ball, see figure 123, and therewith roll it to the position shown in figure 122 when the thumb is enabled to reach it, and to roll to the fingertips in the manner just described. 3. To in secretly introduce the palmed ball under the cup. This is always done in the act of raising the cup with the right hand for the ostensible purpose of showing that there is nothing underneath it. The chief thing to be attended to is the position of the right hand, in which we are supposing a ball to be palmed by one or other of the methods above mentioned, in raising the cup. This should be done with the hand spread almost flat upon the table and grasping the cup as low down as possible between the thumb and the lowest joint of the forefinger. In the act of raising the cup, the fingers naturally assume the position shown in figure 124, whereby the ball is brought into close proximity to and slightly under the edge of the cup. If the ball be palmed by the first method, all that is necessary in order to release it is a slight backward movement of the second and a forward movement of the third finger, made just before the cup again touches the table. This will be found to drop the ball immediately under the cup. If the ball be palmed by the third method, its introduction under the cup is a still easier matter, as by the act of raising the cup it is brought directly underneath it, and is released by the mere act of straightening the third and fourth fingers. If the ball is palmed by the second method, it becomes necessary, before taking hold of the cup, to close the third and fourth fingers slightly, see figure 123, and bring the ball to the position shown in figure 122. From this point, the operation is the same as if the ball had been originally palmed by the third method. It is sometimes necessary to introduce a ball between two cups. It will be remembered that each cup is made of a cylindrical rim or shoulder. The purpose of this shoulder is that, when two cups are placed upon the other, see figure 125, there may be a space between them sufficient to receive a ball or balls. To further facilitate the introduction of the ball, the top of each cup is made not flat, but concave. When it is desired to introduce a ball between two cups, that object is effected as follows. Having the ball ready palmed in the right hand, the performer takes up a cup in the same hand and with it covers the second cup at the same moment, introducing the ball beneath it in the ordinary manner but with the addition of a little upward jerk. Rather difficult to describe, but easily acquired with a little practice. 
the ball is thereby thrown to the top of the uppermost cup and in again falling is received by the concave top of the lowermost cup four to simulate the action of placing a ball under a cup this may be done in two ways the first is to raise the cup with the left hand apparently placing the ball underneath it with the right but really palming it care must be taken that the edge of the cup shall touch the table at the very moment the fingers of the right hand are removed the second and more common method is to apparently transfer the ball to the left hand palming it in transit and then bringing the closed left hand close to the cup on the table raising the cup with the other hand and immediately replacing it with a sort of scraping movement across the fingers of the now opening left hand when the student has thoroughly mastered the various operations above described he will have little to learn save the combination of the various passes a matter of memory only there are however one or two subordinate slights with which he should make himself acquainted before proceeding to publicly exhibit his dexterity to produce a ball from the wand the wand is supposed to be the reservoir whence the magician produces his store of balls and into which they vanish when no longer needed the mode of production is as follows the performer holding the wand in his left hand and drawing attention to it by some remark as to its mysterious power of production and absorption secretly takes with his right hand from the servante or elsewhere a ball which he immediately palms preferably by the first method faintly holding the wand by either end with the left hand in such manner as to show that the hand is otherwise empty he slides the thumb and fingers of the right hand the back of which is naturally toward the audience lightly to the opposite end at the same moment rolling the ball with the thumb to the ends of the fingers as already described see figure one twenty six the ball thus comes in sight just as the hand leaves the wand the effect to the eyes of the spectator being that the ball is by some mysterious process squeezed out of the wand to return a ball into the wand this is the converse of the process last described taking the wand in the left hand as before and the ball between the thumb and second joint of the forefinger of the opposite hand the performer lays the end of the wand across the tips of the fingers and draws the hand gently downward along it at the same time palming the ball by the first method to pass one cup through another this is an effective sleight and by no means difficult of acquirement taking one of the cups mouth upward in the left hand and holding another in a similar position in the right hand about a foot above it the performer drops the right hand cup smartly into that in the left hand which latter should be held very lightly if this is neatly done the lower cup will be knocked out of the hand by the concussion while the upper one will be caught and held in its place the effect to the eye of the spectator being as if the upper cup had passed through the other the lower cup may either be allowed to fall on the ground or table or may be caught in the right hand in its fall the successive appearances and disappearances of the balls underneath the cups are known by the name of passes the particular combination of such passes being governed by the taste and invention of the performer the series most generally in use is derived from a work dating from the last century the recreations mathematiques et physiques of goyot and goyot we believe borrowed it from a german source the series given below which will be found very effective is derived mainly from that of goyot as improved by Ponsin, a later and very ingenious writer on the art of prestidigitation the cups and balls require even more than conjuring generally a running accompaniment of talk each pass should have its own boniment or patter carefully prepared and frequently rehearsed it would be impossible to give within any reasonable limits appropriate patter for each of the passes this each performer must arrange for himself so as to suit the style and character in which he performs as it is obvious that the low comedy style of a mountebank at the county fair would be utterly unsuitable in an aristocratic drawing room and vice versa we shall however give a specimen or two in the course of the various passes the burlesque introduction next following is a paraphrase of a similar address quoted by robert houdin introductory address ladies and gentlemen in an age so enlightened as our own it really is surprising to see how many popular fallacies spring up from day to day and are accepted by the public mind as the unchangeable laws of nature among these fallacies there is one which i propose at once to point out to you and which i flatter myself i shall very easily dispose of 
many people have asserted and among others the celebrated erasmus of rotterdam that a material object can be in only one place at one time now i maintain on the contrary that any object may be in several places at the same moment and it is equally possible that it be nowhere at all i must beg you to observe in the first place that i have nothing in my hands except my fingers and that between my fingers there is nothing save a few atoms of the mysterious fluid which we call the atmosphere and through which our jolly old earth spins so merrily along but we must leave the commonplace regions of astronomy and return to the mysteries of hermetic science i have before me as you will have noticed three little cups or goblets the metal of which these are composed is an amalgam of costly minerals unknown even to the most profound philosophers this mysterious composition which resembles silver in its solidity its color and the clearness of its ring has over silver this great advantage that it will at pleasure become impalpable as air so that solid bodies pass through these goblets as easily as they would through empty space i will give you a curious illustration of this by making one goblet pass through another this the performer does in the manner already described and after a moment's pause continues taking up his wand in his left hand and secretly palming a ball in his right this little wand you are possibly aware ladies and gentlemen goes by the name of jacob's rod why it is so called i really don't know i only know that this simple looking wand has a faculty of producing various articles at pleasure for instance i require for the purpose of my experiment a little ball my wand at once supplies me he produces a ball from the wand and lays it on the table with this or some similar introduction the performer proceeds to exhibit pass one having placed a ball under the each cup to draw it out again without lifting the cup having produced a ball from the wand as last described and having laid it on the table the operator continues allow me to show you once more that all the cups are empty he raises them one by one and replaces them and that i have nothing in either of my hands i take this little ball he picks it up with his right hand and apparently transfers it to the left really palming it in the right and place it under one of the cups here he raises the cup with his right hand and simulates the action of placing the ball under it with the left i draw another ball from my wand this is really the same ball which remained palmed in the right hand and place it in a like manner under the second cup he goes through the motion of transferring to the left hand and thence the cup as before but this time actually does what on the former occasion he only pretended to do and leaves the ball under the middle cup i produce another ball he half draws the wand through his fingers but checks himself halfway i think i heard one of you assert i have a ball already in my hand pray satisfy yourselves showing the palms of his hands the fingers carelessly apart that such is not the case a lady suggested just now by the way it was only said in a whisper but i heard it i didn't really put the balls under the cup it was rather sharp on the part of the lady but you see she was wrong here are the balls footnote the reader will understand that nobody has in fact made any such observation but the overhearing of an imaginary objection is often of great use as enabling the performer to do some necessary act which he could not well have done without such pretext thus in this instance the performer wants a plausible excuse first for altering his apparent intention of immediately producing a second ball from the wand and secondly for lifting the middle cup and so regaining possession of the ball a conjurer thus addressing an imaginary objector is said in french parler la potionade but the phrasing has no precise equivalent among english performers End footnote so saying the performer lifts up the middle cup with his left hand and picking up the ball with his right holds it up that all may see immediately replacing it under the same cup the last movement is simulated only the ball being in reality palmed in the supposed act of placing it under the cup we have now a ball under each of these two cups we want only one more and here it is apparently producing a third ball but really the same again from the wand we will now place it under this last cup he actually does so now ladies and gentlemen we have three cups and three balls one under each cup so far i admit that i have not shown you anything very surprising but now comes the puzzle 
to take the balls from under the cups. Perhaps some of you sharp gentlemen will say there isn't much difficulty in that. Lift the cup and pick up the ball. He suits the action to the word, lifting up the third goblet with the left hand and picking up the ball with the right. A very good solution, but it doesn't happen to be the right one. The problem is to draw out the balls without lifting the cups. Here, he replaces the cup, apparently placing the little ball beneath it, but really palming it as already described in the case of the middle cup, and then returns to the first or furthest cup, touching the top of the goblet. He lets the palmed ball drop to his fingertips and immediately exhibits it, saying, This is the way I take balls out of the cups. The ball being no longer needed, I return it into the wand. This he does as described at page 277, immediately afterwards, if desired, handing the wand for examination. In like manner I draw out the second ball, and he repeats the same process with the middle goblet, and pass that also into my wand. I need not even handle the goblets. See, I merely touch this third goblet with my wand, and the ball instantly appears on the top. The company, of course, cannot see any ball on the end of the wand, but a ball nevertheless is taken thence by the process already described, and letting go of the palmed ball to drop to the tip of the fingers as they come in contact with the wand. I pass this also into my wand. Stay, though on second thoughts, I shall want a ball for my next experiment, so I will leave it here on the table. We have given a somewhat elaborate description of this first pass in order to give the reader some idea of the various feints and artifices employed in relation to the cups and balls. It would be impossible, from considerations of space, to do as this for each of the passes, and the reader must therefore remember the descriptions following give merely the essential outlines, which must be worked up to dramatic effectiveness by the ingenuity of the individual performer. Where practicable, we shall allow the few words put into mouth of giving the performer to indicate the actions accompanying them only giving special stage directions in cases where the performer does not suit the action to the words. For the sake of distinctness, we shall indicate the goblets, reckoning from the left hand of the performer, as A, B, and C. See figure 118. Pass 2. To make a ball travel invisibly from cup to cup. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you watch very closely, you will be able to see the ball travel from one cup to another. I take the ball transfers it apparently to the left hand, and place it under this cup, C. You all see that there's nothing under this one, B. In raising B with the right hand, he introduces under it the palmed ball. I shall now command the ball, which I have just placed under the first cup, C, to travel under this one, B. Attention! You will see it pass. He makes a motion of the wand from one cup to the other. There it goes! This cup, C as you see is empty, and under this one, B, is the ball. I will replace it under the same cup, B. He, in reality, palms it. There is nothing under this cup, A. He secretly introduces the ball under A. Now observe again, pass, did you see it? No, well, I don't much wonder at it, for I can't always see it myself. Here it is, however, lifts A, and this cup, B, is empty. He replaces the cups on the table and lays the ball beside them. End of section 30. Recording by April Walters. Section 31 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April Walters. Modern Magic, a practical treatise on the art of conjuring, by Professor Lewis Hoffman. The Cups and Balls, Part 2. Pass 3. Having placed a ball under each of the end cups, to make them pass successively under the middle cup. Before commencing this pass, the performer, while placing the goblets in line or otherwise engaging the attention of the audience with his left hand, takes from the servant with his right, and palms a second ball. He continues, For my next experiment, ladies and gentlemen, I shall require two balls. I need hardly remark that I could instantly supply myself from the wand, but there's a curious faculty about the balls themselves. They have a constant tendency to increase and multiply. For instance, without having recourse to the wand, I can instantly make this one ball into two. 
he takes up the ball on the table in his left hand, taking care to hold it that all may see that there is nothing else in his hand. And the most curious part of the matter is that, though mathematicians insist that the whole is always greater than its part, in this case, each of the parts will be found precisely equal to the whole. As he speaks, he takes the ball from his, the left hand with the fingers of the right, at the same time dropping the palmed ball into the left hand, and now taking care to so hold his right hand as to show that it contains the one ball only. He then again replaces this ball in the palm of the left hand, where it lies side by side with the second ball, rubbing the left palm with the second and third fingers of the right with a circular motion he gradually lifts the fingers and shows the single ball apparently transformed into two, both of which he places on the table. You will observe that there is nothing under this cup. See, I will place it under this ball. He really palms it. Neither is there anything under either of these two cups, B and A. He lifts the cups, one with each hand, and secretly introduces the palmed ball under B. I take this second ball and place it under this cup, A. He really palms it. We now have a ball under each of these two cups, A and C. I draw the ball out of this one, C. He touches the top of the cup and produces the ball last palmed at his fingertips. I order it to pass under this middle cup, B. He apparently transfers it to the left hand, really palming it, and then makes a motion with the left hand as if passing it into B. It has passed, you see. He raises B with his right hand, showing the ball under it, and in replacing it secretly introduces the second palmed ball. Now I order the ball in this cup, A, to pass in like manner. He waves his wand from A to B, and then lifts B. Here it is, and these two outer cups, turning them over with his wand, are perfectly empty. Pass 4. Having placed two balls under the middle cup, to make them pass under the two outer ones. You have just seen these two balls pass under the middle cup. Now, by way of variety, we will make them pass out of it. I will take the two balls and place them under the middle cup. He really so places one only, palming the other. You observe that there is nothing either under this, A, nor under this, C. Here he secretly introduces the palmed ball beneath C. Now I order one of the balls under the middle cup to pass under one of the outer cups. Let us see if it has done so. Lifts middle cup with left hand. Yes, see here, only one left. He takes it up and shows it with his right hand, then makes the gesture of replacing it, but really palms it. Let's see where it has gone to. Lifts A with right hand, and in replacing it, secretly introduces the palmed ball under it. It is not under this one, then it must be under this. He lifts C. Yes, here it is. Now I command the other ball in like manner to leave the middle cup and pass under the other. A. Pass. Here it is, you see. And this one, B, is entirely empty. Pass 5. To pass three balls in succession under one cup. So far, ladies and gentlemen, what I have shown you has been mere child's play. He drops the right hand carelessly to the Cervante and picks up two more balls, one of which he holds between the fingers and the other in the palm. The real difficulty only begins when we begin to work with three balls. Now which of these two balls, taking up the two balls from the table, is the largest? This one I fancy has the advantage, so I will pinch a little piece off to make a third ball. He goes through the motion of pinching the ball with the fingers of both hands, at the same moment letting fall the ball in the palm to the fingertips of the right hand. Yes, this will do. It isn't quite round, but that is easily rectified. He rolls it between the fingers. That is better. Now watch me closely, ladies and gentlemen. He places the balls upon the table, with the exception of the fourth, which remains concealed between the fingers. You see that there is nothing under either of the cups. He raises all three and introduces the fourth ball under the middle one, B. He then picks up one of the balls on the table and apparently transfers it to his left hand, really palming it. I command this ball to pass into the middle cup. It has passed, you see. Raising the cup with his right hand, and in replacing it, introducing the ball now palmed. The operation is repeated in like manner, until three balls have been shown under the cup, the fourth finally remaining palmed in his right hand. Pass 6. 
so place three balls one after the other upon the top of one of the cups and to make them fall through the cup onto the table at the conclusion of the last pass the performer had brought three balls under the center cup b a fourth remaining concealed in his hand in lifting b to exhibit the three balls and in replacing it beside them he takes the opportunity of introducing beneath it this fourth ball he next takes one of the three balls thus exposed and placing it on top of this same goblet b covering it with the second goblet a making any appropriate gesture he pleases he commands the ball to fall through the lower goblet onto the table he then overturns without separating the two goblets their mouths being toward the spectators when the ball which he had secretly introduced will be discovered and will appear to be that which the spectators have just seen placed on top of the goblet and which really still remains between the two goblets and picks up the two goblets together mouth upward with his left hand and with the right hand takes out that which is now uppermost b he turns both the goblets down upon the table placing a over the ball which he has just shown if this is neatly done the other ball which has remained in a will not be discovered but will as it falls be covered by a which will now have beneath it two balls the performer now places one of the remaining balls on top of a covering it with either of the other goblets and again goes through the same process till he has shown the first two and then three balls under the cup the fourth remaining at the close of the pass between the two cups last used pass seven to pass three balls in succession upward through the table into one of the cups you concluded the last pass we will suppose the reader to represent for the time being the performer by lifting two cups together to show three balls beneath the undermost holding two cups in the left hand you turn them over mouth upward taking with the right hand that which is now uppermost you place it on the table in the ordinary position still retaining the other in which unknown to the spectators a fourth ball still remains you continue ladies and gentlemen you may possibly imagine that there is some trick or sleight of hand in what i have shown you but i am now about to perform an experiment in which that solution is clearly inadmissible i propose to pass these three balls one after the other through the solid table into this empty goblet pray watch me carefully i take away one of the balls you take in the right hand one of the three on the table and hold it beneath the table thus my left hand as you will observe is perfectly empty i have only to say pass you palm the ball in the right hand at the same time giving a gentle tap with one finger against the under surface of the table and immediately bring up the hand taking care of course to keep its outer side toward the spectators then gently shake the cup which you hold in your left hand and turn the ball out upon the table here it is you see now i will put it back in the cup you pick up the ball with the right hand and drop it into the cup secretly letting fall with it the palmed ball and take another ball you repeat the process show two balls in the cup and then again each time dropping in the palmed ball and show three retaining the fourth ball still palmed in your right hand pass eight to pass two balls in succession from one cup to another without touching them you again place the three cups in a row on the table secretly introducing under the right hand cup c the ball which remained in your right hand at the close of the last pass and then openly place the other three balls on the tops of the three cups you then proceed i will take this ball that which is on b and place it under this same cup b you really palm it i take this other ball that which is upon a and place it under this cup a you secretly introduce with it the ball which you have just palmed i take this last that upon c and place it under this goblet a or stay i will pass it invisibly to this one c really palming it it has passed you see you lift c and show the ball which is already there and in again covering the ball with the cup you secretly introduce that which you last palmed you now have in reality two balls under each of the end cups and none under the center one but the spectators are persuaded that there is one ball under each cup 
we now have one ball under each cup now i shall command the ball that is under the center cup to pass into either of the end ones at your pleasure which shall it be whichever is chosen suppose c you raise and show the two balls under it you then ostensibly replace the two balls under c but really replace the one only palming the other you then raise the middle cup b to show that it is empty and in replacing it introduce the ball you have just palmed under it now i shall next order one of the two balls you have just seen under this cup c to go and join the one which is already under this one a pass here it is you observe you raise a to show that there are two balls under it you also raise c to show that it now only contains one ball and leave all three balls exposed on the table pass nine to make three balls in succession pass under the middle cup at the conclusion of the last pass three balls were left in view while a fourth unknown to the audience was hidden under the middle cup you proceed picking up a ball with the right hand i take this ball and place it under this cup c in reality palming it i now order it to pass under the middle cup presto here it is you see you raise the middle cup to show that the ball has obeyed your command and in again covering the ball secretly introduce with it that which you have just palmed i take this one you pick up another and place it under this cup a here you palm it as before and order it also to pass under the middle cup you raise the middle cup and show that there are now two balls under it and in again covering them introduce the ball which you last palmed i take this last ball and place it under this cup c palming it whence i shall command it to again depart and join its companions under the middle cup this time it shall make it the journey visibly you take your wand in the left hand and with it touch the cup c here it is you see on the end of my wand you don't see it why surely it is visible enough look you pretend to produce the palmed ball from the wand and exhibit it to the company you can all see it now you lay down the wand and go through the motion of transferring the ball to the left hand really palming it in its passage now then pray watch me closely and you will see it pass under the cup one two three you make the gesture of throwing it through the middle cup and open the hand to show it empty immediately turning over the goblets to show that there are three balls under the middle and none under the outer ones pass ten the multiplication pass for the purpose of this pass it is necessary to borrow a hat which you hold in the left hand you then place the three balls in a row upon the table and cover each with one of the cups it will be remembered that a fourth ball remains palmed in your right hand you now lift up the right hand goblet c and place it on the table close beside the ball which it lately covered and as you do so secretly introduce beneath it the palmed ball you pick up with the right hand the ball which you have thus uncovered and go through the motion of dropping it into the hat really palming it in the moment during which the hand is concealed inside the hat and at the same moment simulating by a gentle tap against the inside the sound which the ball would make if actually dropped into the hat you next lift b in like manner introducing the ball just palmed beneath it and go through the motion of placing the second ball which is thereby left exposed in the hat you do the same with the third cup then return to the first which the spectators believe to now be empty and from which they are astonished to see you produce another ball continuing till you have raised each cup in succession eight or ten times and on each occasion of lifting a cup to uncover a ball introducing beneath it the ball which you had just previously palmed to the eyes of the spectators who believe that the balls are really dropped into the hat the effect will be exactly as if new balls by some mysterious process of reproduction came under the cups at each time of raising them when you think your audience are sufficiently astonished you remark i think we have about enough now the hat's just getting rather heavy will someone hold a handkerchief to receive the balls when the handkerchief is spread out you carefully turn over the hat and the general astonishment will be intensified at discovering that it contains nothing there is of course a ball left under each of the cups and a fourth palmed in your right hand 
this letter will not again be wanted and you should therefore while attention is drawn to the hat drop it upon the servante or into one of your pochettes pass eleven to transform the small balls to larger ones while the attention of the spectators is still occupied by the unexpected denouement of the last pass you should prepare for this one by secretly taking with your right hand from the servante and palming by either the second or third method the first being only available for the small balls one of the larger balls you then address the spectators to the following effect ladies and gentlemen you see that i have little difficulty in increasing the number of balls to an unlimited extent i will now repeat the experiment in another form and show you that it is equally easy to make them increase in size you will observe that notwithstanding the number of balls which i have just produced from the cups there are still plenty more to come. Here you raise C and show that there is a ball still under it. You replace it on the table at a few inches distance and, as you do so, secretly introduce under it the larger ball, which you have just palmed. Taking up the small ball in your right hand, you say, To make the experiment still more surprising, I will pass the ball upward through the table into the cup. So saying, you place the right hand under the table dropping as you do so the little ball which you hold on the servante and taking in its place another of the larger balls pass you exclaim and at the same time giving a gentle rap on the under surface of the table you bring the hand up again as if empty you do not touch the first cup but repeat the operation with the second b and again with a on each occasion passing the hand under the table exchanging a small ball for a larger one and immediately afterward introducing the latter under the cup next in order. The last time, however, you merely drop the small ball on the servante without bringing up any other in exchange. You have now, unknown to the audience, one of the larger or medium-sized balls under each of the cups. And if you're about to end with this pass, you would merely lift the cups and show the balls, thus apparently increased in size underneath. We will assume, however, that you propose to exhibit the pass next following, one of the most effective, in which case the necessary preparation must be made in the act of raising the cups, and we shall therefore proceed at once, while the balls still remain covered, to describe Pass 12, to again transform the balls to still larger ones. The last pass, having reached the stage we have just described, that is, a large ball being under each cup, but not yet exhibited to the audience, you secretly take in your left hand from the servante one of the still larger balls. These balls should be soft and elastic, and of such a size that, if pressed lightly into the cup, they shall require a slight tap of the cup on the table to dislodge them. Having taken the ball in the left hand, you hold it at the ends of the fingers behind the table, as near the top as possible consistently with its being out of sight of the spectators. Then saying, Now, ladies and gentlemen, I must ask for your very closest attention. You raise C with the right hand, and with the same movement lower it for a moment behind the table and over the ball in the left hand, which remains in the cup of its own accord. All eyes go instinctively to the ball on the table, whose increased size is a new phenomenon. Not one in a hundred will, in this first moment of surprise, think of watching the cup which is naturally supposed to have, for the moment, concluded its share of the trick. You then replace the cup on the table, lightly, so as to not loosen the ball, meanwhile getting ready another ball in the left hand, and repeat the operation with B. With A, you make a slight variation in your mode of procedure. Taking a third ball in your left hand, you hold it as before, but, as if through carelessness or clumsiness, allow it to be seen for a moment above the edge of the table. When you raise the third cup, you move it behind the table as before and make a feint of introducing the ball which the spectators have just seen, but really let it drop on the servante and replace the cup empty. A murmur from the audience will quickly apprise you that they have, as they imagine, found you out. Looking as innocent as you can, you inquire what is the matter and are informed that you are seen to introduce a ball into the cup. I beg your pardon, you reply, Lifting up, however, not A, which you have just replaced, but C, which is the farthest remote from it. There really is a ball in this cup, but having been pressed in and fitting tightly, it does not fall. The audience, seeing you raise the wrong cup, 
are more and more confirmed in their suspicion. Not that one, the other, they exclaim. You next raise B, the ball in which also does not fall, for the reason already stated. No, no, the audience shout, the other cup, the end one. You really are very obstinate, gentlemen, you reply, but pray satisfy yourselves, turning over A as you speak, and showing the inside, which is manifestly empty, and your critics rapidly subside. Meanwhile, you drop your left hand to the servante, and secretly take from it two similar balls. Then addressing the audience, you say, Surely, gentlemen, you don't imagine that if I wanted to place a ball under a cup, I should set about it in such a clumsy fashion as this. As you say this, you place your left hand in your left pocket, as if taking a ball from thence. As it obviously would not do to give the audience cause to suspect the existence of a secret receptacle behind the table. And bring out again the two balls, but only allow one to be seen, keeping the other concealed in the palm. Bringing the cup over the hand, you squeeze in both balls as far as you can, when the innermost will remain, but the outermost, not having sufficient space, will drop out again on the table. The audience, not knowing that there are two balls, believe the cup, which you now replace on the table, to be empty. You continue, No, gentlemen, when I pass a ball under the cup, you may be sure that I don't let anybody see me do so. As you speak, you take the ball on the table in your right hand and make the movement of transferring it to your left, really palming it by the second method, and holding the left hand closed and high, as if containing it, and keeping your eyes fixed thereon, you carelessly drop your right hand till the fingertips rest on the table, when you are able to let fall the ball upon the servante. You continue, I will now pass this ball under either of the cups which you like to name. Indeed, I will do more. I will cause this ball invisibly to multiply itself into three, one of which shall pass under each of the cups. First, however, let me show you that there is nothing under the cups at present. You raise each in turn. Nothing here, nothing here, and nothing here. The balls still adhere to the sides of the cups, which therefore appear to be empty. But you replace each with a slight rap on the table, and thereby loosen the ball within it. Now then! You bring the two hands together and gently rub them over each cup in turn, finally parting them and showing that both are empty, and then lifting the cups to show the three large balls underneath. Some performers, in lifting each cup with the right hand, introduce a fresh ball held in the left, as already explained. The effect is the same as in the multiplication pass already described, with this difference, that on each occasion of uncovering a ball, the ball remains on the table, which thus becomes gradually covered with an ever-increasing number of balls. Some, again, conclude this apparently producing from the cups apples much larger than they could naturally contain, e.g. large apples, Spanish onions, etc. This is effected in the same manner as the introduction of the large balls just described, save that in this case the object, which cannot really go into the cup, is merely held against its mouth with the third finger of the right hand and dropped with a slight shake as if there was a difficulty in getting it out. There are many other cup and ball passes, but the series above given will be found as effective as any. If any reader desires to follow the subject further, we would refer him to Recreations Mathématiques et Physiques of Goyot, already quoted, or another old work, under the same title, by Ozanam, in which this branch of prestidigitation is treated at considerable length. End of section 31. Recording by April Walters. Section 32 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shelley Stephen. Farmington Hills, Michigan. ShelleyStephen.com. Modern Magic, a Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring, by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Section 32 Chapter 14 Ball Tricks Requiring Special Apparatus Before proceeding to the description of the tricks which form the subject of this chapter, it may be well to mention one or two principles of sleight of hand, not yet noticed, which have a special application to ball tricks, 
and are also useful with regard to oranges, apples, eggs, etc. The pass called the tourniquet or French drop, described already in relation to coin, will be found equally applicable to balls up to a couple of inches in diameter, but is not available for objects of larger size. Balls of larger diameter are best palmed by one or other of the methods following. First method. Taking the ball in either hand, the performer tosses the ball from palm to palm at a few inches distance, four or five times, finally making the motion of tossing it from the right hand to the left, but really retaining it in the right by a slight contraction of the palm, and at the same time closing and elevating the left hand and following it with the eyes as though it contained the ball. It is obvious that a ball of this size now under consideration, say of two to three inches in diameter, would not admit of the hand containing it being perfectly closed. And this must be borne in mind in the position of the left hand, the fingers of which must not be tightly closed as they would if apparently containing a coin or other very small article, but merely curved inward, the palm of course being turned toward the performer's own body so as not to disclose the secret of its emptiness. Where the hand of the performer is small, or the ball is of such a size as not to be readily retained in the right hand by the contraction of the palm, the thumb may be used to assist in supporting it. Second method. Taking the ball between his open hands, the performer rolls it round and round between his palms as though it were a lump of clay which he was molding into a spherical form, and in doing so, gradually turns his hands until the back of his right hand is undermost when, with an inward movement of that hand towards himself, he palms the ball therein and at the same time closing and elevating the left hand as described for the last method. To vanish a large ball with the aid of the table. First method. Standing behind his table, the ball being some six or eight inches from its hinder edge, the performer places both hands round it apparently picking it up and bringing it forward between his two hands, from which, however, the ball is, on examination, found to have vanished. Its disappearance is effected as follows. At the moment when the performer encircles the ball with his hands, he gives, with the little finger of the hand which is innermost, and therefore unseen by the audience, a quick jerk to the ball, which is thereby made to roll towards the hinder edge of the table and drop upon the servant, on which there should be a padded box or basket to receive it. The action is wholly concealed from the spectators by the hands, which, with the exception of the finger which does the work, should remain motionless. Second method. Standing behind his table, as in the last case, the performer tosses up the ball and catches it again three or four times, keeping the hands low so as to be near the edge of the table. The hands naturally sink in the act of catching the ball, and after having caught it once or twice, the performer, as he lowers them, drops it on the servant, immediately raising them again with the action of throwing up the ball, taking care to follow it with the eyes in its imaginary flight. If this is done neatly, the eyes of the spectators will instinctively travel in the same direction, and the effect to them will be as if the ball vanished at its highest point of its upward flight, instead of disappearing as it really does at the moment of reaching the hands in its fall. This method may also be employed for objects other than of spherical shape. Third method. The performer, standing behind his table as before, and placing the ball thereon, covers it with the right hand, and rolls it round and round in circles, each time bringing it nearer and nearer to the hinder edge of the table till it finally rolls over and drops upon the servant. He continues the motion of the hand for two or three turns as though the ball were still under it, gradually working back towards the center of the table, the effect to the spectator being as if the ball melted away under the operator's fingers. Fourth method. This is generally employed to apparently pass one object into another, say, a small ball into a large one. The performer, standing a little behind his table, with his right side slightly turned to the spectators, takes in his right hand the small ball and in his left the large one. 
the latter he holds about shoulder high, keeping his eyes fixed upon it and remarking, I shall now pass this small ball into this large one. He draws back and lowers the right arm as though to give it impetus as one naturally does in the act of throwing. This brings the right hand just over the padded box or basket on the servant and allows him to drop the small ball therein. Without any pause, he brings the right hand smartly up to the left, describing a tolerably wide arc in its transit, and then separating his hands shows that the smaller ball has vanished, having apparently passed into the large one. This sleight is not confined to objects of spherical form, but may be used with any article of convenient size. With this introduction, we shall now proceed to describe a few of the more popular ball tricks. The ball box. The leading idea of most of the tricks which we are about to describe is the magical appearance or disappearance of a ball. So far, they resemble the cup and ball tricks described in the last chapter, but with this difference that in the case of the present series, the main effect is produced by mechanical means, any sleight of hand employed being rather an accessory than the leading feature. The oldest and simplest of the mechanical appliances for this purpose is that known as the ball box, consisting of a box two to six inches in height of the shape shown in figure 127 and containing a ball which just fills it. The box consists of three portions, the lower portion, or box proper, A, the lid, C, and an intermediate portion, B, being a hollow hemisphere colored externally in imitation of the ball and so fitted with reference to the box and lid that it may be either lifted off with the lid, leaving the box apparently empty, or may be left upon the box when the lid is removed the effect to the eye being as if the ball had returned to the box. The ball box is generally of turned boxwood and is scored with concentric circles which serve to disguise its double opening. Simply stated, its effect is as follows. The solid ball is first shown in the box and then openly taken from it and the box covered with the lid. The ball is then got rid of in one or other of the modes before described, and a pretense is made of passing it invisibly into the box. The lid is removed without the intermediate portion B, and the ball appears to have returned to the box. Again, the lid is replaced and again removed, but this time B is removed with it, and the box again appears empty. The trick in this form is to be found in every toy shop is so well known as to produce scarcely any illusion, but its transparency may be considerably diminished by previously palming, in the right hand, the movable shell B, the convex side being inward, and then handing round the remaining portions and solid ball for inspection. When they are returned, the performer apparently places the ball in the box, but really makes a secret exchange and places B in the box instead. Upon again removing the lid, and with it B, the ball has disappeared, and as the audience have, as they believe, inspected the whole apparatus, the mode of its disappearance is not quite so obvious as in the first case. At best, however, the ball box in this its pristine form is a clumsy and inartistic contrivance, and has long been relegated to the juvenile and country fair school of conjuring. There is, however, an improved apparatus for producing a similar effect, which is generally worked in couples under the name of the red and black ball vases. The receptacle for the ball is, in this case, made in the form of a neat vase without any of the telltale grooves which disfigure the older ball box. See figure 128. Like its prototype, it is in three parts, which we will distinguish as before by the letters A, B, and C. The portion B, however, in this case goes completely within the lid C, within which it fits just tightly enough to be lifted off with it. When, however, the performer desires to leave B upon A, he presses down, in the act of lifting off the cover, a movable button or stud at the top. This pushes out the shell B from the cover, 
and when the ladder is lifted, leaves it upon A. When used in pairs, the ball vases are usually made with one red and one black ball, the shells B of each vase being also one black and one red. The balls are first offered for examination, after which the red ball is placed in the vase containing the black shell, and the black ball in that which contains the red shell. The vases are then covered, and on the covers being again removed, leaving the hollow shells upon the vases, the red ball being covered by the black shell and the black ball by the red shell. The effect to the spectator is as if the two balls had changed places. By leaving alternately the one or the other shell over its respective vase, the ball in the opposite vase being left uncovered, the vases may be made to appear as if both containing red balls or both black balls the genuine balls being finally again exhibited as at first. There is yet another form of ball box, also frequently worked in pairs and designed to simulate the apparent passage of a ball from the one box to the other. The vase in this case consists of two parts only, the vase proper A and the cover B, but the latter is of such a height as to completely contain the ball and of such a size internally that if the ball be jerked up into the cover, it will not again fall unless a slight shake be used to displace it. See figure 129. Each vase has its own ball, and the mode of use is as follows. One of the vases is prepared beforehand by jerking up the ball into the cover, which may then be removed, showing the vase apparently empty or both may first be shown empty and the ball then introduced secretly under the cover after the manner of the cups and balls. The remaining vase and ball are offered for inspection and when they are returned, the ball is placed within and covered over, after which the closed vase is placed upon the table. But in the act of doing this, the performer gives the apparatus a slight upward jerk thereby causing the ball therein to rise into the cover where it remains. The second vase is once more shown as empty, but replacing it on the table, the performer puts it down sharply, thereby causing the ball to drop from the cover into the cup. He now orders the ball, which the company have seen placed in the first vase, to pass invisibly into the second, and on again opening the two, this transition will appear to have taken place, and by a repetition of the process, the ball may be made to travel backwards and forwards from one vase to the other. Morrison's Pillbox In this trick, called by French conjurers la pilule du diable, the device of the shell is carried still further. The box in this case is spherical, standing upon a thin stem, see figure 130, and each part box proper and lid, contains a half shell, the edge of one having a rebate or holder so as to fit into the other, the two conjoined having the appearance of a solid ball. The genuine ball is of such a size as to just fill the hollow shells when thus joined. The lower shell fits loosely in the box and the upper one a little more tightly so as not to fall out unless pressed down by the button on the top of the lid, which not only loosens it from the lid, but presses it into the union with the lower shell. The mode of using the apparatus is as follows. It is first brought forward with the one half shell in the box and the other in the lid. The true ball, which is of the same color as the shell, generally black, being placed within the lower shell. The ball is ostentatiously removed and the box closed. The box is then either placed in some piece of apparatus adapted to cause its disappearance or is made to vanish by sleight of hand in one or other of the modes already described. The ball is now ordered to return to the box, which for greater certainty is once more shown empty. The performer again closes it pressing as he does so the button on the top of the lid, thus compelling the two half shells to coalesce. On again reopening the box, the ball has, to all appearance, returned as commanded. 
the ball box now under consideration has this great advantage over the single shell vases, that the sham ball can be completely removed from the box and shown on all sides, thus, apparently, negativing the possibility of its being a shell only. The trick may also be worked very effectively by using a genuine ball of a different color to the shell with the addition of a duplicate of each. Thus, if the shell be black, you must be provided with a solid ball of the same color and two red balls. One of the latter, as also the solid black ball, should be of such a size as to go inside the shell the remaining red ball being of the same size as the shell in its complete condition. The half shells being in their place in the box, the performer brings it forward together with the smaller red and black ball, keeping the remaining red ball concealed in his palm. Borrowing a handkerchief, he wraps, apparently, the black ball therein and gives it to someone to hold really substituting the palmed red ball and getting rid of the black ball as soon as he can into one of his secret pockets. He then places the remaining red ball in the box and, having covered it over, commands the black ball in the handkerchief to change places with the red one in the box. Upon examination, the change has apparently taken place, the red ball in the box being now enclosed within the hollow shell and thus having all the appearance of the solid black ball. The ball which changes to a rose. This is little more than an enlarged edition of the apparatus just described, the ball in Morrison's pill box being generally of about an inch and a half in diameter, while in the present case the ball is nearly double that size. See figure 131. The only other difference is the addition of a short pin, about a sixteenth of an inch in length, projecting from the bottom of the cup and fitting into a corresponding hole in the lower shell. The addition of this pin enables the performer, after having pressed the stud at top and thus caused the ball to appear in the previously empty box, to again cause its disappearance. This is effected by opening the box with a slight lateral pressure when the pin acts as a stop or check to hold back the lower shell, and the shells which are in this instance made to fit rather more loosely together are thus forced to separate again, the lower being left in the cup and the upper in the lid as before. This apparatus is generally used with a solid black ball and a couple of artificial rosebuds as nearly alike as possible. The apparatus is brought forward empty and with the solid ball and one of the rosebuds is handed to the audience for inspection. The two half shells, joined together so as to form a hollow ball, with the second rosebud within, are placed ready to hand in one of the pockets of the performer. The audience having duly examined the apparatus, the performer returns to his table, secretly exchanging as he does so the solid for the hollow ball. This latter he places openly in the cup, taking care that the hole in the lower shell duly corresponds with the pin at bottom and puts on the cover. He now announces that the ball which he has just placed in the cup will at command fly away and that the rosebud which he holds shall take its place. The disappearance of the visible rosebud is effected in any way that the invention or the appliances at command of the performer may suggest and on the box being opened, so as to part the two shells, the ball has apparently disappeared and the rose has taken its place. By again closing the box, and this time pressing the stud on the top, the flower may again be made to vanish and the ball to reappear in its original position. The popular trick of the flower in the buttonhole, which will be described under the head of miscellaneous tricks, may be used in conjunction with this apparatus the ball being found in the place of the flower, while the latter is made to appear in the buttonhole. A similar apparatus to the one above is sometimes made in metal and of a size sufficient to enclose a cannon ball, which being made to disappear, its place is supplied by a variety of articles which have been otherwise disposed of at an earlier period. The Obedient Ball 
This trick is of Japanese origin and from that circumstance is sometimes known as the Japanese ball. It is performed with a large black wooden ball about 5 inches in diameter with the hole bored through it from side to side. A piece of stout rope, 4 or 5 feet in length, with a knot at one end, completes the apparatus. The performer commences by passing the rope through the ball and the hands both for examination. The ball is found to run loosely upon the rope and both are manifestly quite free from mechanism or preparation. The articles being returned, the performer places his foot upon the knotted end of the rope and taking the other end in his right hand, holds it in a perpendicular position. The ball is raised as far as the length of rope will admit and on being again released, immediately runs down again, as would naturally be expected. The performer now announces that, in obedience to his will, the laws of gravity will be, in this particular instance, suspended. Accordingly, on his again raising the ball to any portion of the rope, it remains stationary at that height until released by his command, when it instantly runs down. Other persons are invited to come forward and to place the ball at any height they please, the ball again remaining stationary until released by the word of the operator when it slowly descends, stopping, however, in its course, and remaining fixed whenever commanded by the performer to do so. The secret lies in the fact that the hole in the ball is not made straight from end to end, but curved with an angle or break in the middle. See figure 132. So long as the rope is slack, it runs through easily enough, but as soon as it is drawn taut and thus forced into a straight line, it is clipped by the opposite angles A, B, and C, creating an amount of friction which would support a much greater weight than that of the ball. The performer has, therefore, only to draw the rope taut when he desires the ball to remain stationary and to slacken when he desires it to run down. There is another form of the obedient ball, designed for drawing room use. The ball in this case is about two and a half inches in diameter, and the bore is straight, but tapering from a quarter of an inch at the one opening to about half an inch at the other. The cord used is a thin piece of whip cord, and the ball therefore runs quite loosely upon it. There is, however, in this case, an additional element in the apparatus, consisting of a little black wooden plug about an inch in length and tapering so as to fit midway into the bore of the ball. See figure 133, in which A represents a nearly full-size view of the plug in question. The plug is bored after the manner of the large ball, the hole being of such a size as to just allow the cord to run through it. This plug is secretly threaded upon the cord before commencing the trick. The cord, which in this case has a tassel instead of a knot at one end, being passed through it from the larger end. This plug is kept concealed in the hand of the performer, and the string being allowed to dangle down on either side of it. The ball is handed round for examination, and when returned, the cord is passed through it from the side which has the larger opening. The ball is then allowed to drop quickly to the full extent of the cord. As it runs down, it encounters the plug, which is thereby placed in position within the ball, and both run down together until stopped by the tassel. From this point, the working of the trick is the same as with the larger ball. End of section 32. Section 33 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wendy Almeida. Modern Magic, a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Chapter 15. Hat Tricks. The present chapter will be devoted to those tricks in which a hat plays a special or prominent part. 
Borrowed hats have been used in the course of many of the tricks already described, but the part played by the hat has been of an incidental and subordinate character. In the tricks next following, the hat is the principal article employed. The majority of hat tricks are different modifications of the same broad idea, viz. the production from a borrowed and apparently empty hat of various articles in size and number much exceeding what any hat could in the natural way contain. One of the best is that of the cannonballs in the hat. The earliest and simplest form of this trick is limited to the production of a solid wooden globe, blacked to resemble a cannonball. The introduction of the ball into the hat is effected as follows. The ball, which has a hole of about two inches in depth by one in diameter bored in it towards its center, is placed on the servant of a performer's table in such manner that the hole above mentioned shall slant upwards and outwards at an angle of about 45 degrees. To keep the ball steady and to prevent its rolling off, some performers have a slight circular hollow scooped in the surface of the servant itself. A more convenient plan, however, is to use an india rubber ring, such as is given to infants teething. This may be placed on any part of the servant and makes a capital rest or bed for the ball. A bit of half-inch rope with the ends joined so as to form a ring will answer the same purpose. When the performer desires to introduce the ball into the hat, which we will suppose to have been borrowed for the purpose of some previous trick just completed, he takes the hat with his thumb outside and his fingers inside the brim, and holds it up with its mouth towards the spectators, so as to show indirectly that it is empty. See figure 134. Carelessly lowering his hand, he brings the hat mouth downwards on the table, and, drawing it towards him, slips the second finger into the hole in the ball, see figure 135, when the mere action of crooking the finger brings the ball into the hat. He then, still holding the ball supported by the finger, walks away from the table towards the owner of the hat with the apparent intention of returning it. Just before reaching him, however, he pretends to notice that it is somewhat heavy, and looking into it says, Dear me, sir, there is something rather peculiar about this hat. Are you aware that there is something in it? The owner naturally professes ignorance of the fact, and the performer, after keeping the audience in suspense for a moment or two, turns the hat over and lets the ball fall out upon the stage. The performer may in some degree heighten the effect of the trick by making it appear that the ball is wedged very tightly in the hat, as the difficulty of introducing it becomes thereby presumably the greater. This is managed by holding the hat with both hands, as shown in figure 136, when the extended fingertips will prevent the ball from falling as long as may be desired, however much the hat may be shaken. The trick, as above described, is of very short duration. In order to lengthen, and at the same time to diversify it, a second ball is sometimes employed, of similar appearance, but of different construction. This second ball, see figures 137, 138, the latter representing a section of the ball, is a strongly made hollow sphere of tin or zinc with a circular opening of about three and a half inches across, closed by a sort of sliding door, A, also circular, working on two curved arms, B, B, which move on two pivots, C, C, at opposite sides of the ball on the inside. In this door is a hole an inch in diameter, answering the same purpose as the hole bored in the solid ball. The ball is filled beforehand with bonbons, small toys, or any other articles suitable for production. Thus loaded, it is placed upon the servant and introduced into the hat as above described. The performer goes through the ceremony of pretending to discover something in the hat but does not, as in the last case, at once produce the ball. 
slipping back the sliding door, he brings out one by one the articles contained in the ball, not hurriedly, but with deliberation, as he thereby produces the effect of greater quantity. Having emptied the ball, he again closes the circular slide, remarking that the hat is now quite empty. As a proof that it is so, he turns the hat mouth downwards as above directed, preventing the ball from falling with the tips of his fingers. Again he moves towards the owner, as if to return the hat, and again pretends to find something in it. This time, however, he does not allow the ball to fall on the ground, as being hollow it will not bear rough usage, but lifts it out with his left hand taking care that the door side shall be downwards next his palm observing that he will have the ball packed up for the owner of the hat to take home with him he returns to his table and places it thereon as the ball was in his left hand the right is still holding the hat and this gives him the opportunity to introduce the second i e the solid cannon ball which should be placed in readiness at the opposite corner of the servant this also is produced in due course, and, being manifestly solid, naturally leads the audience to infer that the other was so also. What are known as multiplying balls are frequently used in conjunction with the cannon balls. These are cloth-covered balls of about two and a half inches in diameter. In appearance they are solid but in reality are mere outer coverings of cloth kept distended by spiral skeletons of wire see figure 139 and may be pressed quite flat in which condition they occupy an exceedingly small space though they immediately regain their shape on being released a large number of these may be packed in the hollow cannon ball and when taken out produce a pile extending far above the mouth of the hat the cannon ball lying hidden beneath them the hollow ball may also be filled with soft feathers of which what will seem an incredible quantity when spread out may be compressed into a very small space feathers are however objectionable in a drawing-room from the difficulty of collecting them from the carpet the hundred goblets from a hat the goblets used for this purpose are of polished tin, about four inches in depth, and made without ornament or projection of any kind. Being all of the same size and slightly tapering, a large number of them may be fitted one within the other, and yet occupy little more space than a single one. The goblets thus packed are placed in a bag of black alpaca, just large enough to receive them, and concealed on the servant or in one of the profonde of the performer. When it is desired to introduce them into the hat, they are grasped in either hand, the back of the hand being turned towards the audience and thus covering them. The hand is now carelessly placed in the hat as though to take something out. Once introduced, the goblets are produced one by one and placed mouth downward on the table, their number giving an appearance of bulk which seems to exclude the possibility of their having been all contained within so small a space. Two or three parcels of goblets may be introduced successively and brought out one by one with little difficulty. We may here mention a little expedient, which will be found of great assistance, where the performer desires to introduce into a hat a bundle of goblets, or any similar article, from either of his secret pockets. We will suppose that the article in question is in the right hand profonde. Taking the empty hat in the opposite hand, the left, he stoops a little, and holding it down near the floor with its mouth toward the company, gently moves it round and round in circles, gazing at it intently, as though anticipating some important result. This draws all eyes to the hat, and enables him to drop his right hand to the profonde, and bring out, under cover of the hand and wrist, the article to be introduced. Continuing the motion, he gradually brings the mouth of the hat upwards so that the company can no longer see into it, and suddenly plunges his right hand into it, as though merely to take out the article or articles which he, in fact, thereby introduces. 
This may be repeated from the profonde on the opposite side, and thus two successive packets of articles may be produced without even going near the table. A dozen babies from a hat. Among the various objects available for production may be enumerated dolls, of which a dozen, each eight or nine inches in height, may be produced from a borrowed hat. The dolls for this purpose are of colored muslin, stretched over a framework or skeleton of spiral wire, after the fashion of the multiplying balls, see figure 140, and may be compressed vertically to a thickness of about three-quarters of an inch. A dozen of them may be packed within the hollow cannonball described above, resuming their shape as soon as they are released. The Magic Reticules this is one of the most modern hat tricks. The reticules, which are of cardboard covered with leather, are, when expanded, as shown in figure 141. They are, however, constructed so as to fold into a very small compass in manner following. The ends, AA, are only attached to the reticule at their lower edges, which form a kind of leather hinge, and may be folded inwards flat upon the bottom of the reticule. See figure 142. The ends of the ribbon B, which forms the sling or handle of the reticule, run freely through two holes, CC, in the upper side of the reticule, and are attached to the ends AA at the points DD. The ends being folded down, as in figure 142, the reticule becomes a hollow oblong, open from end to end, as in figure 143. The angles, being made of soft leather, are flexible, and by pressing the sides in the direction indicated by the dotted lines, see figure 143, the reticule is brought into the condition shown in figure 144, and, on being again folded, into that shown in figure 145, in which condition it is little larger than a pocketbook. Half a dozen reticules thus folded and packed in a bag of black alpaca, or held together by an India rubber ring, form a small and compact parcel, and are easily introduced into the hat. The performer, having got them out of the bag, has only to unfold each so as to bring it into the condition shown in figure 144, when the mere act of lifting the reticule out of the bag by the ribbon B raises the sides and ends and restores it to the shape shown in figure 141. The Drums from the Hat in this trick, the performer generally begins by producing from the hat a number of the multiplying balls described at page 307. He next produces a miniature drum, prettily ornamented, then another, then a third and a fourth, each being a shade larger than its predecessor, and the last of such a size as barely to be containable within the hat. With the reader's present knowledge, he will readily conjecture that the drums are so constructed as to fit one within the other, the multiplying balls being packed within the smallest of the four. One end of each drum is loose and falls inwards upon the opposite end, upon which it lies flat, thus giving space for the introduction of another drum a size smaller. Across the loose end, and parallel to it, is fixed a wire, forming a handle whereby the performer may lift the drum out of the hat, the act of doing so raising the end into its proper position, and a wire rim round the inside of each drum preventing the loose end being drawn out altogether. Each drum is taken out with the loose end upwards. But the performer, in placing it on the table, turns it over, thus bringing the solid end up. In default of this precaution, the loose end would fall back again to its old position, and so betray the secret. The drums are usually made oval rather than round, as they are thus better suited to the shape of a hat. The Bird Cages from the Hat not content with cannonballs, drums, and ladies' reticules, the public of the present day requires that bird cages and living birds should be produced from an empty hat. The bird cages used vary in their construction. 
Some are made to fit one within the other, after the fashion of the drums just described, save that the bird cages, unlike the drums, are lifted out by the solid and not the loose ends, which fall down of their own accord. Those in most general use, however, are of the shape shown in figure 146, and are alike in size, measuring about six inches in height by five in breadth and depth. The bottom is made to slide upwards on the upright wires which form the sides. When it is desired to prepare the cage for use, a canary is first placed therein, and the bottom is then pushed up as far as it will go. See figure 147. The sides, which work on hinges at AAAA, being folded one by one upon the bottom, the cage finally assuming the shape shown in figure 148. It is in this condition that the cages, generally three in number, are introduced into the hat, either from the servant or from inside the vest of the performer, and in the act of lifting out, which is done by the wire loop at top, the sides and bottom falling down, the cage again becomes as in figure 146. The cake, or pudding, in the hat. This is an old and favorite hat trick. The necessary apparatus consists of two parts. First, a round tin pan, A, see figure 149, four inches in depth and tapering from five inches at its greatest to four and a half inches at its smallest diameter. It is open at each end, but is divided into two parts by a horizontal partition at about two-thirds of its depth. Second, a larger tin, B, japanned to taste, five and a half inches in depth, and so shaped as to fit somewhat tightly over the smaller tin. In the larger end of the latter is placed a hot cake or pudding, and in this condition it is placed on the servant of the table, projecting a little over the edge. The performer borrows a hat, and in passing behind his table, tips cake and tin together into it. The chances are that the tin will fall small end upwards, the opposite end being the heaviest. But if not, the performer turns the tin so as to bring it into that position. Placing the hat mouth upwards on the table, he announces his intention of making a cake in it for which purpose he takes one by one and mixes in the tin B a quantity of flour, raisins, eggs, sugar, and the other ingredients for a cake, adding water enough to make the mixture into a thick batter. This he pours into the hat, holding the tin with both hands, at first high above it, but gradually bringing it lower and lower, till at last, as if draining the last drop of the mixture, he lowers the mouth of the tin right into the hat and brings it well down over the smaller tin. On being again raised, it brings away within it the smaller tin and its liquid contents, the cake being left in the hat. He next proceeds to bake the cake by moving the hat backwards and forwards at a short distance over the flame of a candle, and after a sufficient interval exhibits the result, which is cut up and handed round to the company for their approval. As the batter round the sides of B is apt to cause A to stick pretty tightly into it, a folding ring is generally fixed inside A in order to facilitate its removal after the close of the trick. The Welsh Rabbit. This is a trick of a comic character, and in the hands of a spirited performer is sure to be received with applause, particularly by the younger members of the audience. Its effect is as follows. The performer brings in in one hand a saucepan, fancifully decorated, and in the other a plate with bread, cheese, pepper, etc. With these ingredients he proposes to make a Welsh Rabbit and to give the audience, without extra charge, a lesson in cookery, chopping the bread and cheese together in a burlesque fashion and seasoning with pepper and salt to a degree which no palate short of a salamander's could possibly stand, he shovels all into the saucepan and claps the lid on. For a moment he is at a loss for a fire, but this difficulty is quickly conquered. 
borrowing a gentleman's hat and a lady's pocket handkerchief, he requests permission to use them for the purpose of the experiment. This is readily accorded, but the respective owners look on with consternation when the performer proceeds to set fire to the handkerchief and, dropping it still blazing into the hat, to cook the Welsh rabbit by moving the saucepan to and fro over the flames. Having done this for a minute or two, he extinguishes the flames by lowering the saucepan for a moment into the hat. Then again removing it and taking off the lid, he brings it forward to the company and exhibits not the expected Welsh rabbit or rare bit, but a genuine live rabbit, every vestige of the cheese and other ingredients having disappeared. The secret of this ingenious trick lies mainly in the construction of the saucepan, which consists of four parts designated in the diagram figure 150, by the letters A, B, C, and D. A is the lid, which has no speciality, save that the rim round it is rather deeper than usual. B is a shallow tray or lining of the same depth as the lid, fitting easily within the top of the saucepan. A, on the contrary, fits tightly within B. C is the body of the saucepan and has no speciality. D is an outer sheet or covering, loosely fitting the lower part of the saucepan, and, like it, is japanned plain black, the upper part and lid being generally of an ornamental pattern. For our own part, we much prefer either plain black or polished tin throughout, as savoring less of mechanism or preparation. The presence or absence of D does not alter the general appearance of the saucepan and cannot therefore be detected by the eye. It should be mentioned that D is so made that between its bottom and the bottom of the saucepan is a space of about half an inch in depth, and in this space before the apparatus is brought forward is placed a substitute handkerchief sprinkled with a few drops of spirits of wine or eau de cologne to render it more inflammable within the saucepan is placed a small live rabbit after which b is put in its place and pressed down the performer is now ready to begin the trick he brings forward the saucepan, holding it as in figure 151, in which position the pressure of the first and second fingers on D prevents it falling off, as being loose it would otherwise do. Placing it on the table, he mixes the bread, cheese, etc. on the plate, and then pours all into the saucepan, where, of course, they fall into B. As B is comparatively shallow, it is well to place the saucepan in some tolerably elevated situation so that the audience may not be able to see into it, or they may perceive that the bread, etc., do not fall to the bottom. The lid is next placed on the saucepan. The hat and handkerchief are borrowed, the latter, which is to serve as fuel, being dropped into the hat. The performer, as if bethinking himself of a possible difficulty, carelessly remarks, we mustn't have the stove too small for the saucepan, and so saying lifts the ladder, as shown in figure 151, and lowers it for a moment into the hat, as though testing their relative sizes. In that moment, however, he relaxes the pressure of his fingers on D, and so leaves it within the hat, placing the saucepan on the table beside it. When he again takes out the supposed handkerchief and sets light to it, it is, of course, the substitute that is actually burnt, the genuine handkerchief, meanwhile, remaining hidden beneath D in the crown. The effect of the flames rising from the hat, in which the audience cannot suppose any preparation, is very startling, and yet, unless the substitute handkerchief is unusually large, or the spirit has been applied with a too liberal hand, there is no real danger of injuring the hat. The performer moves about the saucepan above the blaze at such a distance as not to inconvenience the animal within and, after a moment or two, brings the saucepan sharply down into the hat for the ostensible purpose of extinguishing the flames, but in again lifting it out, he brings with it D and places all together on the table. Nothing is now left in the hat but the borrowed handkerchief, 
which may be restored in any manner which the performer's fancy may suggest. When the lid of the saucepan is removed, as it fits more tightly within B than the latter fits within the saucepan, it naturally carries B with it, thus causing the disappearance of the bread, cheese, etc., and revealing in its place the live rabbit. Some fun may be created by selecting beforehand an assistant from the juvenile portion of the audience and dressing him up with a pocket handkerchief round his head and another by way of apron to act as assistant cook. A guinea pig or small kitten may be substituted for the rabbit, the performer accounting for the wrong animal being produced by supposing that he must have made some mistake in mixing the ingredients. End of section 33. Section 34 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Cologne. Modern Magic A Practical Treatise in the Art of Conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Miscellaneous Tricks, Part 1. Under this head we propose to describe such tricks as do not come within either of the preceding categories. We shall make no attempt at classifying them, save that we shall, as far as practicable, describe the best known and simplest feats first, and thence proceed to the more complicated. Stage tricks, i.e., tricks adapted to the stage only, will be treated in the chapter next following. We will begin with the cut string restored. This is a trick of such venerable antiquity that we should not have ventured to allude to it were it not that the mode of working which we are about to describe, though old in principle, is new in detail and much superior in neatness to the generally known methods. After having offered the string, which should be about four feet in length for examination, the performer takes the ends, pointing upwards, between the first and second finger and thumb of the left hand, and the first finger and thumb of the right hand, letting the remainder of the string hang down in a loop between them. Now bringing the right hand close to the left, he draws that portion of the string which is held in the right hand toward himself between the first and second fingers of the left hand, thus crossing at right angles that end of the cord which is held in the left hand continuing to pull until half the length of the string has passed the left hand, and at the same time slipping the third finger of the left hand between the two parts of the string, which will thus be as shown in figure 152, in which for convenience of reference, the three lines in which the string now hangs are marked A, B, and C, and one half of the string is shown black, and the other half white, though, of course, there would be no such difference of color in the original. The first finger and thumb of the right hand, still retaining the end which they already hold, sees the portion B at the point marked with that letter, the third finger of the left hand at the same time drawing back the portion A towards the palm of the hand. The string will thus be brought into the position shown in figures 153 and 154, in the latter of which for the sake of clearness, the thumbs are made transparent. The part now held horizontally between the two hands, which appears to be the middle of the string, really being only the immediate continuation of the end held in the left hand. The whole operation of arranging the string in proper position, though tedious to describe, does not take half a second in practice. The performer next requests some person to cut the string, thus arranged in half, and this being apparently done he transfers the string all together to the right hand keeping the point of junction of the crossed pieces hidden between the finger and thumb see figure 155 he now gives either end to someone to hold and placing his open left hand near to the end thus held winds the string rapidly round it sliding off as he does so the short piece which as soon as it is clear of the longer portion, he presses with his thumb between the second and third fingers of the same hand. On again, unwinding the string from the left hand, it is found apparently whole as at first. 
The principle of the trick being very generally known, you will frequently find some one of the audience proclaim his acquaintance with it, and declare that you have merely cut a short piece off the end of the string. Pardon me, you reply. My dear sir, that method of performing the trick has long since been exploded. I will at once show you that I do not make use of any such shabby expedient. Of course, if a piece was, as you suggest, cut off the end, the string would be that much shorter after the operation. Will someone be kind enough to measure it? While this is being done, you secretly double in a loop the little piece which was cut off on the former occasion, and which has still remained in your right hand. When the string is returned to you, you double it in half and allow it to hang down between the first finger and thumb of the right hand, drawing up immediately above it the little loop you have just formed. See figure 156. You now ask someone again to cut the string, which he apparently does, in reality merely dividing the little loop. You go through any magical gesticulations you please, and ultimately again conceal the cut ends between the fingers, and produce the string once more restored. On being measured, it is found to have lost nothing of its length. The trick in the second form being performed by wholly different means, the repetition will puzzle even those who knew, or believed they knew, the modus operandi in the first case my grandmother's necklace. The trick which bears this title is also a very old one, but is little known in the improved form we are about to describe. In its older shape, it is performed with three perforated wooden balls or beads, threaded on a couple of tapes whose ends are held securely by two of the spectators. The problem is to detach the beads without breaking the tapes, and this is effected as follows. The tapes, which should be from four to six feet in length, are beforehand doubled in the middle and slightly joined at the bend of each with fine cotton or silk of the same color. The tapes are thus really middle to middle, though to a casual observer they appear to be merely laid side by side. The performer comes forward with the tapes thus prepared, thrown over his left arm, taking care that the point of junction shall be on the side towards his body and therefore concealed, and with the beads in his hands. These latter, which are mere wooden balls, from one to two inches in diameter, perforated so as to freely admit the tapes, he hands for examination. When they are returned, he threads them one after another upon the tapes, holding the latter in a loop so that the balls may sink down to the middle, and so cover the point of junction. He next requests two of the company to come forward and hold the tapes, and hands two ends to one and two to the other. Each person believes that he holds one end of each tape, though in reality each has both ends of the same tape. The performer now takes from each one of the ends which he holds, and crossing the tapes in the manner shown in figure 157, gives to each the end which the other previously held. Holding a hat below the balls, he requests each person to pull smartly at the word three. The word of command is given, one, two, Three, and the thread breaking, the balls fall into the hat, though the ends of the tape still remain in the hands of the holders. The improvement to which we have alluded consists in the use of six balls, three red and three black. The red balls having been first threaded on the tapes, and the two ends having been crossed and returned to the holders in manner already described, the black balls are in turn threaded on the tapes at either end, and the performer holding the hat beneath, and addressing one of the persons who hold the tapes, says, Which will you have, sir? The red balls or the black? Whichever the answer, the result is the same, for the red balls only can come off the tapes, the black remaining still upon them. But in either case, the performer is able to satisfy the choice which has been made. If the red balls have been chosen, he says on their falling, You chose the red, I think. You see that your commands are at once obeyed. If, on the other hand, the black are chosen. The performer says, you prefer the black? Then I will take the red, which he does accordingly. The audience, having heard the choice freely offered, and not being aware of the subterfuge by which the implied undertaking is fulfilled, naturally believe the performer was able to take off or leave on the tape whichever group of balls he pleased. The Bonus Genius or Vanishing Doll While upon the subject of old-fashioned tricks, we may briefly notice that known under the name of the bonus genius, which has puzzled many generations of our forefathers, 
and though now rarely exhibited by professional performers, is still a great favorite with juvenile audiences. The bonus genius is a little wooden figure of a man, four to six inches in height, and more or less grotesque in color and design. A little cloak made small above and full below, like the skirt of a doll's dress, and with no opening save where the head of the figure passes through, completes the apparatus. There are, however, two points about the doll and his cloak which are unknown to the spectators. First, the head of the doll is movable. A wooden peg forming the neck and fitting somewhat tightly into a corresponding hole in the body. Secondly, there is stitched on the inside of the cloak just below the opening for the neck a little pocket of the description known among tailors as a patch pocket, and of such a size as to contain the head easily. The performer holding up the figure and introducing it to the company as his flying messenger, warranted to outstrip the electric telegraph, covers it with a cloak, so that nothing but the head is seen. Grasping the figure under the cloak with his right hand, the performer holds a burlesque conversation with him, finally entrusting him with a message to be immediately delivered to the President of the United States, the Shah, or any other individual at a distance. The figure does not move. Well, sir, are you not going? asks the performer. The figure shakes his head from side to side, an effect easily produced by turning the body backwards and forwards under the cloak. You won't, eh? Why not? I should like to know. Oh, I see what you mean. I haven't given you your traveling expenses. As he says the last words, he grasps the figure and cloak from the outside round the neck with the left hand and draws away the right from beneath the cloak, secretly carrying with it the body and putting his hand in his pocket, as though in search of money. He leaves the body of the figure in his pocket and brings out the hand again empty, but in the position of holding a coin between the finger and thumb. There, sir, he says, there is a shilling for you, making the gesture of giving it. You don't see the coin, ladies and gentlemen, but the fact is, what I have just given him is fairy money. The weight of the ordinary coinage would interfere with the rapidity of his flight. Now, sir, make haste. You have nothing to wait for now. The performer has, meanwhile, again put the right hand under the cloak, and with two fingers holds the little pocket open for the reception of the head. As he says the last words, he gives the head a sharp downward rap with the fingers of the left hand, and lets it fall into the little pocket, the effect being as if the figure has suddenly vanished. The performer shakes the cloak and turns it inside out to show that it is empty, taking care always to grasp it by that part which contains the head when all other portions of the cloak may be shown freely, and as the audience are not aware that the figure is divisible, and supposing it to be indivisible, it would be clearly much too large to be concealed in the closed hand. There is nothing to lead them to guess the secret. If it is desired to make the doll reappear, the head is pushed up again through the opening of the cloak, the hand beneath supporting it by the peg which forms the neck, and it may thus be made to vanish and return any number of times. With tolerable skill in palming, the little pocket may be dispensed with, the head being simply held in the hand. This mode of working is, in our own opinion, to be preferred, as the cloak may then be handed for examination, without giving even the infinitesimal clue which the pocket might suggest. Some performers, to still further hoodwink the spectators, make use of two figures, the first which is handed round for inspection being solid, and being afterwards secretly changed for its counterpart with a movable head. Others, again, use only one figure which is solid throughout, but are provided with a separate head whose existence is, of course, not suspected by the spectators, and having handed round the solid figure for examination, conceal this and work the trick with the head only. The Dancing Sailor The Dancing Sailor is a figure cut out of cardboard eight or nine inches in height, and with its arms and legs cut out separately and attached to the trunk with thread in such a manner as to hang perfectly free. The mode of exhibiting it is as follows. The performer taking a seat facing the company, with his legs slightly apart, places the figure on the ground between them. As might be expected, it falls flat and lifeless, but after a few mesmeric passes it is induced to stand upright, though without visible support and on a lively piece of music being played, dances to it, keeping time and ceasing as soon as the music ceases. 
The secret lies in the fact that from leg to leg of the performer, at about the height of the figure from the ground, is fixed, generally by means of a couple of bent pins, a fine black silk thread of 18 or 20 inches in length. This allows him to move about without any hindrance. On each side of the head of the figure is a little slanting cut, tending in a perpendicular direction and about half an inch in length. The divided portions of the cardboard are bent back a little, thus forming two hooks, so to speak, at the sides of the head. When the performer takes his seat as before mentioned, the separation of his legs draws the silk comparatively taut, though against a moderately dark background it remains wholly invisible. When he first places the figure on the ground, he does so simply, and the figure naturally falls. He makes a few sham mesmeric passes over it, but still it falls. At the third or fourth attempt, however, he places it so that the little hooks already mentioned just catch the thread. See figure 158 showing the arrangement of the head. And the figure is thus kept upright. When the music commences, the smallest motion or pretense of keeping time with the feet is enough to start the sailor in a vigorous hornpipe. The Bottle Imps These are miniature black bottles, about two inches in height, with rounded bottoms and so weighted that, like tumbler dolls, they rise of their own accord to the perpendicular, and will not rest in any other position. The proprietor, however, has a charm by which he is able to conquer their obstinate uprightness. For him, and for him only, they will consent to be laid down, and even to stand at an angle of forty-five degrees, though they again rebel if any other person attempts to make them do the same. The little bottles are made of paper mache or some other very light material, varnished black, the bottom of each being a half bullet, spherical side downwards. The center of gravity is therefore at the bottom of the bottle, which is thus compelled always to stand upright. The performer, however, is provided with one or two little pieces of iron wire of such a size and length as just to slip easily into the bottle one of these being held concealed between the finger and thumb. It is a very easy matter in picking up the bottle to slip it in, and the slight additional weight neutralizing the effect of the half bullet at the foot causes the bottle to lie still in any position. Having shown that the bottle is obedient to the word of command, the performer again picks it up with the neck between the first and second fingers and thumb carelessly turning it bottom upwards and thus allowing the bit of wire to slip out again into the palm of his hand. When he is able to again tender the bottle for experiment, partaking of the nature of a puzzle as well as a conjuring trick, this little toy has amused thousands, and if neatly manipulated, may be repeatedly exhibited even before the same spectators with little fear of detection. The Vanishing Gloves this is a capital trick with which to commence an entertainment. When coming as it should do, unannounced, and before the performance proper has commenced, it has an air of improvisation which greatly enhances its effect, and at once awakens the attention of the audience. The performer comes forward in full evening dress, while saying a few words by way of introduction to his entertainment. He begins to take off his gloves, commencing with that on his right hand. As soon as it is fairly off, he takes it in the right hand, waves the hand with a careless gesture, and the glove is gone. He begins to take off the other, walking as he does so behind his table, whereupon his wand is laid. The left hand glove being removed is rolled up into a ball and transferred from the right hand to the left, which is immediately closed. The right hand picks up the wand and with it touches the left which being slowly opened, the second glove is found to have also disappeared. The disappearance of the first glove is effected by means of a piece of cord elastic attached to the back of the waistcoat and thence passing down the sleeve. This should be of such a length as to allow the glove to be drawn down and put on the hand and yet to pull it smartly up the sleeve and out of sight when released. It is desirable to have a hem round the wrist of the glove and to pass the elastic through this like the cord of a bag, as it thereby draws the wrist portion of the glove together, and causes it to offer less hindrance to its passage up the sleeve. Upon taking off the glove, the performer retains it in his hand, 
and lets it go when he pleases. He must, however, take care to straighten his arm before letting it slip, as otherwise the elastic will remain comparatively slack, and the glove will, instead of disappearing with a flash, dangle ignominiously from the coat cuff. The left-hand glove is got rid of by palming. The performer standing behind his table is already mentioned, rolling the glove between his hands and quickly twisting the fingers inside so as to bring it into a more manageable form, pretends to place it in his left hand, but really palms it in his right. He now lowers the right hand to pick up his wand, and as the hand reaches the table, drops the glove on the servant. He now touches the left hand with the wand, in due course opening the hand and showing that the glove has departed. Some performers vanish both gloves by means of elastic, one up the right sleeve, the other up the left, but in doing so they offend against one of the cardinal precepts of the art, viz. never to perform the same trick twice in succession by the same means. The audience, having seen the manner of the first disappearance, are all on the alert, and are not unlikely on the second occasion to guess the means employed. If, on the other hand, the performer adopts the plan indicated above, the two modes of producing the effect being different, each renders it more difficult to discover the secret of the other. End of section 34. Section 35 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Modern Magic, a Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Miscellaneous Tricks, Part 2. The Egg Bag. This is a very old-fashioned trick, but if performed with address, it is by no means ineffective. It was exhibited in a modified form by the Japanese jugglers who visited London a few years ago. We shall first describe it in the simple form adopted by them, and shall then proceed to explain the older and more elaborate version. The Japanese egg bag is about eight inches in depth and six in breadth, and is made of alpaca, tammy, or some similar opaque material. Its only peculiarity is that one of its sides is double the stuff being folded down inwards from the mouth of the bag to about two-thirds of its depth, and stitched at the sides, but left open at its lower edge. The effect of this arrangement is to make a sort of pocket, mouth downwards, inside the bag. If any small article, such as an egg, be placed within the bag, and the bag be turned upside down, the article will not fall out, but will fall into the pocket, which, in the reversed position of the bag, will be mouth upwards. This will enable you to conceal the presence of any article in the bag, as you may turn it upside down and even inside out without any fear of the article falling. And so long as you take care to keep the pocket side of the bag towards yourself, the spectators have not the least reason for suspecting that the bag is otherwise than empty. The uses to which this little bag may be put are various. Amongst others, it is available either to produce or cause the disappearance of an egg, and may thus, in combination with other apparatus, be made useful for many tricks. We shall content ourselves with describing one only of the modes of using it. The performer comes forward, having in his hand the bag, in which is beforehand placed a small egg. He turns the bag upside down and inside out, thus proving to all appearance that it is perfectly empty. Holding the bag for a moment with his teeth, he pulls back his coat cuffs to prove that he has nothing concealed in that quarter, taking care as he does so to show clearly that his hands are empty. Taking the bag in his left hand and imitating, if he can, the clucking of a hen, he dips his right hand into it and produces an egg, or rather, the egg. This he places in his mouth, letting all see that he does so, then making a gesture of swallowing, he again dips his hand in the bag, and produces a second egg, of which he disposes in the same way, repeating the operation until a dozen or more have been apparently produced and swallowed. With the reader's present knowledge, it is hardly necessary to suggest to him that the egg, though fairly placed in the mouth, is, under cover of the hand, instantly pushed out again with the tongue and palmed, rendering it a very simple matter to produce, apparently, another egg from the bag. Although so absurdly simple, the trick is effective, and, if neatly performed, produces a complete illusion. 
the bag which is more generally known as the egg bag is a much larger affair measuring 18 to 20 inches in width by 14 or 15 in depth in its most approved form one side of the bag is made double the double side being stitched all round save for about four inches at one corner of the bottom of the bag the little opening thus left affords therefore the sole access to the space between the double sides between these double sides and immediately below their upper edge is stitched a broad band with a row of a dozen or more little pockets each capable of holding an egg and upwards each pocket covers about two-thirds of the egg which is prevented from falling out spontaneously by a little piece of elastic round the edge of the pocket though it will slip out and fall into the space between the double sides on the slightest pressure being applied to it the bag is prepared for use by placing an egg in each of the little pockets we have mentioned the eggs used are either blown shells or imitation eggs of wood or tin with one real one for the performer to break as a specimen and so lead the audience to the belief that all are equally genuine the bag being brought forward is turned upside down of course nothing falling from it the performer then thrusting his arms down to the bottom and seizing the bag by the corners inside turns it inside out taking care however to keep the double side towards himself having thus conclusively proved its emptiness he again brings back the bag to its normal condition and in the act of doing so squeezes with his finger and thumb through the stuff the genuine egg out of its pocket it falls into the space between the double sides and by gently sloping the bag downward in the direction of the opening at the corner he brings the egg into the outer bag whence he produces it and breaks it to show its genuineness as already mentioned again he turns the bag inside out shaking and twisting it and again produces an egg from it as before repeating the operation until the supply of eggs is exhausted sometimes he varies his proceedings by trampling or jumping on the bag which he lays for that purpose on the floor with its lower edge towards the audience the eggs are thus on the side remote from the spectators and in trampling on the bag it is very easy for the performer to avoid that particular line in which he knows them to be it was formerly the fashion after bringing out a number of eggs as above described to finish by producing the hen which is supposed to have laid them this was done by an adroit exchange of the bag just used for another containing a hen hung in readiness behind a chair or some other convenient cover this latter bag having no double side or other preparation might safely be abandoned to the inspection of the most curious spectator where it is not intended to produce the bird it will still be well to have the second bag so as to be able to make an exchange and to hand the bag for inspection it is a great improvement to the egg bag to have the lower portion say the last three inches of its depth made of network so that the spectators can at once see each egg as it falls into the bottom of the bag it is hardly necessary to observe that in this case the inner lining of the double side must terminate where the network commences to produce eggs from a person's mouth while upon the subject of eggs we may notice this though it has always appeared to us a rather disagreeable trick it is rarely exhibited as a separate feat but generally as a prelude to some other illusion for the performance of which three or four eggs are necessary the performer requiring eggs sends his assistant to fetch a plate on his return he places him holding the plate with both hands in front of him facing the company the performer is seen beside him and gently patting him on the head an egg is seen to appear between his lips this is taken from him and placed on the plate the performer passing behind him now stands on his other side and again patting his head another egg is produced in like manner this is repeated until the requisite number of eggs is procured the assistant as each fresh one is produced simulating increasing difficulty as though the eggs were forced up from the stomach by a powerful muscular effort this effect is produced as follows we will suppose that five eggs are to be produced one is placed beforehand in the mouth of the assistant and four more are placed in the pochettes or tucked under the waistband of the performer two on each side having placed his assistant in position the performer secretly takes one of these latter into his right hand and palms it patting the assistant on the head with his left hand he waits until the egg appears between the teeth and immediately on its appearance raises his right hand as if to receive it thus bringing up the palmed egg opposite the mouth while the egg that is already in the mouth slips back under cover of the hand out of sight the palmed egg is laid on the plate to the performer in the act of passing behind his assistant palms a second egg in his left hand 
the same pantomime is again gone through save that in this case the right hand pats the head and the left hand is held to the mouth to receive the egg after four eggs have been produced in this manner the fifth which has been all along in the mouth is produced apparently in like manner but the performer takes care that in this instance it shall be seen beyond a doubt that the egg really does come from the mouth which being manifestly the case in this instance the audience are pretty sure to jump to the conclusion that all were produced in an equally bona fide manner the pillars of solomon and the magic brattle there is a very old-fashioned apparatus sometimes called the pillars of solomon for apparently uniting a piece of cut string it consists of two slips of wood each about four inches in length by five eighths of an inch square laid side by side at about an inch from one end of each a transverse hole is bored and through this passing through both slips a string is passed and may be drawn backwards and forwards from side to side the apparatus having been shown in this condition the performer passes a knife between the two slips thus apparently dividing the string but the string is notwithstanding still drawn backward and forward through the holes as sound as ever the secret lies in the fact that the string does not in reality go straight through the two slips of wood from side to side a glance at figure 160 will enlighten the reader as to its real course instead of passing straight through from a to d as it appears to do when the two pillars are laid side by side which is the condition in which they are first exhibited to the spectators it passes down the length of the first pillar from a to b out at b and into the second pillar at c whence it passes upwards and emerges at d the passing of the knife between the two points a and d does not therefore affect the string in the least it is obvious that in this form of the apparatus the two pillars being joined by the cords at the points b and c cannot be completely separated and the fact of their always being kept close together at the lower end is quite sufficient to betray to an acute observer the principle of the trick there is however an improved form of the same apparatus in which after the apparent cutting of the cord the two pillars are held wide apart one in each hand of the performer and yet when they are again placed side by side the string runs backwards and forwards merrily as ever the pillars are in this instance of the form shown in figure 161 they are about six inches in length of light and elegant shape having at each end a ball or knob of about an inch and a quarter in diameter flattened on one face to allow of the pillars being laid closely side by side the cord as in the former case passes down the first pillar from a to b but instead of passing out at b it is rolled round a little pulley working in the lower knob of that pillar see figure 162 which gives a sectional view of the lower portion of each pillar a similar cord is passed down from d in the second pillar to c and is there rolled round a second pulley but in the opposite direction to that of the first cord so that if both pulleys move in the same direction the cord on the one will be wound and the cord on the other unwound each pulley is of one piece with its axis the axis of the one terminating in a little square tenon or nut and that of the other in a corresponding mortise or hollow so that when the two pillars are placed side by side their axes fit the one into the other and whichever of the two pulleys is set in motion the like movement is communicated to the other the effect of this is as follows if the cord at a be pulled it unwinds that portion of the cord which is wound on the pulley at b and by the same movement winds up the cord on the other pulley and vice versa we have omitted to mention that there is glued into a little hole on the flat side of each of the upper knobs exactly opposite the points a and b a very minute piece say an eighth of an inch in length of similar cord these greatly heightening the appearance of reality upon the apparent cutting of the cord the pillars are brought forward side by side the nut of the one pulley fitting strictly into the hollow of the other the performer shows by drawing the cord backward and forwards that it fairly traverses the two pillars from side to side taking a knife he passes it between the two pillars and to all appearances cuts the cord immediately taking the pillars one in each hand and showing the cut ends really the short bits on the inside to prove that it is fairly cut through again bringing the pillars together taking care that the mortise and the nut correspond as before he commands the cord to be restored and again pulls it backwards and forwards as at first some little fun may be created by placing the upper knobs of the pillars pincer fashion one on each side of a person's nose 
the cord being thus apparently made to run right through the nose an air of greater probability may be given to this curious effect by first piercing the nose with a magic bradawl this is in appearance an ordinary bradawl but the blade is so arranged as to recede into the handle on the slightest pressure again reappearing being in fact forced forward by a spiral spring in the handle as soon as the pressure is removed a duplicate bradawl of ordinary make is first handed round for examination and the trick bradawl being adroitly substituted the performer proceeds therewith to bore a hole through the nose of any juvenile volunteer who will submit to the operation holding a piece of cork on one side of the nose he apparently thrusts the awl through the nose the sinking of the blade into the handle exactly simulating the effect of a genuine perforation some performers make use of a sponge moistened with some liquid resembling blood by which a little pressure is made to trickle down from the imaginary wound but this is a piece of realism which we think is better omitted the nose being thus apparently pierced the imagination of the spectators is in a measure prepared to accept the phenomenon of the restored cord running through it as already described the magic coffers these are round tin boxes japanned to taste and made generally about five inches in depth by three in diameter though they are sometimes larger the only specialty about them is a movable portion a which may either be removed with the lid or left upon the box according as the lid is lifted with or without lateral pressure this movable portion is bottomed with a grating of parallel wires an eighth of an inch apart the coffers are generally worked in pairs the effect produced by them being the apparent transmission of the contents of the one to the other and vice versa they may be worked with various articles for our present purpose we will suppose that the performer desires to change white haricot beans to coffee berries both of which suit the apparatus very well he beforehand fills the one coffer with beans and the movable compartment belonging to it with coffee berries doing exactly the reverse as to the second coffer the coffers are now brought forward and the performer removing the lids with the movable compartments allows the spectators to satisfy themselves that each coffer is full to the bottom and that the contents are nothing more or less than what they appear to be this being established he returns to his table and again puts the lids on the coffers taking care that that which contains the beans shall be placed on the coffer containing the coffee berries and vice versa he now requests two of the younger spectators to step forward and assist him with the trick a couple of volunteers having been procured they are made to salute the audience and are then seated upon chairs at each side of the stage each being entrusted with one of the coffers which that all may see they are requested to hold with both hands above their heads the performer standing between them says now young gentlemen i must caution you to hold tight or the electrical forces which are rapidly generating in these magic coffers will carry them clean away and possibly you along with them now first please tell me just to start fair which coffer is it that you have got sir the one with the beans or the one with the coffee berries the chances are ten to one against the extempore assistance remembering which was which and the majority of the audience will be equally uncertain the professor pretends surprise and disappointment ladies and gentlemen you cannot possibly appreciate the beauty of these philosophical experiments unless you follow them carefully from the commencement i will open the coffers once more so saying he opens first the one coffer and then the other taking care however to lift the lids only so that the one which really contains the coffee berries shows the layer of beans and that which contains the beans the layer of coffee berries in each case he takes up a handful and lets them flow back from his hand into the coffer the better to impress upon the audience the contents of each finally placing a bean in the hands of the youth who holds the supposed coffer of beans and a berry in the hands of the holder of the supposed coffee berries Again closing the lids, he requests the person holding the bean to throw it into the closed coffer held by the other. The juvenile, looking foolish, replies that it can't be done, and a similar reply is received from the youth holding the other coffer. The performer, addressing the company, asks someone else to make the attempt, but equally without success. He continues, Gentlemen, among this large and brilliant audience not one person can be found who will undertake to throw this little bean into one of those coffers imagine then the difficulty of passing the whole of the beans which this coffer contains into the other not dropping even one on the way and at the same moment transferring the whole of the berries in this coffer into that which a moment before was full to the brim with beans 
but it must be done. Young gentlemen, will you be kind enough to repeat with me one, two, three? At the word three, by the way, you had better close your eyes, or they might possibly be injured by the shower of beans and berries. Are you ready, Mr. Beans? Are you ready, Mr. Berries? Now then, one, two, three. Did you feel them pass? I hope they did not hurt you. Now let us once more open the coffers. I have kept my word, you see. Mr. Beans has the coffee berries, and Mr. Berries has the beans. Will you please step forward and show the company that the coffers are, as at the first, full to the very bottom? The lids containing the movable compartments he meanwhile places carelessly upon his table. Some performers make the change more than once, and it is obvious that the contents of the coffers may be made to apparently change places any number of times. If this is done, however, the secret of the false tops is apt to be suspected. Whereas, in the method above described, the audience have, as they believe, proved the coffers full to the bottom, both before and after the trick, and this greatly increases the difficulty of accounting for the transposition. The object of having the false tops bottomed with open wire work, instead of with tin, is to be prepared for the expression of a suspicion on the part of the audience as to the existence of a false top. In such case, the performer, borrowing a penknife, passes it well down through the upper layer of beans, etc., and through the wire work, thus proving apparently that the coffer is open to the bottom. In the trick as above described, however, the expression of such a suspicion is a very remote contingency. The trick is sometimes performed with sweet meats in one or both of the coffers, and in this form has an added charm for a juvenile audience who complete the trick by swallowing that portion of the apparatus. End of section 35. Section 36 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic, a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Miscellaneous Tricks, Part 3. The Bran and Orange Trick. This trick is performed with a single coffer, in appearance very similar to those used in the last trick, but slightly different in construction. The false top is, in this case, bottomed with plain tin. The bottom of the coffer is movable, being soldered to a circular rim or shoulder of tin about a quarter of an inch in depth, over which the coffer fits pretty tightly, though the projecting edge of the bottom enables the performer to remove it without difficulty. The performer must also be provided with an ordinary oblong wooden box. Its precise dimensions are unimportant, save that it should be a good deal larger than the coffer, but about an inch or so less in height. This box is filled with bran, as also is the false top of the coffer. A couple of oranges, as much alike as possible, must also be provided. One only of these is produced to the audience, the other being beforehand placed on the servant of the table. The performer begins by placing upon the table the coffer and the box of bran. Removing the lid, with the false top, he brings forward the coffer and shows that it is perfectly empty. In returning to his table, he loosens, though without removing, the movable bottom and replaces the coffer on the table. He next brings forward the box of bran, showing that there is no preparation about it, and in replacing it on the table, places it in front of the coffer, which, however, being the taller, remains visible behind it. He next introduces the orange, either palming it, from one of his pochettes, and magically producing it from some person's nose or whiskers, or by the more prosaic method of having it brought in by his assistant. He now returns to his table, and, standing behind it, proceeds to fill the coffer with bran. This he does by placing the coffer upright in the box, holding it with one hand, and ostentatiously pouring in bran with the other until it is full. In placing the coffer in the box, however, he takes it up quite without the bottom, so that he is, in reality, only filling an open tube. Meanwhile, he secretly picks up, with his disengaged hand, the second orange from the servant, and places it upon the bottom, which remains behind the box. 
having filled the coffer and remarking pray observe that it is quite full he before removing it from the box covers it with the lid and then lifting it out again places it behind the box in such a manner as to go neatly over the bottom and the orange upon it of course in the act of lifting the coffer all the contents run back again into the box having now got the second orange within the coffer and having by a gentle pressure again settled the bottom in its place the performer places the coffer on a second table or a chair close in front of the audience he then says i am about to order the bran with which this coffer is filled here he raises the lid without the false top and the coffer therefore appears full of bran to pass back again into the box from which it was taken and this orange here he passes behind his table and holding up the orange replaces it six or eight inches from the hinder edge to pass into the coffer in place of it now first for the bran one two three pass did you see it fly from the coffer into the box you didn't well at any rate you shall see the orange pass i take it up so here he places his two hands round it and rolls it on to the servant in manner described at page two hundred ninety four coming forward with the hands together as though still containing it and holding them over the coffer at a few inches distance and squeeze it smaller and smaller in this manner until it becomes small enough to pass right into the coffer as you see here he separates his hands showing them empty and immediately taking off the cover with the false top rolls out the orange and shows that the coffer is otherwise empty the trick as above described is susceptible of a good many variations if the performer uses a trap table the orange may be made to pass through a trap instead of being rolled off at the back of the table though the latter method if neatly executed can hardly be surpassed in elusive effect a more substantial improvement may be made by causing the bran instead of simply disappearing as above mentioned to reappear in some other quarter there are many pieces of apparatus which may be used for this purpose perhaps as good as any being the improved sweet bag see page 248 this should be previously filled with bran and hooked to the back of the table the performer in this case borrows a handkerchief which he carelessly spreads on the table and a gentleman's hat which he places mouth upwards beside it instead of announcing that the bran will return from the coffer to the box from whence it was taken he states that it will at command pass into the handkerchief which he holds and which as he speaks he picks up with the bag beneath it holding it without apparent intention just above the hat at the word pass he slightly turns his wrist thereby releasing the flap of the bag and a shower of bran is instantly seen to pour down into the hat this little addition greatly enhances the effect of the trick the rice and orange trick in this feat rice and an orange are made to change places but by wholly different means from those last above described the apparatus in this case consists of three japanned tin cones about ten inches in height by five at the base and each having a brass knob at the top and an ornamental vase of tin or zinc standing about the same height as the cones and having a simple metal cover or top of the cones all of which are open at the bottom two are hollow throughout but the third has a flap or movable partition halfway down enclosing the upper half of the internal space this flap works on a hinge and is kept shut by a little catch which is withdrawn by pressure on a little button outside the cone when the flap drops down and lets fall whatever has been placed in the enclosed space see figure 164 the cone is prepared for the trick by filling this space with rice and closing the flap and the three cones are then placed in a row on the performer's table the prepared cone being in the middle the vase see figure 165 is constructed as follows its depth inside is less by about an inch than its depth outside leaving therefore between its true and false bottoms an empty space a 
a circular hole is cut in the inner or false bottom, but this hole, in the normal condition of the vase, is kept closed by a circular disc of metal, B, exactly fitting it. This disc is soldered upon an upright wire rod, passing through the foot of the apparatus, and terminating in another disc, C, somewhat smaller in size. Round this rod is a spiral spring, whose action tends to press it down, and thereby to keep the disc or valve normally closed, though it rises and thereby opens the valve, as shown by the dotted lines in the figure, whenever upward pressure is applied to C. The face of the upper disc, B, is slightly concave, corresponding with the rest of the interior of the vase. The vase is prepared for the trick by placing an orange in it, and in this condition it is brought forward and placed on the table by the performer or his assistant. A small paper bag full of rice is brought in at the same time and completes the preparations. With this introduction, we proceed to describe the trick as worked by Herman. The performer begins by borrowing two hats and places them one on the other, the mouths together, on a chair or table. He then, by palming, produces an orange from the hair or whiskers of a spectator and places this on another table. He next brings forward and exhibits the vase, filling it as he advances with rice from the paper bag, and thus concealing the orange which is already placed therein. He calls attention to the genuineness of the rice and the simplicity of the cover, and finally putting on the latter, places the vase on the ground or elsewhere in view of the audience. He pretends a momentary hesitation as to where to place it, and in the slight interval during which he is making up his mind, he presses up the button within the foot. This opens the valve, allowing the rice to escape into the space A, and leaving the orange again uncovered. The audience is, of course, unaware that such a change has taken place. Leaving the vase for the moment, he requests the audience to choose one or other of the three cones on the table. The choice almost always falls on the middle one, which, it will be remembered, contains the concealed rice. This he places on the top of the upper hat. He next asks the audience to select one or other of the remaining cones, and places this over the orange upon the table, showing by rattling his wand within it that it is hollow throughout, and, if desired, handing round the remaining one for inspection. At this point we hasten to anticipate an objection which will probably occur to the reader. We have said that the audience, when called upon to choose one of the three cones, almost always select the middle one, and we have proceeded on the assumption that they do so. But suppose, says the acute reader, that they don't choose the middle one, but select one of the end ones. The trick is spoiled, as neither of the others will produce the rice. By no means, O oh acute reader, if we had requested the audience to choose which of the cones should be placed upon the hat, there might have been a little difficulty, no doubt, but we did nothing of the kind. We merely asked them to choose one of the cones. If their first choice falls on one of the end ones, we hand it round for examination, and finally place it over the orange. Then, standing behind the table, we ask the audience to make their choice between the two remaining cones, right or left. Whichever is chosen, we are safe, for as we have already had occasion to explain, in connection with the trick of the half-crown in the orange, see page 171, the right of the audience is our left, and vice versa, so that by taking their reply in the sense which suits our purpose, we are certain to be right. We therefore, in any case, take the cone containing the rice as being the one designated, and place this on the hat, sending round the other for inspection. As the audience have, to all appearance, been allowed perfect freedom of choice, and have actually examined two out of the three cones, they are very unlikely to suspect any preparation about the remaining one. The trick is now all but complete. Once more, the performer raises the cone placed on the hat, to show that there is nothing underneath it, and as he replaces it, presses the button, thereby letting the flap fall, and the rice pour out upon the hat, 
though it remains still concealed by the cone. He next lifts up the cone under which is the orange, and holding the latter up, replaces it, but in again covering it with the cone, makes a feint of removing and slipping it into his pocket. Then noticing, or pretending to notice, a murmur on the part of the company, he says, Oh, you think I took away the orange, but I assure you I did not. The company being still incredulous, he again lifts the cone and shows the orange. Here it is, you see, but as you are so suspicious, I won't use the cover at all, but leave the orange here in full view on the table. He again places the orange on the table, but this time on what is called a wrist trap. Leaving it for the moment, he advances to the vase, and holding his hands together cup-fashion over it, but without touching it, he says, I take out the rice, so, and pass it under this cover. Walking towards the cone on the hat, and making a motion of passing something into it. Let us see whether it has passed. He raises the cover, and the rice is seen. Perhaps you think, as you did not see it, that I did not actually pass the rice from the vase to the cover. At any rate, you will not be able to say the same about the orange. I take it up, before your eyes, so. He places his hands round it on the table, and at the same moment presses the lever of the trap, which opens, and lets it fall through the table, closing again instantly. Keeping his hands together, as though containing the orange, he advances to the vase, and, holding his hands over it, says, Here is the orange which has not left your sight, even for a single moment. I gently press it so, bringing the hands closer and closer together, and make it smaller and smaller, till it is reduced to an invisible powder, in which state it passes into the vase. He separates his hands, and shows them empty, and then, opening the vase, rolls out the orange, and shows the vase empty, all the rice having disappeared. The mechanism of the wrist trap will be explained in the next chapter. If the performer does not possess a trap table, he can cause the orange to disappear in the manner referred to at page 337. The Magic Whistle The student will not have proceeded far in his magical experience, before he meets with an often recurring nuisance, in the person of some individual, old or young, who knows, or pretends to know, the secret of all his tricks, and whose greatest delight it is, by some mal apropos question or suggestion, to cause the performer embarrassment. The magic whistle is especially designed to punish, and if possible, to silence an individual of this kind. It is of turned boxwood, and of the shape shown in figure 166, and yields a shrill and piercing note. The performer, bringing it forward and blowing through it, announces that this little whistle, so simple in appearance, has the singular faculty of obeying his will, and of sounding or not sounding at his command alone. The loquacious gentleman is pretty sure to question the fact, or is on some pretense selected to make trial of its truth. The performer places him directly facing the audience, and after himself once more sounding the whistle, hands it to him in order to try his skill. He blows vigorously, but in vain. Not a sound can he produce, but his mouth and lips gradually become obscured with a white or black dust. He finally retires to his seat amid the laughter of the audience, and generally much less disposed to make himself prominent during the remainder of the evening. The secret lies in the fact that there are two whistles. One is a perfectly ordinary instrument, but the other, though similar in appearance, does not sound, but is perforated round the inner side of the head, see the figure, with a number of small holes. The head unscrews, and is beforehand filled with finely powdered chalk or charcoal, which, when the whistle is blown, is forced through the holes and settles round the mouth of the victim. With the present knowledge of the reader, the necessary exchange of the two whistles will not be regarded as offering any difficulty. There is a larger appliance for the same purpose in the shape of a flagellet, another apparatus of like effect, though differing a little in detail, is called the magic mill. 
This is a little mill of the form shown in figure 167, and five or six inches in height. It is made of zinc or tin, and consists of two portions, the upper part A and the base B. See figure 168. The former sliding over the latter, as shown by the dotted lines in figure 167, and fitting easily upon it. A is hollow throughout. Lowercase a and bb are hollow tubes open at each end, a third little tube, lowercase c, springing at right angles from lowercase a. The base, big b, is a hollow chamber, closed on all sides save at the openings lowercase d and ee. -E. This chamber is beforehand fitted with powdered chalk or charcoal, after which a is placed in position over it. If, under these circumstances, any person blows smartly through the tube lowercase a, the effect will vary according to the position of uppercase b within uppercase a. If b be so turned that the three holes d and e e correspond with tubes a and b b, the breath entering a d will force out the contents of uppercase b through the tubes b b and powder the lips of the person blowing, as in the case of the magic whistle. But if, on the contrary, uppercase B be turned ever so little to the right or left, the three openings in B no longer corresponding with the tubes, the latter will be closed, and the breath having no other outlet will be forced upwards through the upright tube C, thereby setting the little vein of F in rapid motion. The latter is the condition in which the apparatus is brought forward by the performer. Blowing through A, he sets the mill in motion, and invites others to do likewise, in which, of course, they succeed without difficulty, but when the turn of the intended victim arrives, the performer gives A a slight twist around, in such manner as to bring the openings of B in correspondence with the three tubes, with the result already explained. We have omitted to mention that there is on the under surface of uppercase B a little raised point corresponding in position with the opening lowercase d, so that the performer is able to tell instantly by feel whether b is or is not in the required position. As a matter of convenience, we shall, before proceeding further with the explanation of individual tricks, describe two or three pieces of apparatus of general utility, to one or other of which we shall have frequent occasion to subsequently refer. The drawer box. This is a piece of apparatus of very frequent use in the magic art. In appearance, it is an ordinary drawer, with an outer box or case of walnut or mahogany, see figure 169, and is made of various dimensions according to the size of the articles with which it is intended to be used, and which may range from a pack of cards to a live rabbit. Its use is to produce or to cause the disappearance of a given article the drawer having the faculty of appearing full or empty at pleasure. The first step towards the comprehension of the apparatus will be to completely take out the drawer, which, however, even when removed, does not at first sight indicate any specialty. On a closer examination, it will be found that the drawer is in reality double, see figure 170, consisting of two parts, A and B, the latter sliding backwards and forwards freely within the former, which is, in fact, a mere case or shell open at one end. If any object, suppose an orange, be placed in B, and A and B together be placed in the outer case, it is obvious that, upon drying out A, B will come with it, and the orange will be seen. But if B be held back, A will be drawn out alone, and the apparatus will be apparently empty. For the means of retaining A at pleasure, it will be necessary to examine the outer case, which will be found to have a groove or mortise cut in its under surface, see figure 171, along which lies a spring or tongue of wood, fixed by a screw at one end, the other, or free end, being provided with a catch or stud, C, which, upon pressure, is forced through an opening in the bottom of the outer case, and made to sink into a little hole or notch in the bottom of B, 
being again withdrawn by the action of the spring as soon as the pressure is removed. The bottom of the outer case is covered with velvet, ostensibly as a finish, but really to conceal the wooden tongue. When it is desired to draw out A without B, the apparatus is held as shown in figure 171, and a gentle pressure applied by the finger through the velvet upon the free end of the wooden tongue, thus forcing the catch upwards, and keeping B back. If A be drawn out without this pressure, B will come with it. The upper edge of A is turned over all round, so that a casual observer is not likely to detect any difference in the thickness of the sides of the drawer, whether it is drawn out with or without its inner casing. Some drawer boxes have a different arrangement for holding back the inner drawer, consisting of a little wire bolt lying loosely in a cylindrical cavity in the hinder end of B, corresponding with a similar cavity in the side of the outer case. As long as the drawer box is kept in its normal position, this pin offers no obstacle to the withdrawal of B with A. But if the box be turned over on the side in which is the bolt, the latter drops partially into the hole in the outer case, thus bolting B to it, until, by again turning over the apparatus, the bolt is made to drop back again into its original position. The arrangement is rather difficult to explain in writing, but will become quite clear upon an examination of figures 172 and 173, both representing a section of the hinder end of the drawer box, the one on its upright and the one on its turned over position. The necessary turning over of the box is plausibly accounted for by the performer's desire that the audience shall, for greater fairness, have a full view of the top of the apparatus. There is an ingenious addition sometimes found in drawer boxes of French make, whereby B may be at pleasure bolted to A, and the two may thus be handed for examination, with little chance of their secret being detected. The bolting and unbolting is effected by a slight movement up or down of the knob in front, thereby raising or depressing a kind of hook of bent tin, working in the thickness of the front of A. Figure 174 shows this hook in its raised or unhooked, and figure 175 in its depressed or hooked condition. The drawer box, as above described, is available to produce or disappear, but not to change articles. With a slight modification, however, it may be made available for changing also. The inner drawer B is in this case made only half the depth of A, or even less, and thus, when closed, there is left between the bottom of B and that of A a considerable space, so that A and B may in this case each be made to hold a given object, and an apparent transformation be effected. Thus, for instance, B may be filled with bran, and any small article, such as a borrowed pocket handkerchief, be placed in A. The drawer is first pulled out with B, and shown filled to the brim with bran. But on being closed and again reopened, without B, the bran is apparently transformed into the handkerchief. End of section 36「Section 37 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic, a Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Miscellaneous Tricks, Part 4. Another modification of the drawer box is known as the Dissecting Drawer Box. This is, in general appearance, not unlike the ordinary drawer box already described, but with this difference, that the outer case has a raised top, somewhat of a sarcophagus shape. See figure 176. The drawer is partially drawn out to show that it is empty, is again closed, and on being once more drawn out, proves to be full to the brim with flowers. These having been distributed, the performer, to prove the perfect emptiness of the apparatus, not only takes the drawer completely out, but takes the outer case, which is constructed accordingly, the sides, top and bottom being hinged to the back, 
apart, as shown in figure 177. Notwithstanding this, upon again reconstructing the case, and replacing and reopening the drawer, it is once more found filled with flowers. The reader, being acquainted with the ordinary drawer box, will have no difficulty in accounting for the first harvest of flowers, but the second may possibly puzzle him a little. The secret lies in the top of the outer case, which, as we have already mentioned, is slightly pyramidal in form, allowing a considerable space between its inner and outer surface, and in this space is packed the second supply of flowers. This space is closed on its underside by a flat wooden slab, A, of the same area as the inside of the drawer, held in position by a thin wooden slip or bead at either end. The hindmost of these beads, B, is so arranged as to yield to pressure, and, when the drawer is pushed slightly in, gives way just enough to release the slab before mentioned, which thereupon falls flat upon the bottom of the drawer, and upon it the hitherto concealed flowers, which, spreading as they fall, completely fill the drawer. THE CHANGING CARD DRAWER This is a smaller variety of the drawer box, designed specially for use in card tricks. The inner drawer is just large enough to contain a pack of cards, which may thus be produced or vanished by its means. Between the bottoms of the true and false or outer drawer is a space of about an eighth of an inch. This makes the apparatus available not only to produce or vanish, as above mentioned, but to transform one card into another. The card to be changed is for this purpose placed in the outer drawer, which, when closed, carries it under the bottom of the inner drawer, and in this latter is placed the card for which it is to be changed, or vice versa. There is an improved form of the card drawer, with a double change, effected on the principle of the dissecting drawer box. This is just as above described, with the addition that when the two drawers are pressed smartly home, the action releases a thin slab of wood forming apparently part of the inner surface of the case, and exactly equal in area to the bottom of the inner drawer, into which it falls. When required for use, a card is placed above this slab, which, falling when required, covers the card already in the box, and exhibits instead that which has been concealed above it, as in the case of the changing card boxes, described in the chapter devoted to card tricks. The uses of such an apparatus will be obvious, but we will describe, by way of illustration, one very good trick which may be performed with it. The apparatus is prepared beforehand by placing a given card, say the knave of spades, above the movable slab, and another, say the eight of diamonds, in the outer drawer. The performer invites two persons to each draw a card, and forces upon them the knave of spades and the eight of diamonds. The cards being replaced in the pack, he, if he has used an ordinary pack, brings them to the top by the pass, and palms them, or if he has used a forcing pack, exchanges that pack for an ordinary one from which those two cards have been removed. Leaving the pack on the table, he exhibits the card drawer, taking out both drawers together, and showing, apparently, that case and drawer are absolutely empty. Closing the drawer, he announces that he will make the drawn cards leave the pack and pass into the drawer. One of the cards, the eight of diamonds, is named, and pulling out this time the outer drawer only, he shows that it contains that card, which is taken out and handed to the person who drew it. Again the drawer is closed, being this time pushed sharply home. The second card, the knave, being now named, the drawer is again opened, and this card shown, the drawer being again taken wholly out, and the drawer and case turned in all directions for inspection, as before, the operator only taking care to hold the drawer with one finger inside, that the movable slab may not, by falling out, betray its presence. Changing Caddies These are of various kinds. We will begin with the simplest, thence proceeding to the more complicated. 
The conjurer's caddy, in its most elementary form, is an oblong box about six inches in length by five in height and four in width. See figure 178. One half of its interior, which is divided into two compartments by a transverse bar across the top, is occupied by a drawer or movable compartment so arranged as to slide freely backwards and forwards from end to end, according as the caddy is allowed to slope in one direction or the other. See figures 179 and 180. Each compartment has its own lid, the caddy sometimes, but not always, having an outer lid in addition. We will suppose that it is desired to produce any article from the caddy, first shown empty. The article in question, say an egg, hard-boiled for safety, is beforehand placed in the movable compartment, which we will suppose to occupy for the time being the space under lid A, as shown in figure 179. The performer takes off the opposite lid B, and shows the space beneath empty. Before removing the second lid, he slopes the caddy in the opposite direction, so as to bring the movable compartment under lid B, see figure 180, and thus is enabled to show the space under A also empty. He then proceeds with the trick, and at the right moment produces the article from the caddy. It is obvious that the caddy above described is only available for appearances and disappearances, and not for transformations. To obviate this defect, the majority of caddies are now made with three compartments, see figure 181, with a sliding drawer occupying two of them. The caddy in this form may be used to change objects in the manner following. The sliding drawer being as shown in figure 181, the article to be ultimately produced, say an orange, is placed in B. The three compartments are now shown empty, beginning with C, and allowing the sliding drawer to assume the position shown in figure 182, before in turn uncovering A and B. The article to be changed, say a watch, is now placed openly in compartment B. The performer closes the lid, and, after a moment's interval, reopens it, but in that interval slopes the caddy so as to again bring the sliding drawer into the position shown in figure 181, when the orange is again brought under B, and, on removing the lid, is disclosed. To show that the watch has really disappeared, the caddy may again be shown, apparently empty, in the same manner as at first. There are a good many varieties of caddies made. One is known as the skeleton caddy, from the fact that the bottom is made to take out, so that the company can look through all three compartments. The sliding drawer in this case is bottomless, and is so arranged as only to slide when the performer releases it by pressing upon a particular spot in the ornamental molding round the bottom of the caddy. This pressure withdraws a little pin, which normally rests in a little hole in the side of the sliding drawer, and thus renders it for the time being a fixture. In some caddies, again, the sliding drawer does not run up and down by its own weight, but is moved backwards and forwards from below by means of a projecting pin passing through a slit in the bottom of the caddy. The caddy in this case does not require to be inclined one way or the other, and is on this account preferred by many to the other make. The trick next described will introduce to the reader a changing caddy of another and special construction. The Magic Vase and Caddy To make peas change places with a handkerchief. For this trick, two special pieces of apparatus are necessary. The first is a tin vase, of the shape shown in figure 183, and generally of about ten inches in height. It consists of three parts, the vase proper A, the cover B, and a movable compartment or well C, which is constructed upon a principle which we have had frequent occasion to notice, the cylindrical portion of A passing between the inner and outer wall of this movable compartment. It is colored exactly similar to that portion of A which it covers, which therefore looks exactly the same to the ordinary spectator, 
whether C be in its place or removed. The internal depth, however, of C is little more than half as deep as that of the actual vase, A. The cover B exactly fits over C, and by means of a little appliance called a bayonet catch, will either lift C with it when removed, or release C and leave it upon A. As this bayonet catch is of constant use in magical apparatus, it will be desirable to describe it somewhat minutely. A rectangular cut or slit, see the enlarged view in figure 184, is made in the lower edge of the cover B. Its perpendicular arm is about a quarter of an inch in length, and its width about an eighth of an inch. A small pin or stud, about an eighth of an inch in length, projects perpendicularly from the lower edge of C, at such a height that when B is placed over C, the upper or horizontal arm of the slit shall be just level with it. If the upright arm of the slit be brought immediately over this pin, the latter will, as the cover sinks down, travel upward along the opening as far as the junction with the transverse portion of the slit. If the cover be now again lifted, the pin will, of course, offer no obstruction to its removal. But if the cover be first slightly turned to the right, the pin will become engaged in the transverse portion of the slit, and upon then lifting the cover, it will carry with it the pin and all connected with it. When it is desired to lift off the cover alone, it will only be necessary to turn the cover a little to the left, thus bringing the pin again over the upright portion of the slit. The second piece of apparatus is a caddy, figure 185 in appearance not unlike an ordinary tea caddy, with three equal-sized compartments, each having its own lid. Upon close inspection, it will be discovered that the internal depth of these compartments is somewhat shallow in comparison with the external measurement of the caddy, leaving a space about an inch deep between the inner and outer bottoms. A sliding drawer, working from end to end of the caddy, as already explained, occupies the space of two compartments. Supposing this for the moment removed, it would be found that the external caddy, in the space occupied by the two end compartments, A and C, has a false bottom covering the hollow space we have already mentioned, but that the space occupied by the middle compartment, B, has none. Of the two movable compartments, which together constitute the sliding tray already mentioned, see figure 186, the one D has a bottom, the other E has not. When the sliding drawer is in its proper position in the caddy, and is pushed as far as it will go towards the one or the other end, the result is as follows. If it is pushed to the right, the bottomless compartment E occupies the space at that end, under lid C, while the opening in the false bottom of the caddy is for the time being closed by the bottom of D, which now occupies the middle space. If the sliding tray is pushed to the opposite end, i.e. to the left, D will occupy the space A at that end, while the bottomless compartment E, being over the opening, gives access to the space beneath. The caddy is prepared for the purpose of the trick by placing in the space between the true and false bottoms a white handkerchief, and the sliding tray is then pushed to the right, so as to bring compartment D to the middle, and thus close the opening. The vase is prepared by filling both divisions with peas. The two pieces of apparatus having been placed on the table by the assistant, the performer opens the caddy, and taking off the lids of the three divisions, and holding it with his fingers inside the right-hand end, thereby preventing any possibility of the tray shifting, brings it forward to the audience, and passing rapidly in front of them, begs to introduce to their notice an old tea caddy, in which he has accidentally discovered some curious magical properties. In the present condition of the caddy, all three compartments appear exactly alike, and of equal depth and the interior being of a dead black, the spectators are not likely to notice that they are somewhat shallow. Again closing the lids and replacing the caddy on the table, he next draws attention to the vase. 
taking off the cover without the movable compartment, and holding it upside down, he pours the piece contained in the upper compartment, which should not be quite full, into the cover, and back again two or three times, finally offering a handful for inspection. He then borrows a lady's handkerchief, which should as nearly as possible resemble the substitute hidden in the caddy. He asks permission to place it, for the purpose of the trick, in the vase. This is, of course, readily granted, but the peas are in the way. After a moment's pretended hesitation, he says, Well, I will put them in the caddy. Pray observe that I really do so. So saying, he pours them into D, which, it will be remembered, is for the time being the center compartment, leaving that compartment uncovered so that they may remain visible to all. He then places the handkerchief in the apparently empty vase, which he closes and places on the table. He continues, You have all seen me place the handkerchief in the vase, and the peas in the caddy. Now I will show you a very curious experiment. Perhaps some scientific gentleman among the audience will explain how the effect is produced, for I confess that though I have performed this trick some scores of times, I am not quite certain myself as to the reason of the phenomenon. Let me beg you once more to assure yourselves that these are genuine peas, real commonplace peas at tuppence a pint, with no nonsense about them. As he says this, he passes along the front rank of the spectators, exhibiting the peas in the caddy, and occasionally taking out a handful and offering them for closer inspection. As he reaches the end of the line, he says, You are all thoroughly satisfied that these are genuine peas, and that the lady's handkerchief is in the vase upon the table. Quite right. Now observe, I don't even touch the vase, and yet, at the word of command, the handkerchief shall pass into the caddy which I hold in my hand. Pass! During the last few words, and holding the caddy for an instant with the lid towards the audience, so as to screen his hand, he has pushed the sliding tray to the left, so that D, containing the peas, now occupies the end space, while the bottomless compartment E has taken its place in the middle. Dipping down through this compartment into the hollow space beneath, he takes out the substitute handkerchief. My commands are obeyed. Here is the handkerchief. But where are the peas? Probably, as the handkerchief has taken the place of the peas, the peas have taken the place of the handkerchief. Let us see." He uncovers the vase, lifting this time with the cover the removable compartment containing the real handkerchief. Yes, here are the peas, right enough, shaking the vase and taking them up by handfuls to show them. He continues, Now I dare say this seems very surprising to you, but in truth it is comparatively simple. The real difficulty begins when you try to make the handkerchief and the peas travel back again to their original situation. This part of the experiment is so difficult that I always feel a little nervous over it, but I must make the attempt. Pushing the substitute handkerchief openly down to the position it originally occupied, he takes the opportunity, in carrying the caddy back to the table, to slide back the tray as at first and, after a little more talk, shows that the peas have returned to the caddy, and, lifting the cover alone from the vase, produces therefrom the genuine handkerchief. The Cover to Pick Up Any Article This, called in French, ramasse tout, is a brass cover of six to ten inches in height, and of the shape shown in figure 187. Within it works backwards and forwards on a spring hinge, a kind of scoop, pressing, when at rest, against the side of the cover, as in figure 188, but moving into the position shown in figure 189, whenever pressure is applied to the button A, again returning to its original position when such pressure is removed. The manner of using it is as follows. The performer, we will suppose, desires to cause the disappearance of an orange, in order that it, or a counterpart, may be subsequently produced in some other quarter. Placing the orange upon the table, he places the cover over it, 
pressing as he does so the button A, so as to draw back the scoop. As his hand quits the cover, the pressure being removed, the return of the spring causes the scoop to clip the orange tightly against the side of the cover, and if the cover be now lifted without pressing the button, it will carry the orange with it. If it is desired again to produce the orange, the button is pressed in the act of lifting the cover, which then leaves the orange on the table. It is hardly necessary to observe that the cover is always lifted perpendicularly, so that the spectator cannot see the interior. It is well to be provided with a second similar cover, in external appearance, but without any mechanism. This may be handed round for inspection, and afterwards secretly exchanged for the mechanical cover. End of section 37「Section 38 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic, a Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Miscellaneous Tricks, Part 5. The Changing Cover. This cover is available not only, as in the last case, to produce or vanish, but also to change one article for another. It is somewhat of the pattern of an ordinary round dish cover, with a metal knob on the top. See figure 190. It is divided by a vertical tin partition A, see figure 191, into two equal compartments B and C. The lower, or open side of each of these compartments, is of course semicircular. A flat tin plate D, also semicircular, works on an upright axis E, passing upwards through the centre of the cover, and terminating in the knob at the top. By turning, therefore, this knob, halfway round to the right or left, the performer is enabled to close whichever of the compartments happens for the time being to be open, at the same time opening that which was previously shut. There is a little point, or stop, on the upper side of the semicircular plate, which meeting resistance from the vertical partition, prevents the plate making more than the necessary half-turn either way. The apparatus is prepared by placing the article representing the result of the supposed transformation, say an apple, in either compartment, and turning the knob so as to close that compartment, and open the other. The article to be changed, say an orange, is placed upon the table, and the performer places the cover upon it, taking care that the open compartment for the time being shall come fairly over it. He then gives a half turn to the knob, thereby closing the compartment which has hitherto been open, and securing the orange within it, and at the same time releasing the apple, into which, on the cover being again raised, the orange appears to be transformed. In this case, as in the last, it is well to have a plain counterpart cover to hand round for inspection if necessary. The uses to which the changing cover may be put are very numerous. The following is an instance of a rather original application of it, which produces a capital effect. We will suppose that the performer has executed a trick in which he has availed himself of the assistance of some juvenile member of the audience, and that an apple has been one of the properties of the trick. The trick being concluded, the professor asks his temporary assistant whether he would like to have the apple, and is of course eagerly answered in the affirmative. Very well, says the professor, you shall have it, but you must first earn it by a little display of dexterity. I will put it under this cover. He suits the action to the word. Now I am going to say one, two, three. At the word three, I shall raise the cover, and you must try to snatch the apple before I replace it. If you can catch the apple in this manner three times in succession, it is yours, but on one further condition, that you eat it at once here upon the stage. The conditions are readily accepted. One, two, three, cries the professor, raising the cover and disclosing the apple, which is instantly snatched up. A second time the process is gone through with a like result. You mean to win, I can see, remarks the performer. 
Now once more, and the apple will be yours. But I warn you, I shall be rather quicker this time. One, two, three. The eager boy springs forward, and clutches, not the apple, but a Spanish onion, which has been placed in the second compartment of the cover. You have won, sir, says the professor, pretending not to notice the change. But don't forget the second part of your bargain. You are to eat it at once before leaving the stage. We will leave to the imagination of the reader the discomfiture of the victim and the amusement of the spectators, also the subsequent magical processes by which the transformed apple may be restored to its original and more fragrant condition. The Changing Ladle This is a piece of apparatus designed for secretly obtaining possession of a chosen card or a piece of writing. The bowl, so to speak, of the ladle is in the form of a segment of a cylinder, see figure 192, the size of its opening being about four inches by two and a half, and its depth three inches. It is made of tin, with a thin cylindrical handle. The edges of the bowl are turned inwards all round, to the extent of about a sixteenth of an inch, thereby serving to disguise a movable slab of tin, A, which moves backwards and forwards like the leaf of a book within the ladle, working upon a hinge at its lower edge. This is made to work backwards and forwards by a wire rod passing through the whole length of the handle, and terminating in a little knob or cap at its outer end. The normal position of A is to lie against the inner or handle side of the bowl, see figure 193, being retained in that position by the effect of a spiral spring in the handle, which draws the wire back. If, however, pressure be applied to the knob or cap at the end of the handle, the wire is forced downwards, thereby bringing the movable leaf A against the outer side of the bowl, as shown in figure 194. There are various modes in which the changing ladle may be made useful. For example, it may be used to burn and restore a card. For this purpose, the ladle is prepared by placing in it beforehand any indifferent card of similar pattern to the pack in use, and is in this condition placed on the performer's table in such a manner that the spectators may not observe that there is already a card in it. The performer then comes forward and hands to one of the company a pack of cards, with a request that he will select any one he pleases. While he is making his selection, the performer or his assistant places on the table and sets fire to some spirits of wine on a bowl or plate. A card having been chosen, the performer requests the drawer to return it to him, and, in order to exclude the possibility of any exchange or sleight of hand, volunteers to receive it at arm's length in the ladle, which he brings forward for that purpose, holding it by the extreme end of the handle, and pressing with his palm the knob at the top, thereby bringing the movable leaf into the position shown in figure 194, with the card already in it pressed flat against the outer side of the bowl, and thus completely hidden. The chosen card being placed in the ladle, the performer, in returning to his table, relaxes the pressure of his palm, thereby bringing the movable leaf back into the position of figure 193, releasing the dummy card and concealing that chosen against the inner side of the bowl. He then drops apparently the chosen, but really the substitute, card into the flames, taking care as he does so not to turn the face of the card toward the audience. The ladle, with its genuine card in it, is carried off by the assistant as having served its purpose and the chosen card is subsequently restored after any fashion which the fancy of the operator may dictate. The ladle may also be used to apparently burn and restore a paper on which one of the company has written any words or figures. In this case, a blank half-sheet of note paper, folded in four, is beforehand placed in the ladle, and a piece of paper folded in the same way is handed to one of the audience, with a request that he will write what he pleases upon it, again fold it and place it in the ladle. It is then either apparently burned, as in the case of the card, or placed in some other apparatus, the operator making a great point of the fact that he does not touch the paper. 
as the genuine paper remains in the ladle it is of course very easy for the performer to ascertain what is written upon it and having displayed his knowledge to ultimately reproduce the paper under any circumstance which he thinks fit sometimes the trick is varied by requesting a spectator to write a question upon the paper which is subsequently reproduced with an appropriate answer written beneath the question the cone or skittle laquie this is a block of polished boxwood of the shape shown in figure one ninety five with a thin shell of the same material exactly covering it and so closely resembling it in appearance that the solid block and the hollow shell seen apart cannot be distinguished the one from the other the cone is made in various sizes from three inches in height by one and a half at the base to seven inches in height by three at the base it is worked with a paper cover consisting of an open tube of cartridge paper about double the height of the cone and tapering in such manner that its larger end shall fit loosely over the cone. The performer brings forward this paper tube in his right hand, and the cone, with the hollow shell upon it, in his left, taking care to hold his fingers beneath it in such a manner that the solid cone cannot fall out. He first calls attention to the paper tube, which the audience are allowed to examine at pleasure. When it is returned to him, he says, you are now quite satisfied that there is no preparation about this tube, which is, in fact, simply a cover for this block of wood. As if merely suiting the action to the word, he covers the block with the tube, immediately removing it again, and carelessly laying the cover on the table. In removing it, however, he grasps it with a gentle pressure, and so takes off with it the hollow shell. See figure 196 of whose existence the audience have no suspicion. He continues, Perhaps you would also like to examine the block, which you will find to be a plain, solid piece of wood without mechanism or preparation of any kind. The block having been duly examined, the supposed empty cover is placed upright upon the table, and the solid block having been disposed of by any means in the performer's power, is ordered to pass invisibly under the cover, which being raised, the hollow shell is seen, appearing to the eye of the audience to be the block itself, and to have found its way there in obedience to the performer's command. The above is the working of the cone in its simplest and barest form, but no skilled performer would dream of presenting the illusion in such a commonplace way. To make the trick effective, it should be so arranged as to make the cone apparently change places with some other article. There are many combinations which might be suggested, but we shall content ourselves with describing one or two of those in most general use. The smaller sized cones may be worked in conjunction with a goblet and ball, the same as those used for the cups and balls, in manner following. Having tendered for inspection the cone and cover as already described, and placed them on the table, the performer offers the goblet and ball in like manner for inspection. When they are returned, he places them also upon the table, a little distance apart, and meanwhile palms a second ball, which should be in readiness either on the servante or in one of his pochettes. He now places the paper cover, which it will be remembered contains the hollow shell, over the first ball on the table, pray observe he remarks that i have fairly covered over the ball here he raises and replaces the cover pressing so as to lift the shell with it and showing that the ball is still there the goblet as you have seen is perfectly empty here he raises the goblet and in replacing it introduces the second ball under it as described in the chapter devoted to the cups and balls i shall now order the ball to pass from the cover under the goblet he waves his hand from one to the other. Presto, prestissimo, pass! He raises the goblet and shows that the ball has apparently passed under it. The first ball still remaining under the paper tube, he cannot at present raise it, so proceeds rapidly to the next stage of the trick, that the omission may not be noticed. So far, he remarks, the trick is mere child's play. The real difficulty is to pass the cone under the cover in place of the ball. However, I will make the attempt. 
So saying, he picks up the cone with his right hand, and apparently transfers it to his left, really palming it, and immediately afterwards dropping his right hand to his side and getting rid of the cone into the profonde. Then, taking two or three steps away from the table, still holding the left hand as if containing the cone, and looking towards the cover, he says, one, two, three, pass, with a motion of the hand as if throwing something, immediately showing the hands empty and lifting up the cover, but this time by the top, so as not to exert any pressure against its sides, and showing the hollow shell which now conceals the ball and is taken by the spectators to be the genuine cone. We have succeeded pretty well so far, ladies and gentlemen, he remarks. It remains to be seen whether I shall be equally successful in bringing back the cone and ball to their original positions. I dare say you would all like to know how the trick is done, and therefore this time I will vary the mode of operation and make the transposition visibly. Here he drops his right hand into the profonde and secretly palms the solid cone. First the cone. He passes his right hand, keeping the back towards the audience, upwards along the cover, and, as it reaches the top, brings the cone into view. Pray once more assure yourselves that it is fair and solid. Now for the ball. He picks up the ball with his left hand, and holding it between the finger and thumb, apparently transfers it, by the pass called the tourniquet, see page 150, to the right, forthwith getting rid of it into the profonde on the left side. Pray observe that it does not leave your sight even for a moment. Then holding his hand high above the paper cover, he makes a crumbling movement with it, immediately showing it empty, and lifting the cover with a slight pressure so as to carry the shell with it, shows the ball beneath. The attention of the spectators being naturally attracted to the ball, it is an easy matter to let the hollow shell slip out of the paper cover upon the servante, and again to hand the cover for examination. Some performers, instead of using the goblet, work the small cone with the ball box, see page 296. It is obvious that the directions given above will apply only where the cone is of a size so small as to be readily palmed, in which case it is hardly conspicuous enough to be used before a large audience. Where a cone of larger dimensions is employed, it is necessary to vary the mode of operation. We shall therefore proceed to describe the trick in its stage form, as worked by Herman and other public performers. The cone in this case is about seven inches high, and is worked in conjunction with a drawer box of such a size as to contain it easily. Having handed round for inspection the cover and cone, as already described, the performer suddenly remembers that he requires an orange, which he forthwith produces from his wand. It is hardly necessary to observe that the orange is beforehand placed in readiness in one of the pochettes, and is produced from the wand in the manner described for producing a ball. See page 276. Lying down the orange on the table, he next exhibits the drawer box, taking the drawer completely out, and, after showing it on all sides, replacing it. He then covers the orange on the table with the paper cover, containing the hollow shell, and places the solid cone in the drawer box, which being of the kind described at page 345, he turns upon its side, with its top toward the audience. He meanwhile palms in his right hand, from his pocket or the servante, a second orange. He now announces that he is about to take the orange back again, which he does by passing his wand up the side of the cover, and immediately producing therefrom the second orange. He places this upon another table at a little distance, and covers it with a borrowed hat, making as he does so a feint of removing it, and slipping it into his tail pocket. He hears, or pretends to hear, someone remark that he took away the orange, and answers accordingly, Oh, you think I took away the orange? Allow me to assure you that I did nothing of the kind. He lifts up the hat and shows the orange in its place. I will cover it again, or still better, to prove that I do not take it away, I won't cover it at all, but leave it here in full view on the table. He replaces it on the table, but this time places it on what is called a wrist trap, 
in readiness for a subsequent disappearance. Having taken the orange from under the cover, he continues, I have now to make the solid block vanish from the drawer and take its place, but I shall do it this time invisibly. See, I have only to wave my wand from one to the other, and the thing is done. The drawer is empty, pulling out the false drawer only, and here is the block. He lifts the paper cover and shows the hollow shell. Now I come to the most difficult part of the trick, which is to bring both articles back to their original position. First I will take the block of wood. He covers the shell with the paper tube and makes a movement of his wand from the cover to the drawer. Pass! Let us see whether it has obeyed. He this time pulls the drawer completely out and lets the block fall heavily on the stage. Now for the orange! He places both hands round it, as if picking it up between them, and presses as he does so the spring of the trap, which opening lets the orange fall through into the table. Bringing the hands, still together, immediately above the paper cover, he rubs them together as if compressing the orange, finally separating them and showing them empty, and immediately afterwards lifting the cover with the hollow shell and showing the first orange beneath it. It will be observed that the trick above described is, in some of its parts, very similar to that described at page 337. The mechanism of the wrist trap will be found explained in the next chapter. In the meantime, the student may produce the same effect without using a trap at all, by means of the slight described at page 294. The Cone and the Bouquet This is another form of the cone trick, involving the use of rather more elaborate apparatus. The cone in this case is about five inches in height by three at the base, and tapers very slightly. It may be either of boxwood, as in the trick last described, or the block may be of any hard wood, and the hollow shell of tin to fit, each blacked and polished, so as to look exactly alike. It is used in conjunction with a paper cover as before, and two little bunches of flowers, exactly alike, and of such a size as to be just covered by the hollow shell. Each of these little bouquets is made upon a tin framework, consisting of a wire arch springing from a flat saucer-like base. See figure 197. A pedestal and cover complete the apparatus. The pedestal A, see figure 198, is cylindrical and about six inches in height by four across the top. Its upper surface consists of a circular plate of tin working up and down piston-wise on the pedestal. This is forced upwards by a spiral spring, yet yields to pressure, sinking vertically to a depth of four or five inches when necessary. The upper edge of the pedestal is slightly turned in all round, so that the top may not be pressed out altogether by the force of the spring. An outer casing of tin, B, fits over A, just so tightly as to resist the upward pressure of the spring when forced down by any object between the pedestal and this casing. The cover, C, is about double the height of A, and by means of a bayonet catch, see page 352, may be lifted off either with or without B at pleasure. The pedestal is prepared for use by removing B and placing one of the little bouquets on the top of A, then again putting on B and forcing it down into its place, when the condition of the apparatus will be as shown in section in figure 199. The wire arch prevents the flowers from being crushed out of shape by the pressure of the spring. The pedestal and cover are now brought forward and placed on the table. Also the cone, with the shell on, the paper tube to cover it, and the remaining bunch of flowers. The paper tube is first exhibited, placed over the cone, and removed with the hollow cone within it, as in the last trick. The solid cone is then offered for examination, and having been duly inspected, is placed upon the pedestal. The performer makes a movement as if about to place over it the cover C, but checks himself in the act and shows that this cover is empty and hollow throughout. He then puts on the cover, and reverting to the bunch of flowers on the table, covers it with the paper tube. 
He next announces that in obedience to his command, the block and the bunch of flowers will change places. He raises the paper tube, holding it by the top, and thus leaves behind the hollow shell, covering and concealing the bunch of flowers. He next takes off the cover of the pedestal, first, however, turning the bayonet catch, so as to lift off with the cover the casing B. The solid cone is carried off between the casing and the cover, see figure 200, while the action of the spring, the casing being removed, brings the concealed bunch of flowers to the top of the pedestal, in the position lately occupied by the cone. Having shown that the cone and the flowers have changed places, the performer next undertakes to bring them back to their original situation, which, by reversing the process, he does without difficulty. The pedestal above described is a very useful piece of apparatus, being available either to produce, change, or vanish any article of appropriate size. A very effective trick may be performed therewith by causing an empty tumbler to appear full, or vice versa. In this case, however, it should by no means be admitted that an exchange takes place, as the supposed filling of an empty glass with water by covering it with an evidently unsophisticated cover is rather the more surprising phenomenon. End of section 38「Section 39 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic, a Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring by Professor Louis Hoffman. Miscellaneous Tricks, Part 6. The Flying Glass of Water. This capital trick was, we believe, first introduced to the public by Colonel Stodare, to whom the profession is indebted for many first-class illusions. The necessary apparatus consists of a couple of ordinary glass tumblers, exactly alike, with an India rubber cover just fitting the mouth of one of them, and a colored handkerchief of silk or cotton, made double, i.e. consisting of two similar handkerchiefs sewn together at the edges, with a wire ring of the size of the rim of one of the tumblers, or a fraction larger, stitched loosely between them, in such a manner that when the handkerchief is spread out, the ring shall be in the middle. The performer, beforehand, nearly fills one of the tumblers with water, and then puts on the India rubber cover, which, fitting closely all round the edge, effectually prevents the water escaping. See figure 201. The glass, thus prepared, he places on the profonde on his right side. He then brings forward the other glass and a decanter of water, and the prepared handkerchief, and in full view of the audience, fills the glass with water up to the same height as he has already filled the one in his pocket, and hands round glass and water for inspection. When they are returned, he places the glass upon the table, a few inches from its hinder edge, and, standing behind it, covers it with the handkerchief, first spreading out and showing both sides of the latter, proving, to all appearance, that there is no preparation about it. In placing the handkerchief over the glass, he draws it across in such a manner as to bring the hidden ring as exactly as possible over the top of the glass. Then placing the left hand over the handkerchief, as shown in figure 202, he raises, apparently, the glass within the handkerchief, but really the empty handkerchief only, which is kept distended by the ring, and, at the same time, under cover of the handkerchief, gently lowers the glass of water with the other hand onto the servante. This is by no means difficult, as the pretended carefulness of the operator not to spill the water allows him to make the upward movement of the left hand as deliberate as he pleases. All that is really necessary is to take care to follow with his eyes the movement of the left hand, which will infallibly draw the eyes and the minds of the audience in the same direction. Having raised the supposed tumbler to a height of about two feet from the table, the performer brings it forward to the audience, and requests that some gentleman with a steady hand will favor him with his assistance. 
a volunteer having been found and having given satisfactory replies as to the steadiness of his nerves and the strength of his constitution generally is requested to place his hand under the handkerchief and take the glass as he proceeds to obey the performer lets go of the handkerchief with the left hand still retaining one corner with the right and lets the right arm with the handkerchief drop to his side pretending to believe that the gentleman has taken the glass and not to notice its disappearance he turns carelessly aside and brings forward a small table or chair saying put it here please looking generally somewhat foolish the victim replies that he has not got it if the performer is a good actor he may here make some fun by pretending to believe that the victim has concealed the glass and pressing him to return it at last he says well if you won't give it to me i must find it for myself and he proceeds to tap with his wand the sleeves and pockets of the unfortunate individual but without success till on touching him between the shoulders he pretends to tell by the sound that the glass is there yes here it is he remarks i am sorry to be obliged to ask you to turn your back on the company but to show them that there is no deception on my part i am compelled to do so will you please turn round for one minute on his doing so the performer again shaking out the handkerchief and showing both sides of it to prove it empty spreads it over the back of the victim again he taps with his wand which striking the ring through the handkerchief causes an unmistakable hard sound to be heard and then grasping the ring as before through the handkerchief he deliberately raises it up in a horizontal position the effect being as if the glass had again returned to the handkerchief he then says i don't think i will trouble this gentleman again he is too much of a conjurer himself then turning rapidly to the audience he says catch ladies and gentlemen and flicks the handkerchief quickly towards the spectators who duck their heads in expectation of a shower pardon me ladies i fear i alarmed you but you need not have been afraid i never miss my aim that gentleman has the glass designating any one he pleases may i trouble you to step forward one moment sir on the person indicated doing so the performer places him facing the audience and under cover of his body takes the second glass out of the profonde and throws the handkerchief over it remarking yes ladies and gentlemen here it is in this gentleman's tail pocket then taking hold of the glass with the left hand beneath the handkerchief he clips with the first finger and thumb through the handkerchief the edge of the india rubber cover thus drawing off the cover inside the handkerchief hands round the glass and water for inspection two improvements have recently been made in this trick which though trifles in themselves greatly heighten the effect upon the performance of the trick as already described it is not uncommon to find some person more acute than the average guess that there is a ring in the handkerchief the first of the improvements we have mentioned is designed to make the ring no longer a fixture and yet to ensure bringing it to the right position when necessary this is effected by stitching the two handkerchiefs together not only around the edge as already explained but also as shown by the dotted line in figure two hundred three this confines the ring to the triangular enclosure a e d within which however it is allowed to move freely not being attached to the handkerchief in any way if the handkerchief is held by the two corners a d which should be distinguished by a mark of colored silk or worsted so as to be readily identified by the performer the ring will take its proper place in the middle as shown in the figure if on the other hand the handkerchief be held by either the corners a b or c d the ring will forthwith run into the angle a d e or d a e as the case may be and the handkerchief if grasped a little below this particular corner may be twisted or pulled through the hands rope-wise proving with apparent conclusiveness that there is no ring or shape concealed in it the second improvement is to have ready on the servante a small piece of sponge recently dipped in water this is picked up by the right hand of the performer as he places the genuine glass on the servante 
when he has moved away from his table at the moment of requesting his volunteer assistant to take the glass he places the right hand for a moment under cover of the handkerchief and squeezes the sponge the water that immediately pours from it being apparently accidentally spilt and so negativing any possible doubt on the part of the spectators that the glass is really in the handkerchief with these two additions the trick is one of the most effective that can possibly be performed whether in a drawing-room or on the public stage the bowls of water and bowls of fire produced from a shawl after the explanation of the last trick the reader will form a tolerably good guess at the means of performing this which has puzzled thousands and is still one of the most popular feats in the repertoire of the conjurer the performer comes forward with a shawl in his hand which he spreads out and exhibits on both sides to show as is really the fact that there is no preparation about it the spectators being satisfied on this point and the orchestra playing the ghost melody or other appropriate accompaniment he swings the shawl about in time to the music finally throwing it over his left shoulder and arm the arm being held square before him the arm now gradually sinks down and the form of some solid object is seen defined beneath the shawl which being removed reveals a glass bowl brimming with water and with goldfish swimming about in it this is repeated a second and a third time the performer sometimes discarding the shawl and borrowing a pocket handkerchief among the audience for the production of the last bowl the bowls used are saucer shaped measuring six to eight inches in diameter and one and a half to two inches in depth each is closed by an india rubber cover after the manner of the tumbler in the last trick thus secured they are concealed about the person of the performer the precise mode of concealment varies a little where three bowls are to be produced one is generally carried beneath the coat tails in a sort of bag open at the sides suspended from the waist and the other two in pockets opening perpendicularly inside the breast of the coat or waistcoat one on each side sometimes by way of variation bowls of fire are produced the bowls are in this case of thin brass they have no covers but the inflammable material tow moistened with spirits of wine is kept in position by wires crossing the bowl at about half its depth and is ignited by a wax match struck against the inside of the bowl under cover of the shawl and immediately dropped into the bowl when the contents instantly burst into a blaze some bowls have a mechanical arrangement for igniting the tow but we ourselves much prefer the simple bowls above described it was originally the practice to throw the shawl over a small round table immediately removing it and exhibiting the bowl upon the table modern performers discard the table and produce the bowls in the midst of the audience the bowl of ink changed to clear water with goldfish swimming in it the performer brings forward a goblet shaped glass vase six or eight inches in height nearly full of ink to prove that the ink is genuine he dips a playing card into it and brings it up with the lower half stained a deep black next taking a ladle he ladles out a portion of the liquid and pours it on a plate which is handed round for inspection he next borrows a handkerchief from one of the audience and covering the base with it announces that by the exercise of his magic power he will transform the ink in the vase to water on removing the handkerchief this transformation is found to be accomplished while a couple of goldfish placidly swimming about in the bowl sufficiently prove that the trick is not performed as might be imagined by means of some chemical reagent the explanation though by no means obvious is very simple the liquid in the vase is plain water but a bottomless black silk lining fitting the vase and kept in shape by a wire ring round its upper edge gives it the appearance of ink to a spectator at a little distance in removing the handkerchief the performer clips with it the wire ring bringing away the lining within the handkerchief and revealing the clear water in the glass but the reader will naturally inquire how then are the blackened card and the genuine ink ladled out on the plate accounted for 
the blackened card though apparently an ordinary one has the same figure say a knave of diamonds on both its sides but the lower half of the one side is beforehand stained with ink the performer dips it in with the unsoiled side toward the audience but giving it a half turn as he removes it thereby brings the blackened side in front the ink poured on the plate is accounted for with equal simplicity the ladle see figure two hundred four is of tin having a hollow handle of the same metal with a minute hole opening therefrom into the bowl there is a similar small hole near to the top of the handle the bowl is beforehand filled with ink which is thence allowed to run into the handle after which the upper hole is stopped with a little pellet of wax or a small piece of paper is pasted over it by reason of a well-known natural law the liquid will not run out of the lower hole until the upper one is opened as the performer dips the ladle apparently into the ink in the bowl he scrapes off with his nail the wax or paper with which the upper hole is stopped and the ink immediately runs into the bowl whence it is poured upon the plate the inexhaustible bottle the same natural principle which prevents the ink from flowing into the bowl of the ladle until the upper hole is opened is the basis of this old but still popular trick the inexhaustible bottle though in appearance an ordinary glass bottle is in reality of tin japanned black internally it is divided into three four or five separate compartments ranged round a central space and each tapering to a narrow mouthed tube which terminates about an inch within the neck of the bottle a small pinhole is drilled through the outer surface of the bottle into each compartment the holes being so placed that when the bottle is grasped by the hand in the ordinary way see figure two hundred five each hole may be covered by one or other of the fingers or thumb the central space is left empty but the surrounding compartments are filled by means of a funnel with a very tapering nozzle with the wines or liquids expected to be most in demand or to which it is intended to limit the spectator's choice a tray full of glasses made specially of very thick glass so as to contain in reality much less than they appear to do completes the apparatus the performer comes forward with the magic bottle followed by an attendant bearing the tray of glasses he commences by openly pouring water into the bottle and out again so as indirectly to raise the inference that the bottle must be perfectly empty the water in truth really passes into the centre space only and thence runs out again as soon as the bottle is tilted the fingers meanwhile are tightly pressed on the different holes and thus excluding the air effectually prevent any premature flow of wine from the various compartments the performer still holding the bottle mouth downwards says you observe ladies and gentlemen that the bottle is now perfectly empty and yet by my magic art i shall compel it to refill itself for your benefit he then addressing various individuals asks each whether he prefers port sherry gin etc and when the answer is given has only to raise the finger stopping the air hole of that particular compartment to cause the liquid named to flow from the bottle stopping as soon as the finger is again pressed on the hole it is a good plan in order to prevent confusion to place the liquors in the bottle in alphabetical order commencing from the hole stopped by the thumb some performers increase the variety of the liquors produced by placing beforehand in certain of the glasses a few drops of various flavoring essences by this means a compartment filled with plain spirits of wine may be made to do duty for brandy whiskey etc at pleasure according to the glass into which the liquid is poured the trick is sometimes elaborated by the performer by way of conclusion apparently breaking the bottle and producing therefrom a borrowed handkerchief or other article which has been made to disappear in some previous trick this is effected by means of an additional specialty in the construction of the bottle the compartments containing the liquids in this case terminate a couple of inches above the bottom of the bottle and the part below this which has a wavy edge like fractured glass is made to slip on and off see figure two hundred six 
the performer having produced the wines pretends to crack the bottle all around by tapping it with his wand and having apparently cracked it pulls the bottom off and exhibits the handkerchief which was beforehand placed in readiness therein the two parts of the bottle joining with great nicety there is little fear that the pretended crack will prematurely attract attention where the trick is performed before a very large audience a single bottle would not contain sufficient liquor to answer all the demands upon it in this case it is necessary to change the bottle sometimes more than once in the course of the trick this is most frequently done under cover of a chair or table but where the trick is performed on a stage a more elaborate expedient is sometimes employed the bottle used has in this case an outer shell or casing of tin open at the bottom the actual receptacle for the liquids being within this when the bottle is exhausted the performer with apparent carelessness places it upon a small table standing against the side scene pending the arrival of more glasses or under any other convenient pretext the bottle is in truth placed immediately over a small round trap the performer being guided as to its proper position by a couple of small pins projecting upwards from the surface of the table against which pins he pushes the bottle the moment it is so placed the assistant behind the scenes who has his eye to a hole in the partition and his arm extended within the table opens the trap pulls down the empty interior of the bottle and instantly replaces it with a full one which he holds in readiness and at the moment when the performer again grasps the bottle to conclude the trick and thereby furnishes the necessary resistance pushes it sharply up into its place end of section 39section 40 of modern magic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by k hand modern magic a practical treatise on the art of conjuring by professor lewis hoffman miscellaneous tricks part 7 the bottle and ribbons this is another favorite bottle trick the bottle is in this case also of tin with an enclosed space round the sides to contain wine commencing about an inch and a half from the lower end and terminating just within the mouth the bottle has no bottom and there is thus a passage in the shape of an inverted funnel extending through its whole length a cylindrical base or stopper just fits into the space at the bottom of the bottle and on this are fixed six or eight small reels or bobbins on each of these is wound a yard or so of ribbon each of a different color an upright wire rod springs from the center of this base terminating just within the neck of the bottle in a little flat piece of metal perforated with as many holes as there are ribbons and one end of each of the ribbons is brought up through one of these holes and a little knot made upon it to prevent it slipping back again the ribbons being in position and the space in the bottle duly filled with wine the performer brings it forward and after pouring out a glass or two asks some lady present which is her favorite color and on receiving an answer gently taps the bottle with his wand and immediately draws out with the tip of his forefinger from the neck and presents to her a ribbon of the desired color more wine is produced alternately with fresh ribbons until all are exhausted the above is the drawing-room form of this trick upon the stage it is slightly varied the same kind of bottle is used but the internal provision of reels and ribbons is removed so that the bottle remains a simple tin bottle open at the bottom with the funnel shaped passage already mentioned extending through its entire length the performer having poured out a glass or two of wine places the bottle on a stool or table through the pillar of which is a hole or passage communicating with a corresponding hole in the stage beneath this is stationed the performer's assistant who is provided with a large number of various colored ribbons and a thin rod of three or four feet in length with a small point or blunt pin at the top the performer takes care always to repeat in an audible voice the name of the color called for this is a signal to the assistant to hitch one end of the ribbon in question on the top of the rod and hold it in readiness beneath the stage 
He does not, however, push it up through the bottle until warned by the sound of the tap of the wand on the bottle that the performer is ready to receive it. The performer, on his part, takes care, before tapping the bottle, to place his thumb upon the mouth so as to prevent the rod passing too far. Sometimes a combination of colors is asked for, as, for instance, the tricolor, or any other national group of colors. After having produced a reasonable number of ribbons, an effective finish may be made as follows. A last color or combination of colors having been demanded, the performer does not draw the ribbons, as hitherto, completely out of the bottle, but leaves them hanging down loosely on each side of it. He now announces that at the word of command, the ribbons shall, of their own accord, return into the bottle. The assistant takes his cue accordingly, and at the third tap of the wand draws the ribbons smartly down again, their instantaneous disappearance within the bottle being exceedingly effective. The New Pyramids of Egypt, or the Wine and Water Trick This trick may be very well worked in conjunction with either of the bottle tricks already described, and therefore we notice it in this place. Its effect is as follows. The performer pours out a glass of wine and a glass of water, finally transferring both to a small decanter. Placing the decanter on a small round stand, and the empty glasses on similar stands on either side of it, he covers each with a pyramidal cover, and announces that at his command the mixed wine and water will again separate, and pass into the empty glasses, the spectators being allowed to choose into which of the glasses each element shall pass. The choice having been made, he fastens a tape or ribbon to the center pyramid, and thence to each of the side ones, giving the audience to understand that by a mysterious kind of capillary attraction, the wine and water will travel along this ribbon to their respective destinations. A few moments having elapsed, the ribbons are untied and the covers removed. The decanter is found to be empty, and the wine and water to have respectively returned to the glasses designated by the audience. The glasses have no speciality, but the decanter has a small hole in its underside. This is plugged with a pellet of wax, which, however, is instantly removable at pleasure. Of the three stands, two, those on which the glasses stand, have no preparation, being mere raised shapes of tin. The third is similar in appearance, but is, in fact, a hollow box, with three or four little holes drilled in its upper side, for a purpose that will presently appear. Of the three covers, the center one is hollow throughout, but the other two have each its upper portion occupied by a hollow chamber or reservoir, divided in two by a vertical partition, and tapering down to a tube with a very small opening. Each of these compartments has an air hole at the top. These two covers are beforehand prepared for the trick by filling the two compartments of each, one with wine and the other with water. The air holes are stopped with pellets of wax, but for the sake of distinction, the wine compartment of each is plugged with red wax and the water compartment with white wax. Any other distinguishing mark is, of course, equally good. So long as the air holes are thus stopped, there is no fear of the liquid running out. The performer, having filled the glasses as already described, mixes the contents in the decanter, and in placing the latter on the stand, removes the wax plug from the bottom, thus allowing the wine to run out and to percolate through the above-mentioned holes into the stand where it remains. He next places the empty glasses on their respective stands and places the covers over them. He then asks the audience into which of the glasses they desire that the wine should travel and into which the water. When they have made their decision, he has only to remove the red pellet from the cover which is over the glass into which the wine is to pass and the white pellet from the opposite cover. The tying of the tape from cover to cover is merely designed to give time for the liquids to reach their respective destinations, and is indeed altogether dispensed with by many performers. The air holes may be stopped by means of tin foil pasted over them, instead of wax, if preferred. The foil is instantly removable by scraping with the nail. The Mysterious Funnel this is a little appliance on the same principle, which may be incidentally introduced with a good effect in the course of a wine trick. It is a tin funnel, made double throughout, with a space of half an inch or so between its inner and outer edges. It is, in fact, a funnel within a funnel, joined at the upper edges. It has an air hole, A, generally on the underside of the handle. When required for use, the hidden space is filled with wine. The simplest way of doing this is to stop the spout of the funnel with the finger, and then to fill it with wine, 
which seeking its own level will gradually rise to the same height in the outer space as it stands at inside the funnel this must of course be done with the air hole open when the space is filled the air hole is stopped and the wine remaining inside the funnel allowed to run out the funnel will now appear perfectly empty and may be used as a funnel in the ordinary way the mode of using the funnel is somewhat after the following manner subject of course to variation accordingly to the taste and invention of the performer a juvenile is invited to take a glass of wine the produce of either of the preceding tricks when he has imbibed it the performer asks a second juvenile whether he would like a glass also the reply is pretty sure to be in the affirmative but the performer pretends to find when about to oblige him that his store is exhausted he begins to apologize for the supposed disappointment but as if suddenly bethinking himself says however you shan't be disappointed if i can't supply you in the natural way i must do so in a supernatural way suppose we take back the wine this young gentleman has just drunk i don't suppose it will be any the worse let me see where is my magic funnel oh here it is let us make sure first that it is quite clean he pours water through it then holds it up to the light in such a manner that the audience can see right through thus indirectly showing them that it is empty now sir addressing the youngster who has drunk the glass of wine i am going to take back that glass of wine be kind enough to bend your elbow and hold it over the mouth of the funnel so and you sir addressing the expectant perhaps you will be kind enough to take this young gentleman's other arm and work it gently up and down in fact we are going to transform him into a pump now sir the performer holds the glass under the funnel and as soon as the pretended pumping begins opens the air hole when the wine runs into the glass it is handed to the second young gentleman as a reward for his exertions acted with spirit this little interlude is sure of an uproarious reception from the juvenile portion of the audience particularly if the operator possesses the magic bradawl described at page 332 and makes use of it to bore a small hole in the victim's elbow before beginning to pump the wine from it the box of bran transformed to a bottle of wine while upon the subject of wine tricks we may mention this which is by no means the least surprising of the illusions to which the bottle gives birth the necessary apparatus consists of four pieces first a plain cylindrical tin box a japanned to taste and about six inches high by three in diameter secondly b a similar box so far as external appearance is concerned but materially different in its internal construction this latter is bottomless but has a horizontal tin partition at about three quarters of an inch from the top these two boxes have but one lid which fits either indifferently the third article is a cylindrical pasteboard cover closed at the top and of such size as to fit loosely over b but an inch or two taller the fourth item is a bottle made of tin japanned black and of somewhat peculiar construction as a measure of capacity it terminates just below the shoulder the remainder or body of the bottle being in fact merely a tube closed at the bottom in which this upper portion works a spiral spring within the body presses the neck portion upward into its proper position but if pressure be applied the neck portion will sink downward into the body as shown in figure 214 in which condition it just fits in to be a small point projects from the lower part of the bottle and corresponds with a bayonet catch at the bottom of b which is in fact designed as a case or cover for the bottle for the performance of the trick the operator will require in addition to the apparatus above mentioned an oblong deal box half full of bran rice is sometimes used but is not so good any box will answer the purpose so long as it is not less than 15 inches or so in length and nine in breadth and depth and preparing for the trick the first step is to fill the bottle or the fillable portion thereof with wine or some other liquid the bottle is then corked b is placed over it and pressed down and the bayonet catch fastened in this condition but without a lid b is placed in the deal box and buried in the bran the box of bran being now brought forward and placed on the table the performer is ready to begin the trick he first draws attention to a which he hands round for inspection as also the pasteboard cover when they are returned he brings forward the box of bran moving his hand backwards and forwards in it and distributing a few handfuls to show its genuineness 
Replacing the box on the table, he proceeds to fill A with bran. This he does by dipping A completely in the box and scooping up the necessary quantity. As if to show all fair, he pours the bran out again into the box and then makes a second dip to refill it. This time, however, he makes an exchange, and instead of bringing up A, brings up B, filling as he does so the shallow space at the top of the ladder, which thus appears to be full to the brim. Placing it on the table and putting the lid on, he places the pasteboard cover over it, and, addressing the company, volunteers to teach them how to extract wine from bran and wine bottles from tin boxes. After a moment's pause, and the orthodox touch with the wand, he removes the cover giving it at the same time a slight twist, thus releasing the catch, and removing B within the cover. The spring within the bottle, now meeting no resistance, presses the neck portion upwards into its proper position, with all the appearance of a genuine bottle, and as it, in its present condition, is considerably taller than B, it can hardly be suspected that it was a moment ago concealed in the latter, particularly as the performer immediately proceeds to give a further proof of its genuineness by pouring a glass of wine from it. In connection with the above trick, we may describe another useful piece of apparatus known as the brand bottle. This is a bottle which, being covered over for an instant, vanishes, leaving in its place a heap of bran. The bottle is, like that last described of tin, with a false bottom or partition about an inch below the shoulder, so that it holds about a glass full of wine. The place of the ordinary bottom is supplied by a disc of tin with a raised shoulder round it, fitting loosely within the bottle so as to drop out by its own weight unless kept in place by some external pressure. The cover is a mere cylinder of pasteboard closed at the top. The bottle is prepared for use by filling the lower portion with bran and putting the bottom in place where it is retained by the pressure of the fingers, then filling the upper part with wine. The performer first pours wine from the bottle and then places it on a plate, ostensibly to show that it does not pass through any opening in the table, but really for a reason which will presently appear. He now places the cover over the bottle and on again, lifting it, presses the sides lightly, and so lifts the bottle with it. The loose bottom, having no longer anything to hold it, remains on the plate, concealed by the bran which pours from the bottle into which the bottle is apparently transformed. Meanwhile, all eyes being drawn to the heap of bran, the performer lowers his hand, containing the cover for an instant behind the table, and relaxing the pressure of his fingers, lets the bottle slip out on the servante, immediately coming forward with the cover and carelessly showing that it is empty. In combination with the bran bottle, the trick last above described is greatly heightened in effect, the bottle appearing under the cover which has just been placed over the tin box, the bran from the latter being found under the cover which a moment previously concealed the bottle, and the tin box being found to have passed into the large box of bran. The bran bottle may also be worked with great effect in combination with the trick of the bran and orange described at page 335. The Bran Glass This is an ingenuous and very useful piece of apparatus. It is made in all sizes, from that of an ordinary wine glass to a goblet large enough to hold a rabbit. Its effect is as follows. The glass is brought forward, apparently filled with bran to the brim. The performer proves its genuineness by taking up a handful of it and scattering it over the stage. A brass cover is now placed over the glass and instantly removed, when every particle of bran is found to have disappeared, and in place of it is found some article which had been conjured away at some earlier period of the trick. The explanation is very simple. The glass is shaped as shown in figure 215 with straight sides tapering outwards. The supposed bran is really a hollow shape of tin, A, closed at the top, but open at the bottom with bran gummed all over it and a handful of loose bran spread on the top. At each side of its upper edge is a little wire point just overpassing the edge of the glass. The cover, which is of such size as to cover the glass as far as the upper part of its stem, has no speciality about it save a shallow groove running round its upper edge on the inside as shown by the dotted line. When the cover is placed on the glass and pressed smartly down, the two points already mentioned are forced into this groove which thus grips the tin shape, and when again removed, lifts it out of the glass, leaving behind whatever article may have been beforehand placed within. Where the brand glass is of large size, the metal cover is indispensable, but for glasses not exceeding the ordinary tumbler size, it is preferable to cover the glass with a borrowed handkerchief only 
the hollow shape being in this case made not of tin but of thin cardboard the two points are dispensed with but in place of them there should be a piece of thread in length about double the diameter of the glass fastened from side to side of the shape this hanging down on the side of the glass which is toward the performer is caught hold of through the handkerchief and thus the handkerchief and shape are lifted together the bran glass may be made available in a variety of ways the trick next following will afford a good practical illustration of its use End of section 40